Heavier and come down on your camera. Between the two gates right there. Okay, okay. Just get line there. there. I feared that it, it, it was going to come in and then. Yeah. The easiest thing to do is just to pull in the corner, yeah. stand back, and that way you don't get it down your sleeve and you don't splash over the there. Don't get the light stand. Or hope the light stand. That's the. <laughs> That's the real, uh, the real, uh, real, real expert way to do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's a lot of raincoat for that camera. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it gets annoying. It's like they add all these like little extra flaps and it's like hard to do anything. Yeah. So you're shooting, that's an FX6, mm -hmm. and you're not having any problem feeding, what are you, sh what are you shooting, 1080, yeah. 59, uh, 69, 60, yeah, so 59.9 feet, yeah. right? And you don't have any problems either. No. I gotta figure out what the fuck is going on. Here. Is it a uh, what? Well, I had a, I had that FX6. We were shooting some some uh, different angles and stuff like that. They said, "Oh, you're, everything is hot."
Great alert. Maybe I'll swaddle. So 500 up four. Yeah. 
thought that was a question. That's probably 400. All right. So that's just what I think I'm going at. Yeah. Because we've had a day like this before. It's a 128. Oh. But it's got a map box on it. I have a county and I'm looking for a good long leg for it. Would you recommend anything? Well, I mean, if you want a long leg, yes. 70 to 200. Yeah, well, is it very heavy? I'm sorry? Is it very heavy? Well, it's heavier than what you've got there now. Do I need a separate cycle for it? No. No, you'll be fine. But you got a still guy right beside you. He can tell you too. Mm -hmm. Martin can tell you. Oh yeah. Seventy to two hundred. That's what I'd go with. Yeah. Although it's pretty, that's pretty wide for, uh, pretty tight for here. Seventy. Yeah. Seventy to two hundred. F two point eight. Two hundred. F two. You said F two. F two point eight. F two point eight. What What is your camera? Oh, FF5. Is that an E mount? Must be an adapter, but. I also have FF9. Yeah. FF9? Yeah. So this is it, right? This would be something like that. Yeah. This one? Yeah. This, this would be this if they've done an adapter, it would be the one to go for. I don't know, does that. I don't oh, know. yeah, yeah. No, okay, yeah. No, the Sony has got the equipment. Yes. I mean, this lens looks big because it's got a map box on it. And the only reason it's got a map box on it is all about commerce. What's your current? Because I don't know if it's the mount. Which is the one you recommended it? Well, I don't know if the only thing is much more than commerce currently. Yeah, probably. That's the one I'm thinking about getting. Thank you. 
Once was enough for me. Fat Jack? Yeah. yeah. I'll confess to have been there more than once. But. Are you going to correspond in there? Nope. We went to the uh, the, 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 ba the old barrel last night. The barrel. What was it? Done. That was it. Mm -hmm. Oysters. Mm -hmm. Oysters. Mm -hmm. Oysters.
about Brandon? No. Justin, uh, I moved around to the front. I've got a weird cable. I want to make sure you still have it. <laughs> Hey, Michael. Bless you, man.
They're all going right now. But we, we, they're counting. These people might get in. They just, we've we got to wait and get a count for them. They might get in. we got to wait for them to. But all the I gave out all the tickets already, already. yes, sir. But we count them now. So it's full today? Y'all are full today? Yes, sir. Okay. But, I, I mean, we, we can't let anybody else know. Can I help you all?
everything all right with the, you know, contact I got in with those fees, and he said it was. At some point in mid-July 2021, over a month after the murders, did Alec call you up and ask you anything about these fees? He did. And tell me what the conversation with Alec was about these fees. He contacted me um, and said that he was not able to structure the fees the way that he thought he was going to be able to do, that he had messed that up, and that the fees needed to be paid to the firm, and they needed to go back through my trust account. And what did you say at that point? I didn't, I, I didn't see anything that caused me any red flags or anything and felt like if that's what had to be done, that the fees had to be paid to his firm and needed to go back through my trust account, he could send me the money and I could run it back through my trust account and then pay it to his firm. Did, uh, so he's promising, he's saying, I will send you the money back. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you ultimately receive any funds? 600000 of the 792. You only received 600000 Yes, sir. And how did you receive that? Do you recall? I think it came in two different wires, uh, wires, excuse me, that either came on the same day or on back-to-back -back days. Did one of those wires come from Palmetto State Bank for $350,000? I believe so, yes, sir. And that was on, on or about July 15th? That sounds right, yes, sir. And the other was about $250,000 on July 16th, 2021? I believe from Bank of America, yes, sir. That was only $600,000? Yes, sir. So you're short from yep. what you'd already given to Alec, correct? Yes, sir. How much are you short? $192,000. $192,000. Yes, sir. Oh, boy. Okay. It is Friday. And when it is Friday, you know who I bring in. Litigator Richard Schoenstein is with us, and also we are joined by psychologist Dr. John Delatorre. It's great to have you both here. Rich, I'm going to start with you. Do you think that this evidence should come in? Because the question, of course, is does the probative value outweigh the prejudicial value? Is it important? Is it necessary for the prosecution? I believe it should come in, and here is why. This evidence is not some remote financial crime that was committed by Alec Murdoch that they're putting in just to show he's a bad guy. That wouldn't be allowed. You wouldn't put some off-topic bad acts that the defendant did. All of this appears to have been imploding on him on the day of the murders. He is getting caught by his law firm. He is being found out. He is being kicked out of the law firm. All of that is happening and helps explain his state of mind on the day of the murders. And people struggle with it. I've heard commentators who say, well, I don't understand why that would motivate him to kill his wife and son. I don't understand that either. But here's the thing about motive, Jesse. Motive doesn't have to be rational, especially when you're dealing with an irrational person under distress and desperation and drugs. You can find motive if you connect all of that, and I believe it's relevant to showing the whole picture of what was going on with this person. If only we had a psychologist to explain why somebody, oh, Dr. John Delaford, <laughs> great to have you here. So, does it make sense to you that somebody in this position would murder their family, as Rich was saying, maybe it, because their world was imploding, the pressure was happening, you heat that up with drugs, or as, you know, another theory that he, it was a way to distract attention away from this. Let me buy myself some time. They're about to discover all my financial crimes. Let me just kill my family. It'll buy me time, some breathing room. Does that make sense to you, doctor? It absolutely can. When, when it comes to just <clears throat> those, those uh, facts just on its surface, it absolutely can. But the more I learn about Alec Mordoff, the, the less I kind of understand him when it comes to opioid addiction. If he was really using opiates for 20 years, he have a significant cardiovascular disease. He have frailty of the bones. He, you know, in the videos that we saw of the day of the murder, he's not really all that injured. That's not consistent with someone who's had long-term use of heroin. When it comes to the financial crimes, typically, it, it is, is money a reason why someone would kill someone else? It absolutely <laughs> is. But usually, you kill the people that have found you out. There's nothing to suggest that his family members found him out. Mm. So this would have to be a guy who absolutely, in the distress of everything that's going on, would believe 
that the death of his family members would automatically cancel out the financial issues that were at play. And is he that kind of guy? It's certainly possible, but I think I think I need to hear just a little bit more about okay. him overall and his level of distress. Here's my response to all this. People say, oh, what an outlandish motive. Well, so is also the allegation that you hire a hitman to kill you so that the insurance proceeds go to your son. So really, what is outside the realm of possibility? And just going back to Chris Wilson for a second, he got into a bit of a conversation that he had with the defendant about the so-called suicide scheme. Let's watch. And what did he say to you? I mean, the first thing I asked him is, you know, Alec, what the, what the F or what the H is going on here? You know, what is going on? And have you done something else to me or that involves me that I don't know about? Because I know about this and I've got to deal with this, but is there something else you've done that I don't know about? I was somewhere between Bamberg and Columbia when I got a call. Uh, it was either from Randy or Lee Cope, but I believe it was Lee Cope. And what were you informed? That Ellick had been shot in the head and that he was on a helicopter going to the hospital in Savannah. And I think it was Savannah Hospital, but they said the hospital, but I believe they said Savannah Hospital. What did you do in response to that information? What the devil's going on? I thought he'd tried to kill himself. I didn't think he was suicidal when I left, but when I heard that, I thought he tried to kill himself. Did you uh, go to the scene or did you return back home? I went back home. Did you try to reach out to Alec after that? I did not. Um, I talked to his brother, Randy, I think some that same day and some on the next day. Um, but by that time, frankly, all this had, for lack of a better term, blown up um, to where I didn't think I'd be able to talk to Alec, and I don't know that I wanted to. Okay, so Rich, I'm gonna go back to you on this. This is something I mentioned before, right? If all of this comes in, not only can we talk about how it might have an effect and be beneficial for the prosecution, this is more of a reason why, if this comes in, I don't think the defendant should take the stand. I was asked that question. Should the defendant take the stand? You think he's gonna take the stand? The jury hears this, this level of this alleged deception, able to fool people that he worked with and that was close with, he takes the stand, why should the jury believe anything he has to say? So here's the question about Alec Murdoch taking the stand. And you and I have talked about this with other defendants. Yep. So for me, the first question is, how would he do on the stand? And I'm sure they're having practice runs to figure that out, because sure. that's the most important question. But this guy has some splaining to do, as yep. we say, yep. right? He's got these financial crimes, but more importantly, they have audio of him being on the scene when he said he wasn't there. And how is he not going to explain why that's the case? That, to me, is a big question. And the other thing is, if we buy sort of the underlying theory that this is kind of a, a narcissistic guy, I mean, thank goodness he's not representing himself in this trial, but is he really going to let it go to verdict without taking an opportunity to speak to the jury? I don't know. See, I think the only ex rational explanation, rational, is that he basically was such was in such a state finding his family murdered that you can't really believe what he was saying to investigators. You have to take it with a grain of salt. We heard a little bit of Dick Carpootley had mentioned that in opening statements. Doctor, let me go to you. If this testimony comes in, like if Chris Wilson takes the stand and says all this in front of the jury and gets emotional talking about it, what effect do you think this is gonna have on those jurors? 
I mean, Chris Wilson said the question that uh, the jury's absolutely going to be asking themselves for the rest of this trial, which is, what the heck is going on? And so if they listen to him and everything that he has to say and the way that he's presenting it, it's going to look like no one around Alec Murdoch knew anything about him, about who the real person is. And so all of the stuff that he says, right, while well, his attorneys are saying about him, they cannot believe, the jury will not believe it. Forget whether or not they're going to believe him. They're not going to believe anything that any of the evidence presented by the defense is actually uh, truthful in any way. I think we could talk about this case for the next hour, but we we are keeping a very careful eye on that courtroom feed. As soon as we can jump live, we will, as soon as the proceedings start up. But for now, we're going to take a break. Before we take a break, though, I want you to stay with us as we watch this very special report from Law and Crime's own Sierra Gillespie. <laughs> He's down, watch his, he's down, he's down, watch his head. Body camera video captures back-to-back officer-involved shootings near Phoenix, Arizona, after a suspect wanted for sexual assault evaded officers in one city before running into more officers in another. Hey, don't shoot me. We won't shoot you. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. It started on January 6th in Scottsdale, Arizona. Officials there were attempting to serve a warrant on 37-year-old Kenneth Hearn for an alleged sexual assault incident dating back to October 2022. At the time, an arrest warrant for Hearn was also out from the city of Mesa. It's got some police with a search warrant. Open the front door. Body camera video shows a woman answer the door before she and a small child leave safely. Yeah, I got her. Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. Come here. It's okay. Bring it up. Come with me. You're okay. After that, officers yelled to Hearn, calling for him to surrender. Kenneth, come out. Come to the front door. Hands up and empty. Who was yelling? Someone. The police. I'm ordering you to do so. We have a search warrant. For what? Come to the front door. Hearn then yells to officers, asking not to be shot. Hey, don't shoot me. We won't shoot you. Keep your hands up. We won't. Keep your hands up. We want to Please don't shoot me. Come out with your hands up and empty. Face away from me. That's when officers send a drone into the apartment. Seconds later, Hearn opens fire. Let's go. Body camera video shows a Scottsdale sergeant is hit when one of Hearn's bullets flies through the wall. An officer near the front door then fires back toward Hearn but misses. After that, Scottsdale police say Hearn escaped from the second story. The next day, Phoenix officers caught up with Hearn in Tempe. Put your hands up! Put your hands up! Put your hands up right now! Put your hands up! Body camera video shows police attempting to arrest Hearn before he pulls out a weapon. That's when an officer opens fire. Get on the ground! Phoenix police recover Hearn's weapon before rushing to his aid. He's down, watch he's down, he's down, watch his head. Guns away from him. Hearn was later taken to the hospital where he died as a result of his injuries. The Scottsdale sergeant shot the day before was treated and is expected to make a full recovery. Both officer-involved shootings are now under investigation. Reporting for Law and Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie.
court is now in session. Judge Newman presiding. Please be seated. <clears throat> Morning. Yeah. Uh, next witness. Your Honor, uh, the state would call Jan Malinowski. Yes, ma'am. Shall be the truth, so help you God. State your name again for the record. Yes, sir. your last name. Jan Malinowski. Mr. Malinowski, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Good. Um, if you would uh, introduce yourself to the court just a little bit. Obviously, we're not in front of a jury, but just so the uh, court knows who you are, uh, tell us just a very quick uh, history of how you got to your current position. Uh, I'm currently the president and CEO of Palmetto State Bank, uh, headquartered in Hampton. Started my banking career out of the Citadel, 1977. Uh, went on to graduate school at the university. Upon completion of uh, master's program in Columbia, joined the Wachovia Bank and Trust Company. Uh, went to Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, from there, went to Barnett Bank in Miami, Florida and subsequently uh, traveled Europe with the old Barnett, uh, moved to First Union National Bank in Savannah for a brief period of time, and then in February of 1991 joined Palmetto State Bank. All right. Uh, and currently you serve as the CEO, is that right? That's correct. And how long have you been the CEO? Since uh, August of last year. All right. Uh, August of 2021? Yes, sir. And who was the CEO prior to you? Russell Lafitte. And uh, was he uh, terminated not long before you became CEO? Yes, he was. Back in uh, June of 2021, what was your role at that time? I was executive vice president and responsible for branches in, in Beaufort. We have two branches in Beaufort. All right. And were you also a member of the board of directors of the Palmetto State Bank? At that time, yes. Uh, you mentioned that you were in charge of some branches in Beaufort. Uh, could you explain just a little bit to the court uh, about sort of how it operated then with the branches in Beaufort and the branches perhaps in Hampton or, or elsewhere, please? Yes, sir. Uh, we, at the time, we were about a $700 million asset bank. We have seven branches, um, operated somewhat decentralized. Uh, I was given responsibility in 91 for the two offices in uh, Beaufort, as I said, one in Burton location and one on Ladies Island. Um, other officers of the bank would be responsible for uh, the other branches, Hampton being the main office, and then with uh, Allendale, Fairfax, Estill, and Bluffton. Right. You say you are a little bit uh, decentralized. Is it fair to say that for the most part, you were primarily responsible for the operations in Beaufort, and someone else was primarily responsible for the operations in the Hampton area? Correct. And who was primarily responsible for the operations in the Hampton area? Russell Lafitte and his father, Charlie Lafitte. Um, and when you say somewhat decentralized, obviously there was a board of directors that looked at the institution as a whole. Yes. Uh, but in, in practice, there was kind of a a deference to the local folks on scene, you being in Beaufort and the, the Lafitte's being in Hampton. Is that correct? Yes. All right. I'm going to uh, 
ask you to explain just a little bit, though, about the Board of the Directors and the Executive Committee. And again, if you could briefly describe to the Court uh, what those two entities are and how they operate so that we can understand the next set of questions. Well, the Board of Directors of the bank has the absolute authority um, and responsibility to, uh, to run the bank, uh, but they delegate the day-to-day -day managerial responsibilities to uh, officers. Uh, Charlie Lafitte was long-serving CEO and chairman. Russell, uh, COO, subsequently became the uh, CEO. Uh, I was executive vice president and ran uh, the two branches. But uh, board of directors would delegate the, as I said, the day-to-day -day control to the executive committee uh, and, and certain uh, senior officers. All right. And when it came to authorizing loans, what was the role of the executive committee uh, in authorizing certain loans? Was there a threshold, and how did that work? There is a threshold. Um, the board of directors would authorize uh, individual loan officer loan authorities uh, on an annual basis. Uh, branch managers having a certain level of authority, and then uh, executive officers having a higher loan authority, and then uh, organizationally, two executive officers could approve a single loan or a uh, up to X million dollars, and then once it got beyond the uh, threshold for two executive officers, it would go on to the executive committee, which would uh, review the loan request and either approve or deny uh, any loan that uh, exceeded a million and a half dollars. Uh, at the time in June of 2021 or thereabouts in that, uh, in the, in that area of the, of the year, um, were you the secretary of the executive committee? I was. All right. And uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 354 to your testimony and see if you recognize that document. And your Honor, I have a copy of you. I provided one to the defense. Would you mind handing that to the judge for me? Yes, sir. All right. Do you recognize that document? I do. Tell me what that is, please. Uh, it's a the minutes of the executive committee of August 12th of 2021. All right. And uh, a number of topics were discussed, but primarily the uh, relationship of uh, Richard Alexander Alec Murdoch All right. and his total relationship uh, with the bank. Right. And this is on August 12, 2021? Correct. Right. Can I get the elbow, please? All right, so these are the minutes that you're referring to, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and there's a discussion right there, including a reference to a uh, memo that was distributed outlining the uh, bank's relationship with uh, Alec Murdoch, is that correct? Yes, sir. And there's a reference also to the total indebtedness that Alec Murdoch had to the bank at that point in time. Yes, sir. As of, as of the day of that memo that was presented to the executive committee, uh, Mr. Murdoch owed directly or indirectly $4.2 million. $4.2 million, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. I forgot to ask you this, but tell me real quick, when do the board typically meet and when does the executive committee typically meet? The executive committee typically meets on the second Tuesday of every month and the board meets on the third Tuesday of every month. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 385 to, uh, for the purposes of this in-camera hearing and see if you recognize that document. This is a copy of the uh, minutes of the directors of Palmetto State Bank uh, describing what took place at a board meeting on Tuesday, July 20, 2021. All right. And who's the secretary that authored those minutes? Ray Henderson. Okay. 
And uh, you were present as a board member for the for this discussion. I was. All right. And what's the date again on that particular one? July 20, 2021. July 20, 2021. At that time, was there any discussion or any record of a discussion of any loan to Alec Murdoch for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars? No, sir. There is not. Again, that's July 20th, 2021? That's correct. All right, going back to this uh, August 12th, 2021 uh, executive committee notes, I want to walk back just a little bit and tell me, was there, uh, did Alec Murdoch come up in any discussion among the board members prior to August 12th, 2021? Yes, it and did. Tell me about that, how that happened, please. Uh, on August 9th, uh, Norris Lafitte, a board member, uh, sent an email to members of the executive committee and the board asking for a full accounting of uh, Mr. Murdoch's relationship with the bank. All right. And can you pull that mic just a little bit closer? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. And uh, what, what happened after that? Did that spark any particular activity? Sparked quite a bit of activity, conversation, and then activity inside the bank that day. All right. And explain that to the court. What happened? Uh, shortly after... Mr. Lafitte, uh, Norris Lafitte sent his email to uh, members of the executive committee and the board. Um, the uh, a, a deposit was made to Mr. Murdoch's account uh, in the amount of $400,000, which cleared up an overdraft, a large overdraft, which had been in his account that day. All right. And who caused that deposit to happen? Russell Lafitte. All right. And so there was a significant overdraft in Alec Murdoch's account? On that day, yes, sir. Was it over $350,000 overdraft? Yes, sir. And so Russell Lafitte caused a $400,000 to be deposited into his account? Yes, sir. And that was after the email from Norris Lafitte asking about Alec Murdoch on August the 9th? Yes, sir. All right. Um, at that time, that Russell Lafitte caused $400,000 to be put into Alec's account to cover a over $350,000 overdraft, were there any loan documents or any sort of application or anything uh, in existence supporting any such uh, disbursement? No, sir. Just put the money in there? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned uh, other activity. What other activity was sparked by that August 9th email? Uh, there was some activity to create an application to go through our typical loan approval process. Um, <clears throat> through one of our software underwriting, pro one of our underwriting programs, software driven. Okay. All right. And we're going to look at those documents here in a minute. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State 356 and see if you recognize that. Uh, this is a photocopy of a, of a uh, page two of a deposit checking account statement and that's uh, for, in the name of uh, Richard Alexander Murdoch. All right, and what does that uh, reflect on August 6, 2021, what the balance was in his account? A... Uh, Overdraft balance of $347,784.67. And what happens on August 9th, 2021? A deposit of 400000 is made to this account. All right. And we see after that there's a transfer to checking of $20,000 that's done as well? Yes, sir. And do you know what the purpose of that transfer was? No, sir, I don't. So right there on August 6, 2021, Alec's account was negative $347,000. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 
And then off the books, Russell Lafitte caused $400,000 to be put into his account. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Let's talk more about that. I'm going to uh, show you what's been marked as Exhibit 357 to your testimony and see if you recognize that. This is a copy of minutes of the directors of Palmetto State Bank dated August 17th, 2021. Okay. And uh, who was the secretary for these? Do you know? Gray Henderson. Right. And were you present for these, these board meetings? I was. All right. And these minutes accurately reflect what was discussed at the board? Yes, sir. We'll turn over to the second page. And was there a discussion at that time about, and again, this is on August 17th, 2021, was there a discussion about uh, loans to Richard Alexander Murdoch? There was. All right. And is there a, a reference there of Alex's intention to sell the farm? Yes, there is. And then is there a reference in there to uh, the extent of Alex's liability uh, in total loans? Yes, there is. $3,544,897. All right. And was there then a discussion of uh, additional loans that Alec had that had been charged off? Yes, there were. Okay. And very quickly, are you familiar with two entities called Zero United and Redbeard? I am. And are those entities associated with Alec Murdoch? They are. And are those loans that, in fact, uh, the bank had charged off? That's correct. All right. And explain very quickly what a charge off is without too much detail for these purposes. Certainly. Uh, in a situation where a loan is deemed uh, non performing to the point where the bank's uh, executive committee and or uh, senior management decides that it's time to take it off the books. Uh, you, you charge it off. It's an accounting treatment, uh, but it doesn't uh, remove the obligation of the borrower or, in this case, uh, members of the LLC, um, any legal obligation to repay the loan. All right. and so Alec Murdoch was still on the hook required to pay those loans. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And were there real properties associated with both of those loans? Yes, sir. And in the event Alec Murdoch had tried to sell those properties, would the bank expect to be paid any outstanding balance plus interest and all the rest of it? Yes, sir. And in fact, was Alex still paying on those notes even though they were charged off? He had periodically, yes. And so the ultimate liability to the bank uh, for Alex was somewhat larger if those are included. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. There's discussion in here about a $750,000 loan in this particular board discussion. Is that correct? Yes, there is. And this is on August 12, 2021, I believe. Is that right? The date? I think it's 17th. <clears throat> 17th, excuse me. Um, had you been aware of any sort of $750,000 loan to Alec Murdoch? prior to these discussions coming up as you move to the board meeting on August 17th, 2021? Only to the extent that $750,000 loan had been referenced in, by, in, during the executive committee in the memo that uh, was referred to in my executive committee minutes. Which would have been shortly, or a couple days before this. Is that yes, sir, the preceding All right. week. All right, and at the time that the $400,000 had been dispersed 
back on August 9th. There was no loan paperwork in existence at that time. Is that no, correct? there was not. All right. Was that the only disbursement made pursuant to this supposed $750,000 loan? It was not the only disbursement. All right. Well, stand by for me. packet I gave you. I'll show you what's been marked as uh, States 358 and see if you recognize that. It's a wire request form well, on our standard documentation dated uh, July 15, 2021. Uh, the Palmetto State's going to wire funds to South State Bank. The beneficiary of the wire is the Wilson Law Group. LLC to their IOLTA account uh, in the amount of $350,000. $350,000 to the Wilson Law Group? Yes, sir. All right. And then what's the, uh, the next page in this document? Are the wiring instructions to the, the Wilson Law Group. And does it have contact information? Contact information is to Chris, Chris at Wilson Law Group, sc.com. All right. And is that Chris Wilson, the lawyer um, in... Uh, South Carolina and Burnwell and Bamberg, South Carolina, excuse me? As I currently understand, yes, sir. Right. This is on July 15th, 2021. Yes, sir. $350,000 was wired to Chris Wilson. Yes, sir. Was there any documentation, loan documentation, loan application, any sort of paper should work whatsoever justifying Calvinist State Bank sending $350,000 to Chris Wilson? No, time. sir. All right. And whose benefit was this sent for? Alec Murdoch's. Alec Murdoch's. All right, let me ask you about this, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. <clears throat> and right now, there it says sender information, and what does that say right there, please? Palmetto State Bank, LNOS. <clears throat> All right, and can you explain very quickly what LNOS is, what that is? It's an account the bank maintains. It's called Loans Not on System. Okay. And should that uh, should this wire have lifted, listed that as the sender? No. And explain that to the court, please. Had loan documents been signed that day, the, the sender would have been the, um, the borrower on the loan. In this case, it would have been uh, Alec Murdoch. But that's not what was listed, is it? No, sir. Show you what's been marked as 359 to your testimony to see if you recognize this document. This is a uh, the customer copy of the cashier's check in the amount of $400,000 that was uh, deposited to Alec Murdoch's checking account. All right. And is there a, a sticky note on there, a copy of a sticky note? Yes, sir, there is. And uh, what does it say, if you would, please? It says Alec Murdoch, $750,000. Uh, one share of Green Swamp Inc. stock, and the date is 7-15-21. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Got states 360 and 361. Just real quick, I'm going to show you those and see if you recognize those. Uh, the top document is the checking deposit slip for uh, credited to a 400,000 to be credited to account 69406092. The account holder name is Alec Murdoch. The date is 8-9-2021. Uh, and then we see a copy of the cashier's check dated 8-9-2021 in the amount of $400,000. All right. And then uh, the next exhibit, 361. Next exhibit is the debit to the loans not on system account in the amount of $400,000.
which is, was the source for the cashier's check in the same amount. And the date on those again? 8-9-2021. Uh, and that was the same day that Norris Lafitte sent an email to the board directors asking, making an inquiry about the bank's relationship with Alec Murdoch. That's correct. Just a couple more. You've already testified that there was no loan application or loan paperwork or anything like that supporting the bank disbursement already of a total of $750,000. Is that right? That's correct. And that was a wire in July 15th for $350,000 that went to Chris Wilson, correct? Yes, sir. And then a $400,000 disbursement on August 9th uh, after Norris Lafitte sent his email to the board of directors. Yes, sir. That covered a negative four hundred. $347,000 overdraft in Alex's account. That's correct. A little, a little bit extra for some walking around money, another fifty k or so, correct? I can't answer that. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as it states 362 and see if you uh, recognize that. This is a copy of a promissory note, commercial, single advance, loan number 6996048 in the amount of $750,750. $750. Note dated 7-15-2021. Just real quick, what's the $750 for? That's a note fee we charge. A note fee? Yes, sir. $750 bucks for a $750,000 loan? Yes, sir. Is that typical? Uh, possibly in the Hampton office, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to let you hold that one for a second. Uh, look at the back page and tell me, is that application signed? Yes, it is signed. Who was it reportedly signed by? Richard Alexander Murdoch. And what is the date on that application? The date on the note is July 15, 2021. All right. And is that the same day as that wire to Chris Wilson? Yes, sir. Have you had a chance to examine that document and look at the records of the entity for which you are the chief executive officer? I have. Have you had a chance to look at the loan number? I have. And are those loan numbers sequentially generated by your system? They are. And in looking at that loan number, is there any way that document could have even been in existence in July of 2021? No, sir. And in fact, it had to have been generated after the August 9th email and after these disbursements. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. I'll show you 363. Just give me one second while I'll put this on the screen. Just real quick, can you see that on the screen? Yes, sir. Is that the loan number, the sequential loan number you're talking about? Yes, sir. And then that's the signature and the date that you're talking about. That's correct. All right, uh, that last exhibit I just handed to you. Can you tell me the number on the back of it? 6996048. I'm sorry, I was talking about that number. 363, states 363. No, that was my job. I was asking you to do my job. All right, tell me what that document is, please. It's a business purpose statement. All right, and? Uh, it accompanied the loan, 6996048. And what is the uh, supposed uh, purpose for the loan that's listed on that? Uh, business expenses. Okay. See that? And again, this document's also dated 7-15-21? Uh, That's correct. Right. But is this the kind of document that also would be generated along with the application that we just saw? It would in the, in, in the note documentation system, yes, sir. All right. The application that you said could not have existed in July of 2021? That's correct. Right. Let me um, go back. We had a reference to the board minutes. from August 17th, 
And there was some discussion of this particular loan at that board uh, here, um, board meeting. Is that correct? Yes, there was. And there had been discussion at the executive committee meeting not, uh, a little bit prior to that. Is that correct? That's correct. What was your understanding at, at that time from those meetings what the collateral was supposedly for this new $750,000 loan? It would be a, a mortgage on Edisto Beach House and a, a share of Green Swamp stock. And is that the green uh, swamp that was referred to on the sticky note uh, that we saw earlier? Yes, sir. <laughs> and what is your understanding, though, as, as things developed as to whether or not that collateral actually was uh, able to be used for this particular loan? Uh, certainly the second mortgage uh, did not exist or was not placed on the property. The property was in the name of Mrs. Murdoch. Okay. And what about the green swamp? Uh, was that already collateralized? It was cross-collateralized with other loans. Right. So this loan was heavily under-collateralized, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Some discussion about whether or not an appraisal had been ordered uh, prior to June of 2021 uh, for this supposed $750,000 loan. Uh, was there an appraisal that had been ordered prior to June of 2021 on the Edisto property? There was. Did that have anything at all to do with some sort of loan for an additional $750,000? No, sir. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as States 364 and see if you uh, um, recognize that document as an email, but there's an attachment. It's an email from uh, Chastity Malfras to Charles Lafitte III, who's the bank's appraisal officer, mm -hmm. referencing um, 3606 Big Bay Drive, Edisto. And it's a, an appraisal request form dated uh, April 22, 2021. Uh, the intended use of the of appraisal is for a refinance. Okay. And the balance is $200,000. All right. And so it's for a refinance. Explain uh, what the refinance was for, if you could, to the court. Uh, at the time, the mortgage had matured, or the mortgage loan had matured, and we needed to renew it. All right. It had already matured, is that correct? Yes, sir. So this was an existing debt, uh, not any sort of new debt, and so the appraisal was because you have to renew this note that had already matured, correct? Yes, sir. Or it has to be paid off, one of the two. Correct. All right. Uh, states 365 and see if you recognize that document. This was the memo summarizing, or this is a copy of the memo that summarizes the relationship of Alec Murdoch with the bank. It was prepared and presented at the executive committee uh, meeting. Okay. Again, I'm going to put that up on the screen, but uh, this lists some of uh, the indebtedness that Alec had to the bank that you previously described earlier. Yes, sir. And including uh, the Zero United with outstanding $307,761. Yes, sir. And then it outstanding and charged off not only Zero United, but also $362,896 for Redbeard. Yes, sir. few more. I'm 
going to show you what's been marked as uh, States 366 and see if you recognize that document. It's a document produced from our loan accounting system, and it uh, lists all the notes, uh, outstanding notes uh, in the name of Alec Murdoch, and also co-borrower uh, with his uh, father, Randolph Murdoch III. All right, and that it, it lists the balances on those particular loans as of June 7, 2021? That's correct. It does not include, though, the charged off loans, Zero United and Redbeard, is that That's correct? That's correct. So on the first one, is that the balance right there, $104,119.80? That's the principal owed, yes, sir. That's the principal owed. These are not deposits, correct? That's correct. Owed by who? I think for the 104000 was uh, Williams Islands. Right. But I mean, what, what borrower owed those? Uh, that would have been Mr. Murdoch, uh, Alec Murdoch, yes. All right. And then this next one, what's the balance on that? How much is owed for this loan? Uh, $806,666.26. The next one, how much is owed for this loan? $195,171.64. How much is owed for this loan? $999,650.94. And this is actually a million dollar line of credit, is that correct? Yes, sir. It's pretty much maxed out, isn't it? Yes, sir. And then finally, this one right here, what's the balance on that? $91,368.90. more. set of documents here. Um, I'm going to show you what's been marked as uh, states. Stand by for me real quick. All right, I'll show you uh, States 367 and see if you uh, recognize that document. It's a copy of a bank statement, uh, Alec Murdoch Farm Account. And what is the balance of that on June 7, 2021? June 7, 2021 shows a deficit balance of $2,458.23. Negative balance? Yes, sir. I'll show you what's been marked as 368, and do you recognize that? Again, it's a uh, checking account statement, account uh, Richard Alexander Murdoch for account 6092. All right, can you tell me what the balance was on June 7th, 2021? $2,185.23. I'm going to show you what's been marked is States 369 and uh, see if you recognize that. This is a uh, Again, statement for a health savings account, 3094, uh, in the name of Richard Alexander Murdoch. All right, and what's the uh, balance on that? Uh, $7,540.61. Right. And that's a health savings account? Yes, sir. Can that be used for any purpose or only for legitimate medical purposes? I uh, think the latter, the medical purposes. Show you what's been marked as uh, states 370 and see if you recognize that. Uh, 
Again, a bank statement, copy of a bank statement in the name of Alec Murdoch, uh, account number 6649. Uh, and the uh, balance on 67 would have been $62,115.06. All right. And then finally, 371, if you could tell me to recognize that. This is a uh, account statement, uh, interest checking account in the name of Margaret Maggie Murdoch and Alex Murdoch, uh, number 5109, and the balance on 67, $3,900 and four cents. I have a couple more questions for you, for the purposes of this hearing at least. It's fair to say that of June 2021 and the months after, the indebtedness to Palmetto State Bank from Alec Murdoch was very, very large. Yes, sir. And it's fair to say it also had charged off loans in the past. Is that correct? Yes, sir. If it had come out at any particular time from, let's say, 2010 on up to June of 2021, or at any time, that Alec Murdoch had been stealing money from his partners or stealing money from his clients, would this bank have continued to loan him money? No, sir. Nothing further at this time, Your Honor. I have a defense. Yes, Your Honor, briefly. <clears throat> Just to be clear, Mr. Malinowski, on June 7th, 2021, Mr. Murdoch was not overdrawn at Palmetto State Bank, correct? No, sir. Well, June 7? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have his bank statement? Well, we just went through them. Right. Well, there was there was one statement. The farm account was minus $2,045. There was another account that was plus $2,185, according to Exhibit 368. His health savings account, Exhibit 369, had $7,540. Exhibit 370 had a positive balance of $62,000 and some change. And then Maggie's account, Exhibit 371, had $3,904. So, yes, sir. So there's one account that was overdrawn for $2,000, but positive balances and all the other. Yes, sir. And Alec Murdoch had been a customer of Palmetto State Bank for many, many years. Is that correct? That's correct. And had he ever ever been denied a request from Palmetto State Bank for a line of credit or a loan up until uh, September of 2021? To my knowledge, no. Okay. And in July of 2021, apparently he got a $750,000 loan that was, a, was approved according to uh, the um, Documents here by three members of the board of directors. Do you remember that? Let's see if I can find that. You see the highlighted language there? I can see the highlighted language, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And um, and this is this is from let's be sure we know what we're talking about. 
minutes of the board of directors meeting um, August 17, 2021. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And here there's says Charles Chairman Lafitte reviewed the loans to Richard Alexander Murdoch. Russell Lafitte stated that his intention is to sell the farm. We have mortgages on the properties that supersede the property being transferred into Maggie's name. Now, what does that mean? Tell me about that. You have mortgages on the property that superseded the property being transferred to Maggie's name. Do you remember that? I guess it would reference the mortgages, the date of the mortgage and the date they were recorded on previous loans. So at some point in time, Alec transferred the Moselle property into Maggie's name. It's my understanding, yes. And sure. before that date, your bank already had a mortgage on the property? Yes, sir. Okay. Moselle property? Are we talking about Moselle property here? If you're referring to the to the farm, I'm assuming he's, he's referring to Moselle, yes sir. Okay. Then um, at the last sentence of this paragraph, it says Elizabeth Malinowski commented the $750,000 loan did not appear to have been approved by the executive committee. Russell Lafitte explained that three of the five members approved, approved the loan. Do you recall that? I recall it, yes, sir. And who are the three of the five members of the executive committee that approved the loan? It would have been uh, Charlie Lafitte, Gray Henderson, and Russell Lafitte. And do you recall Charlie Lafitte telling you at some point in time, maybe around in here or even before, that if Alec Murdoch wanted to receive a loan from the bank, that he would get it? That was Mr. Lafitte's opinion, yes. And who was Mr. Lafitte in relation to the bank in June of 2007? 2007? Excuse me, June 7, 2021. He was the chairman of the bank. Okay. And was Russell Lafitte related to Mr. Lafitte? His son. Okay. And who are the members of the executive committee? The executive committee was Charlie Lafitte, Gray Henderson, Russell Lafitte, Scott Swain, and myself. And so. Mr. Lafitte, Mr. Charlie Lafitte's opinion was if Alec Murdoch wanted a loan from the, the bank, he would get it. That, that, was, that was his opinion. And on the $750,000 loan he was provided, um, apparently without a lot of paperwork done on the front end, but it was approved by Mr. Lafitte, his son, Russell Lafitte, is that correct? Yes, sir. And his daughter, uh, Gray Henderson, is that right? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and you mentioned that there was some, in June of 2021, there were some Four point two million dollars or something outstanding. I don't have the exact number, but um, maybe we can find that. Do you, do you know how much was secured and unsecured in when you reviewed the um, indebtedness? Do you have a document I can refer to? <clears throat> I'm trying to find it. Hold on. I'm going to put on the screen here. We may be talking about the same, the same document we looked at, and I have the highlighted language. It says here. Um, well, let's just refer to the 
it says uh, Norris Lafitte had found a mathematical error which will be corrected to three million five hundred and forty four thousand eight hundred and ninety seven dollars um, total loans and, and those are total loans to, to Mr. Murdoch is that correct according to a, another memo that came okay when I'm so as to this amount how much uh, was it all secured Without seeing the memo, I, I, I couldn't tell. Okay. If you've got the memo, I'll certainly go down the loans. <clears throat> I don't have the memo. I only have what I was provided. Does this memo set forth the collateral for the uh, indebtedness? To Mr. Murdoch, to Mr. Murdoch. And I am referring to Exhibit 365. Can you pull down that memo? There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you read that? Yes, sir. Try to zoom in without putting too many shadows on it. And so we, we, we went through that. Um, is that the collateral for those loans? As stated in the memo, yes. Okay. Now, you mentioned that some loans have been written off. Are you aware that Mr. Murdoch was still paying on the loans that had been written off? Yes, sir, I was. And you mentioned that... Um, and had Mr. Murdoch always paid the bank interest, monies he owed? And did he ever go in default? And let's put it like, did he ever go in default on any notes issued to him by Palmetto State Bank? Redbeard and Zero United. And those were the ones that were written off? Yes, sir. But he continued to pay those, correct? He periodically made payments, yes, sir. sometime the night of June the 7th. Are you aware that she was scheduled to meet your appraiser at Edisto on June the 8th? No, sir. The, uh, the Moselle pro property was titled in Maggie Murdoch's name in June of 2021, correct? I believe that's the correct. The bank had had filed mortgages on the property that predated whenever he, that was transferred to Ms. Murdoch, right? Yes, sir. The Edisto Beach House was titled in jointly in Alec Murdoch and Maggie Murdoch's names, correct? At one point. Before her death. I believe it was in her name solely at the time of her death. You do? Are you sure about that? I believe so. Okay. And what information are you relying upon to say that? Uh, looking at the Colleton County uh, deed records.
Hun så ikke her. Undergo routine FDIC audits, Palmetto State Bank? Yes, sir. And had Mr. Uh, Murdoch's relationship with the bank ever been flagged in any audit conducted by the FDIC or their contract auditors? To my knowledge, no. <clears throat> I'll ask you just a few more questions. Uh, with, may it please the court. Uh, get uh, 365 back that we were just looking at. This is that memo that was prepared for the uh, for the um, board meetings, correct? This was the one that was prepared for the executive, executive committee. committee. And uh, what does it say right there at the bottom, the purpose that's being reported that the $750,000 is for? To remodel uh, of the house in Edisto. <clears throat> does it say anything about sending $350,000 to Chris Wilson to try to make up the funds that he had diverted from his law firm? No, sir. Does it say anything about $400,000 to cover a $347,000 overdraft? No, sir. After June 7th was the first significant activity from the bank to Alec to provide that $350,000 off the books with no application whatsoever. Yes, sir. And after June the 7th, did his account run to negative $347,000? Yes, sir. And the bank kept paying? Yes, sir. Perhaps the most generous overdraft policy ever seen? <laughs> Quite possibly. You were asked a little bit about Zero United and Redbeard, which are up on the screen. The bank did not foreclose on those properties, is that correct? That is correct. So Alec Murdoch still owned those properties, correct? He and partners, yes, sir. All right, but if he were to try to sell them, could he have sold them without having to account to the bank? He would have had to pay back the uh, monies he owed, had borrowed from the bank. And we see that we up on that screen, what happened to Mike Zook? <clears throat> If he had sold, tried to sell those properties, would he have just had to uh, pay the bank those amounts listed there, or could it potentially be much higher than that? Potentially much higher. And explain to the court very quickly why it could be much higher than that, that he would have to satisfy before he could sell those properties. There would be uh, accrued interest and any late charges and fees that accumulated since the, the date of the charge-off. Once y'all charged it off, it no longer was accruing interest and penalties and fees on the books at least, correct? Yes, sir. But if you were to, uh, if he was to try to sell that property and, and the buyer came to you or to, uh, to see how much they needed to pay y'all out of the proceeds before title could transfer, y'all would go back and look at all that interest that hadn't been paid over that time. Yes, we'd provide a payoff statement which would have included principal uh, accrued interest or lost interest to that date and uh, any late fees and charges. And he would be unable to sell those properties and transfer title until some arrangement was reached with the bank? Yes, sir. We just, uh, you were just asked about whether or not Maggie was going to be meeting an appraisal at the Edisto property, but you've testified in no uncertain terms that that appraisal was to renew the mortgage that was already in existence that had matured, correct? Yes, sir. It had nothing to do with a new 750? Yes, sir. We just uh, talked about the negative $347,000 overdraft policy, correct? Yes, sir. In two months, his account had went to negative $347,000. Yes, sir. If it had come out 
that Alec Murdoch had been diverting fees from his law firm, if Alec Murdoch had been forced to resign from his law firm, if it had come out that he had been misappropriating money from his clients, would the bank have continued to pay charges coming in on that account? No, sir. No. No, sir. No uncertain terms about that. No, no uncertain terms. So all this testimony about the relationship in the bank, if the truth had come out, it's a new ball game, correct? Yes, sir. And in the wake of all of this, Russell Lafitte was terminated and you became CEO, is that correct? Yes, sir. And now there's a new sheriff in town at Palmetto State Bank, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Anything further? Just briefly, uh Mr. Malinowski, how much in interest did Alec Murdoch pay to Palmetto State Bank over the years? I don't know. It's excess of $4 million, isn't it? I don't, I don't have a figure. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Let me call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll stand just a moment while that next witness is coming. State calls Tony Satterfield. My name is Michael Satterfield. My last name is spelled S-A-T-T-E-R-F-I-E-L-D. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? All right, pull that mic to you just a little bit close so we can hear you good. Uh, how old are you? I'm 33. All right, where do you work? I work at Newport Memorial Hospital. Okay. And uh, where'd you grow up? Uh, in Hampton. Okay. Uh, for the purposes of this hearing, we're just on a hearing in front of the judge to determine the admissibility of some testimony. So I'm just going to ask you a few questions, not everything I might ask you if we're in front of the jury. You understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. Speak up for us because the court reporter and everybody needs to, to hear, yeah. hear you. Um, who was your mother? Uh, Gloria Satterfield. Gloria Satterfield? Yes. And um, is Gloria still with us? She's not. And when did she pass? Uh, February 26, 2018. 2018? Yes, sir. And who did she work for when she passed? Uh, Alex and Maggie Murdoch. Okay. And do you know Alec Murdoch? I do. Do you see him here in the courtroom today? I do. Can you point him out? Uh, yes. Right there. Okay. Your Honor, can the record reflect he's done five of the Um. I mean, it's that camera. Yeah. Where is he? Where is he? Uh, over that term. Pardon? Point him out again, again if you want, uh, Right there. All right. right. Can you tell me what jacket he's wearing? Uh, a navy blue jacket. Okay. It does. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, 
Over, how long did your mom, roughly, how long did she work for Alec? Do you know? Uh, I had to take an estimate, I guess, 20 something years, maybe give and take. I don't know that that years. Okay. And slide up just a little bit more. And you talk right into that mic. There you go. Just a little bit. You need to get up on the mic so we can uh, hear you. All right. Um, what did uh, your mom do for uh, Ella? Uh, she was their housekeeper. She babysat for them. She cleaned their house um, and kind of anything else they kind of need. Okay. And she had been doing that for a long time? Yes. During the course of that, you got to know Alec and his family to some extent as well? Yes. Uh, did you trust Mr. Murdoch? Yes. What happened to your mom? Uh, she fell and hit her head. Okay. And where was she when she, that happened? Uh, she was at Alice's house in Moselle. In Moselle? Yes. Um, did she pass right away or did she live for a while? Uh, she lived for a few weeks. Was she ever able to say to you what happened, how she fell or anything? Uh, no, she was not. Um, after she passed, uh, did you have any conversation with Alec uh, about what to do about it? Uh, I did. And what was the conversation you had with Alec? Uh, I, barely, go ahead. Uh, I barely remember, but it's like, um, you know, let me go after my insurance company for this or whatever, you know, kind of get these medical bills and stuff paid. Okay. So he said he was going to go after his insurance company? Yes. And get medical bills for your mom paid? Yes. Did he say he might get... Did he have money for you and your brother? Yes. Uh, did he say how much that might be? Uh, no. Uh, ultimately, was there a lawsuit filed? Yes. Right, and he, he uh, who did you consider your lawyer was in all of this? Uh, Alex. Uh, at some point in time, did he bring another lawyer in? Yes. And what did he tell you about that? Um, he said, if I understood it correctly, you know, I can't do it myself because it's a conflict of interest. Um, I'm going to send you to my buddy. Corey Fleming. Corey Fleming? Yes. Did he tell you anything about his relationship with Corey Fleming other than they were buddies? Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm trying to hear you. Did he tell you anything more about his relationship with Corey uh, Fleming? No. Um, after he brought in Corey Fleming, were you still communicating directly with Alec about the case? Yes. Who did you think your lawyer was? Uh, Alex. The whole time? Yes. Did he ever bring in a person, uh, or did they ever bring in a person by, by the name of Chad? Yes. And you remember Chad's last name? Uh, Westendorf. Okay. And what did they tell you about Chad? Um, that he um, should be my PR. Your PR? Yes. Did you ever meet with Chad? Uh, yes. Did you meet with him a lot or just? Uh, one time I can think of. Okay. Alec told you that he was going after his insurance company. Did he say how much that insurance was? Um, one of them that I know of was like $500,000, and that's the only one. That's the only one he told you about? Yes. Did he ever tell you that there was also an umbrella policy worth upwards of $5 million? No. Never mentioned that to you, did he? No. Course and just one moment. We'll show you what's been marked as states 372 to your testimony and just have you take a look at that. And do you recognize that document? Uh, yes. And tell me what that is. Uh, that is a cover sheet that I backed that I sent him, Alex. Okay. And what was, what's the reason that you sent that to Alex? Um, I got something from the trailer company and a medical bill, I believe, and I just wanted to be sure what I needed to do with it. You had received some paperwork about your mom? Uh, it was a bill. It was a bill? Yeah. And who did you send that to? Uh, Alex Murdoch or the law firm. All right. And why did you send it to Alex Murdoch? Because uh, he said if we got any medical bills, just forward them to him, and I didn't know if I needed to do anything with it. But you, because you thought he was your lawyer? Yes. 
All right. And this had your phone number on there, but we blacked it out, correct? Yes. As time went on, did you have conversations with Alec asking him about the case and what was going on with the case or anything like that? Uh, yes, not very rarely, but every few months or so. Right. And what would he tell you just generally? over? The, over um, the first, it was hard, hard, and he knows like it was making progress, and he kind of left it at that. He said it, it was hard, but they were making progress? Yes. Did he tell you anything about whether or not you and your brother were going to get any money? Uh, the medical he, bills were paid? said he was hoping. Right. Did he give you an idea, any idea of the amount? Uh, if I remember correctly, one time he said he trying to get each of you at least $100,000 a piece. Each of, each of you, you yes. and your brother? Yes. Okay. Um, at some point in time, did your family advise you that there was some media reporting about a settlement in the case? Yes. All right. And at that time, had you heard anything from Alec or Corey or Chad or anybody about a settlement in the case? No. All right. And what, if anything, did you do after your family? Did they ask you to do anything? Uh, yeah, they said you might want to kind of follow up on it and kind of see... And did you make a phone call to Alec? Uh, yes. All right. And what month was that in? Uh, I believe the last time I talked to him was in June of 21. June of 21? Yes. Around the time of the murders? Yes. And what did you ask him? Uh, I can't believe what I asked him, but um, it was still making progress and be ready to settle, you know, by the end of the year. He told you it was still making progress and you was hoping to settle by the end of the year? Yes. Did he tell you that they had already gotten a settlement for $505,000? No. Did he tell you that they had already gotten a settlement for $3.8 million? No. Had he ever told you that there was an umbrella policy for $5 million? No. Did he ever mention to you anything about Forge? No. Did he mention anything to you about structuring any settlement? No. Did you give him permission to steal your money? No. Ultimately, in the wake of all of this, you've come to find out that there was a settlement for $505,000, correct? Uh, yes. And it was diverted by Alec Murdoch, correct? Yes. And ultimately, you've come to find out that there was a settlement under the umbrella policy uh, for $3.8 million, is that yeah. correct? Yes. Or thereabouts, correct? Yes. And a large portion of that was diverted by Alec Murdoch, is that right? Yes. Did you ever get one cent from Alec Murdoch when he was still, um, before all of this happened? No. And it took, after this happening, and it took a legal process for that to happen, is that right? Yes. And ultimately, is it your understanding that he confessed judgment to taking money for both of those, is that yes. right? In June of 2021, you made a call to him asking the status of this case, is that correct? Uh, I can't remember if he called me or if I called him, but yes, I talked to him in June of 2021. You talked to him in June of 2021? Yes. And there were reports in the media about that settlement, correct? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And please answer any questions the defense has, okay? By the defense. Good afternoon. Good morning. I'm sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you. You had a family member who saw an article in somewhere. Do you know, remember where the article was published? Uh, I don't remember exactly where they found it at or seen it at. Okay, but but after that article was published, that's when you st started making inquiries and you contacted Mr. Murdoch? Uh, yes, once they seen the article or whatever, they were like, you need to follow up on it. And, uh, yes. and I can't remember if he called me or if I called him. And did you... Do you know whether you called him on the cell phone? Uh, it was on his cell phone normally. That's how I called him, yes. So you called him on the cell phone? Yes. Okay. And his cell phone record would reflect – how many times did you call him? What was that? How many times did you call him? Like uh, once, twice, three. We talked like three or four times, you know, throughout the whole year, if I remember correctly. Okay. And, and when you called him after – 
reading some article about a settlement. Do you know if that was before or after Maggie and Paul were murdered? Uh, it was around the time, but I don't remember if it was before or after. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's probably wrong. Thank you. You may step down. Witness. Your Honor, can we have just a very quick break to uh, get the exhibits ready for that? Yes, sir. Thank you. We'll take five minutes or so.
please be seated. Call your next witness. State calls Carson Burney. Do you find the testimony about the public works of the truth? I do. State your name again for the record. Spell your last name, please. Carson Burney, B-U-R-N-E-Y. Good morning, Mr. Burney. Good morning. Still morning, just barely. It is. Where do you work, Mr. Burney? I work for the South Carolina Attorney General's Office. And what is your job and title at the South Carolina Attorney General's Office? I am the Forensic Accountant in the State Grand Jury Division. All right. And how long have you been a forensic accountant? Uh, approximately a year and a half. All right. And what do you do as a forensic accountant for the State Grand Jury? As a forensic accountant, I identify, compile, analyze different financial records to include bank statements, credit card statements, loan documents. I also trace assets uh, from source to ultimate disposition. And uh, what did you do prior to uh, serving as a forensic accountant for the state grand jury? In 2019, I joined the South Carolina Department of Revenue as a sales tax auditor, and I was there for a little over two years. There are a variety of other niceties, but because it's an in-camera hearing, we'll cut straight to the chase. As a forensic accountant for the state grand jury division, have you uh, <coughs> reviewed any documents in relation to a Richard Alexander Murdoch? I have. And what sorts of documents have you reviewed in relation to that gentleman? Similar documents, as I mentioned earlier, they would include bank statements, loan documents, uh, wire information, money orders, um, and, and other various things. And what were you asked to do in relation to those documents? I was asked to uh, trace the alleged stolen funds and ultimately show where the disposition of those funds ended up. Now, you said trace. Uh, what is tracing uh, from a 10,000 foot view? Tracing is simply just following a fund. In this example, are, these are the alleged stolen checks. Uh, primarily, that went to Forge account and uh, following the money through to see where exactly it was ultimately uh, spent out of those accounts. And so in analyzing records uh, and in uh, coordination with law enforcement were specific instruments identified uh, and uh, asked of you to trace uh, where their ultimate disposition was. I was. Now, when we say ultimate disposition, uh, can you follow that same dollar forever and ever onto eternity, or is there sort of a line where you have to draw it and stop and say that's as far as we can go? You, you have to draw a line. Obviously, you could follow money forever, forever, and forever, but uh, for the purposes of my analysis, I looked at when uh, they ultimately went out of an account controlled by Alex Murdoch. Um, did you also uh, draw any lines when they went into any sort of uh, uh, loan statement or, or credit card statement or anything like that? That's correct. If it was a credit card payment, payment or a loan payment, I would stop there for that particular trace. And have you prepared documents uh, reflecting uh, the conclusions that you reached upon uh, tracing uh, those funds? I have. All right. And just very briefly, there's a variety of different ways to trace uh, money. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and just very quickly, which uh, methodology did you apply in tracing the funds? Right, so uh, you do have to have some rules when you are tracing funds um, to stay consistent. So the, the method I used was a first in, first out method. And, and, and what is the first in, first out method? It's exactly like the name implies, the first money into an account would be the first money out of an account. I'm showing you a document that has been labeled for the purposes of this uh, in-camera proceeding as it states Exhibit 373. Very briefly, do you recognize this document? I do. What is it? This is a tracing of funds regarding the $792,000 with the Ferris case. Uh, may I please have the honor?
And uh, Mr. Burton, can you see that? I can. All right. And so uh, explain very briefly here at the top, uh, what is this uh, green table at the top? The green table at the top indicate the three instruments I was tracing. So the first being a check in the amount of $192,000 with a date or a uh, negotiated date of March 10th, 2021. Second, a $375,000 instrument that was ultimately negotiated on March 23rd, 2021. And the last is a instrument in the amount of $225,000 that was ultimately negotiated on April 20th, 2021. And there you can see the bank number, account number that it was deposited into. And what were the last four digits of that bank account that it was deposited into? 6779. And what was the descriptive uh, holder of that account? Alex Murdoch. And uh, what's that uh, next column, the from column? The from column is uh, where the check was from, and you can see it was a Wilson Law Group IOLTA account. And in preparing this document, did you have to re uh, review a, a considerable amount of bank records in order to uh, uh, prepare it? A lot of bank records. A yes, lot sir. of bank records. Yes, sir. And, and specific instruments, correct? That is correct. All right, and down here below, what is this blue table? The blue table is a pivot table, which is just a summary in Excel. That shows the ultimate disposition of where that money went, and you can see at the bottom it will, it will total out to the to the initial amount of money that went in. All right, and uh, not to uh, call out any uh, too many uh, specific uh, transactions because we are uh, in a in camera hearing, um, but uh, we have here, for example, C. E. Smith five hundred seven thousand five hundred sixty one dollars sixty three cents, and then uh, the number twenty six next to that. Can you briefly explain uh, what those uh, different columns stand for? So the first column, you can see where it came out of the bank account. Um, those descriptors are what was written on the check or what was done with the check, as you can see with cash withdrawal. And then uh, the total amount is in the total column. And then finally, you have the number of checks in the last column. And then uh, another name that we have here is uh, what appears to be the name of an attorney uh, in the amount of $150,000. Am I reading that correctly? That is correct. And then uh, we have it broken down into two separate uh, subsections. What is the distinction between those two different subsections? Just different bank accounts where the money was ultimately disposed. Uh, money would transfer from one bank account to another bank account. So I try to differentiate those two different accounts. And I, I jumped ahead of myself a little bit getting into this first tracing exhibit, um, but just generally speaking, upon your review of all of the different bank accounts uh, associated with Alec Murdoch, what was the general flow of funds? Did they primarily go into one bank account, or did they go into one bank account and then into others, or, or how did it work? So uh, with the forge checks, typically they would transfer out to other accounts. Um, Alex Murdaugh had a, a few different Bank of America accounts in addition to the Palmetto State bank accounts that would go over there as well. So he had uh, a bank account at uh, Bank of America that was labeled uh, Richard Alexander Murdoch Forge. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and did he also have another bank account at Bank of America that didn't have any mention of Forge? Is that correct? That's correct. The, the second bank account you're talking about seemed, appeared to be a personal checking account just in his name. And so would money go into one account and then into uh, that checking account, or uh, would money go into directly that checking account, or both? Um, so m it depends on the, on the instrument. For example, these three checks went into his personal checking account because it, they were named to Richard um, Alexander Murdoch. And so here, coming out of that Bank of America account ending 6779, that is the checking account, ultimately 747000 out of the $792,000 was dispersed. Is that correct? That is correct. And then uh, am I, uh, and how much was dispersed uh, after being transferred into uh, Palmetto State Bank account 6092? $42,000. 6092, is, uh, is that a particularly active account for Mr. Murdoch? It is. It's one of his most active accounts at Palmetto State Bank. And then a little bit further down here, we have something that's labeled uh, PSB 1646 Alec Murdoch Farm. Uh, what was that account? That was, uh, it's just labeled a farm account, and it, from just looking at account records, seems to primarily deal with uh, the farm being Moselle property. And how much money uh, of these Ferris fees was dispersed out of that farm account? $3,000. And then flipping behind that facial summary page, we're not going to go through line by line here, but we have every single individual transaction that is summarized in that uh, covers uh, pivot table. Is that correct? 
That is correct. Uh, some of the details I would include on those pivot tables. If, uh, the de if there's a date on the check, the date it was negotiated, the amount, and um, the account number. And then what we're looking at here, uh, the $192,000 is at one of the instruments that you were tracing? Yes, sir. And then this next page, 375000 is that one of the instruments? Yes. And then the next page, uh, the $225,000, is that one of the instruments? Yes, sir. Bernie, I am showing you a document labeled at this time as State's Exhibit 374. Do you recognize this document? I do. What is it? This is a tracing uh, summary for a check in the amount of $403,500 from the Moss, Coon, and Fleming uh, client trust account. Is this... Uh Identified in common parlance uh, by, as uh, Satterfield money? Yes. And it's a little bit tiny. I'm going to see if I can zoom in just a bit. <clears throat> and never mind, we'll just stick with this. <laughs> All right, so uh, on what date was that uh, $403,000 uh, deposited? January 9th, 2019. And I said the number, but how much money are we talking here? $403,500. All right. And then how much was ultimately, uh, uh, into what account was it deposited? It was deposited into the Forge account ending in 7625. And in uh, descriptive terms, which account is that? The Forge account. The, the fake that, Forge that account. That was DB, yes, sir. All right. And uh, from that account, uh, was any uh, were any funds ultimately dispersed? Yes. How much? Uh, 7625, you can see a cash withdrawal in the amount of $12,500 right. over other, two different transactions. But otherwise, was that money moved into other accounts? Yes, primarily, yes. And uh, from the Bank of America checking account, uh, how much money was ultimately dispersed? $3,970.07. And then uh, was that money further transferred into other accounts? It was. Uh, which uh, account was it uh, primarily transferred into? Into the account ending in 6092 at Palmetto State Bank. And uh, out of that Palmetto State Bank account, how much money was ultimately dispersed? If you could move it down a little bit. There we go. Uh, looks like $387,000. $29.93. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, payments that were made, but there's a cluster of payments here at the top, payment to loan, payment to loan, payment to loan. What are those, uh, generally speaking? Those are loans that were held at Palmetto State Bank that were under Alex's name, at least some of them in part, some of them in, in solely him. And uh, these uh, items in parentheses, are those uh, just sort of descriptors of those particular loans? Yes, they're, they're for my notes, uh, so I could identify which loan number went to uh, which loan. And, and you specifically reviewed the, the loan documents in relation to each of these loans, correct? Yes, sir. So you're familiar with the supporting documentation for what they were collateralized by? Yes. Uh, so here at the top, uh, we have uh, a loan for Red Beard, correct? That is correct. And a payment on that in the amount of 47000 some odd dollars? Yes, sir. And then for Zero United uh, in the amount of $55,684 and some change. Is that correct? That is correct. And then a payment on a uh, Moselle loan. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, and how much was that one? $65,238.92. And then a payment on a GMC Yukon. How much was that payment? $75,099. $75,099. And uh, how much was paid on this Moselle note? $104,056.51. Right. And then once again, as with before, in these yellow tables, you have the specific transactions that you traced using that first in, first out method, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, is this the instrument that you traced? Yes, sir.
I'm showing you a document labeled as States Exhibit 375. Do you recognize this document? I do. And what is it? This is a tracing summary of a check from the Moss Coon and Fleming client trust account, roughly in the amount of $2.9 million. And uh, when was uh, the, uh, this instrument deposited? That was May 15th, 2019. And uh, you indicated it was roughly $2.9 million? Yes, sir. And into what account was it deposited? Into a forge account ending in 7625. And here we have a summary table of all the various expenses that that $2.9 million funded. Um, and uh, the sum total, uh, this first account appears to be the farm account. Uh, how much money was ultimately dispersed from the farm account? $147,247. And this next one would be uh, for the checking account, is that correct? That is correct, ending in 6092. And how much money... This one's a long one, so we have to flip over. How much money was ultimately dispersed from that uh, checking account? $1,429,753. And uh, this next one says 6649. Uh, is that an additional account at Pemetta State Bank? That is another checking account under the name of Alex Murdoch. And how much was ultimately dispersed from that account? $13,000. And then here we have uh, 6779 BOFA. Is that the, the checking account at uh, Bank of America? That is a personal checking account at Bank of America. And how much was ultimately dispersed from that account? If you scoot it up just a hair. I keep looking down and you're looking <laughs> up. My bad. Uh, $1,208,449.89. All right. And to identify just a handful of uh, specific transactions or specific individuals who received some of this money, here we have a C.E. Smith um, is it, we actually have a variety of names here. In reviewing the instruments, did you see uh, any sort of pattern of um, differentiation uh, of, of checks all going to the same person? I did. I, I saw it in different names. Um, just off the top of my head, it was over 10 different variations of, of that name. Okay, and but all of those different variations, uh, to your understanding and working with law enforcement, uh, who is it your understanding all those checks refer to? Curtis Edward Smith. And so here we have a line that says C.E. Smith, and uh, how much uh, uh, went out of this money to him? So under the name C.E. Smith, $132,687.03. And over how many instruments was that money effectuated? 24 different instruments. And then a little bit further down, we have a Curtis E. Smith. And uh, if I can read lines correctly, how much money uh, was uh, dispersed under that name? $56,765.48. And over how many uh, instruments? Your highlighter's covering it by 12. And uh, the next name down, Curtis Eddie Smith. $6,404. And that was a single instrument? Yes, sir. Curtis Edward Smith. $4,725. Over one instrument. And Curtis Smith. Curtis Smith, $23,823.03 .03 over four different instruments. Uh, we additionally had a payment to a credit card here uh, in uh, the amount of how much? Uh, $7,570.50. And did you uh, ultimately get the records of that credit card? I did. Um, did you attempt to uh, trace any further what specific purchases uh, that money went to? I did not. I just ended up the payment to the credit card for my own sanity, primarily. And uh, here we have uh, Randolph Murdoch III. Um, uh, how much uh, money went to uh, Mr. Murdoch? It was $385,000 in one instrument. And then additionally, right below that, we have the name Scott Harriet. How much money went to Mr. Harriet? $84 over one instrument.
Your Honor, Your Honor, we'll see if we can accelerate this process a little bit. Mr. Bernie, I have handed you a series of exhibits starting with states 376 and ending in states 397. Do you recognize these documents? I do. And are all of these exhibits from 376 to 397 documents that you prepared tracing the flow of funds uh, from instruments um, involving money going through the forge account through checks negotiated in the name of Palmetto State Bank and from the Ferris fees from the Mack truck case? Yes, sir. And I think we actually already got through the Ferris fees from that truck case. So these would be what went through the Forge account, correct? Through the Forge account, there's some Palmetto State Bank checks in there as well. Um, in addition to, I believe there might be a check or two in the name of Alex Murda on there. And throughout... <laughs> All of these tracings and all of these summaries, do they reflect that the money that Mr. Murdoch took went to his personal use and benefit? They do. And these are ordered in, roughly speaking, reverse chronological order, correct? Correct. Going from 2021 all the way back to a date of deposit on December 20th, 2011. Is that correct? That is correct. Your Honor, if I understood correctly after briefly conferring with counsel for the defendant, that they would be willing for the purposes of this hearing to stipulate to the admissibility of these documents for the court's in-camera review. Have I stated that correctly? You have. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so stipulated. Your Honor, in the interest of time, uh, I would present these documents uh, to the court uh, as admitted. Provide the original to the court reporters and provide the court a copy of them. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Very good. And that would be uh, no further questions. All right. We have no questions. Sure. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. State ready for the jury, state and defense. Your Honor, one moment, please.
Okay, if you bring the jury. Patient, the jury will stand for a moment. Sir. Thank you. Be seated. Yes. All right. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Welcome back. Day number 10. State's case. Next witness. State House Tom Darnell. I'll be the truth, so help you die. I do. Okay. Take a seat in the witness stand. State your name again for the record. Spell your last name. My name is Thomas Edward Darnell. Last name is spelled D-A-R-N-E-L-L. -L. Okay. Good morning, Agent Darnell. Good morning. Um, could you tell the jurors um, where you work? I am a fingerprint examiner at the State Law Enforcement Division uh, Forensic Crime Lab. And how long have you um, been a fingerprint examiner for SLED? Approximately 30 years. Can you tell us some of your um, training education um, that you've had? Yes, ma'am. To begin with, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Criminal Justice from University of South Carolina, where I graduated in 1982. I started my employment with the Richland County Sheriff's Office in Columbia, where I was employed for about eight years. I started my career at SLED in 1990 in the Lake Print Crime Scene Department. During that time, I completed an in-house training program that dealt with all aspects of fingerprint the fingerprint science I've attended a number of uh, courses uh, across the state as well as out-of-state courses that dealt that dealt with all areas of fingerprint science to include how to process evidence for fingerprints and how to compare fingerprints and I also trained under the FBI Academy in Quantico Virginia in the same area of, of uh, fingerprints I have, and I've also trained other examiners to do the same job that I'm doing today. Um, Your Honor, at this time the state would move to qualify um, Agent Tom Darnell as an expert in fingerprint analysis. Thanks. <clears throat> He's so qualified. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, all right, Agent Darnell, could you just kind of um, tell us in general um, about um, fingerprint evidence? Well, basically, um, fingerprint evidence can be most anything. Uh, it can be items that are porous, items that are non-porous, items that come to SLED and where we get requested to process them to see if we can identify any fingerprints that might be on the surface. Uh, fingerprints are primarily moisture. About 98% of the fingerprint that may be left on the surface is nothing more than moisture perspiration or sweat, if you want to call it sweat. Um, and then once we uh, determine the type of evidence that we have, then we try to uh, develop it, we try to enhance any impressions that might be there. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that in most cases, the fingerprints that we're trying to develop are invisible, basically latent 
a, a latent print means just that, hidden or invisible. So it would require some enhancement. And how or what is the process of um, finding these hidden fingerprints? Well, we, we have uh, several different uh, techniques that we can use. Uh, everything from uh, super glue fuming to alternate light sources to fluorescent dye stains to different chemicals that we can use. There's also the, the black fingerprint powder, which is still being used. We don't use a whole lot of that in our laboratory today, but we, we tend to go with the uh, fluorescent dye stains and the different light sources. It just depends on the type of evidence that we're trying to process. And now you mentioned, was it, um, you say super glue fuming? Yes, ma'am. Um, could you describe how that works? Super glue, what we do is we take the evidence, first of all, it has to be a non-porous surface. Uh, that and, and can you give us an example of a non-porous surface versus a porous surface? Not, a non-porous would be like a, a can, uh, a gun, a cartridge case. Uh, porous would be like paper, uh, a paper cup, paper plate, a piece of, uh, a, like a handwritten note or a check or something like along that line. Um, but the super glue is, is a commonly used process across the country, in fact, across the world. Um, and the super glue is simply heated and it creates a vapor or a fume. And that vapor will affix itself to any impressions that might be present on the surface. It enables us to see it better and it, and it also enables us to use a different technique or a different step of the process when it comes to trying to enhance the impression. Okay, and when um, that print, I guess, is revealed in the fuming process, what do you do to analyze the print? Well, once we get the print developed, we uh, photo uh, have it photographed. Uh, we have the, the luxury of having a photo studio within our laboratory, and uh, we have a, a, a photographer that will document that for us uh, photographically so that we can then compare it to any known standards that we may be asked to compare it to. So you would use the photograph for comparison purposes? Yes, ma'am. You don't do any kind of lifts of the print or anything like that? Uh, I have, I've done lots of lifts over my career with the black powder and the, and the clear tape, which is what most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, but uh, in this case, it was black powder was not used. Uh, it, this was, I was working strictly off of a photograph. Um, so you did receive some items to test in this case for fingerprints? I did. I'm going to have you take a look at States Exhibit 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, and 68. Are those 300 blackout shell cases that you received to process for fingerprint evidence? It is. Okay. And did you find any evidence on those cases? Actually, I did not. Uh, there was uh, what we call, the, the result that I used in this, with these items was that there was no fingerprint evidence was observed. Would you expect to find fingerprint evidence on fire cases? We, uh, we don't find a lot of uh, developed prints on cartridge cases. It, it does happen. Uh, we do find fingerprints on cartridge cases, but just not, not a great deal. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that the cartridge cases uh, are they're, they're exposed to heat, they're exposed to uh, friction, and since fingerprints are so fragile, a lot of times that is probably a couple of reasons why we don't find a lot of prints on cartridge cases. All right, did you also receive um, State's Exhibit 33 and 34 to test for? or examine for fingerprint evidence? I did. Did you find any fingerprint evidence on those shot shells? I did not. And again, would you expect to find fingerprint evidence <clears throat> on items of that nature? Uh, you know, we, we, we always make the attempt. Uh, sometimes we're surprised when we process evidence that something will develop. Uh, we, I, I personally don't have, a, I've not had a lot of success with getting prints on shot shells. It's not to say that it hasn't happened. 
And um, you said you've been doing this for about 30 years? Yes, ma'am. And in that time, have you ever found yourself a fingerprint on a fire um, case or shot shell? I can't recall that I have developed anything that I can identify. Uh, I have developed ridge detail or I have developed f uh, fingerprints on cartridge cases, but I can't recall honestly having a case where I was able to actually identify it. Did you also receive a um, shotgun to check for fingerprint evidence? I did. That being State's Exhibit 4, a Benelli Super Black Eagle 3. Um, did you find any fingerprint evidence on that weapon? I did not. Um, what else did you do with that weapon while you had it? Uh, one of the, uh, there was an additional request to have it swabbed for, D, for touch DNA, uh, which, which I did. I swabbed various areas of the, of the uh, shotgun for DNA purposes. And I will hand you State's Exhibit 307. Are those the swabs that you collected from that shotgun? Yes, ma'am. It has the date that I collected it. It has my name and my initials and on the envelopes as well as on the seal. Your Honor, at this time we move states 307 into evidence. The swabs from the shotgun. I'm not sure which shotgun. From the, um, the Benelli that was recovered at the scene. Yes. No objection. It's admitted. And do you recall where on that gun you collected those swabs? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell the jury? If I could look at my notes real quick. I uh, swabbed the trigger. I swabbed the rear stock, front stock, and the ejection lever on the shotgun. Um, Yes, and that, that's the two areas that I swabbed. And why would you have um, swabbed those particular areas? Well, typically in a, in a case involving guns, shotguns, pistols, uh, we, we typically swab the trigger separately um, to, to possibly get a print on the trigger <coughs> as, as to who might have last had their finger on the trigger. Um, and then we swab other areas of the gun that might be more conducive for touch DNA versus latent prints. Anytime we get something that we have a latent print request and a DNA request, we have to try to determine which area to swab, which, which area is typically handled by someone um, <clears throat> that might give us the best chance for any type of forensic evidence, whether it be DNA or latent prints. And did you also swab um, the head stamps of um, those two shot shells? Uh, yes, I did. And those swabs are in states 307 up there, but the other swabs, is that correct? That's correct. Did you have an occasion to also examine Paul's cell phone? I did. I'm going to hand you states exhibit 309. Are those the swabs that you collected from Paul Murdo's cell phone? Um, I, these are swabs that I took from a cell phone. I, I don't know for sure whose phone it was, but, but I, these are swabs that I took from the phone, which was my item 25. And could you um, refer to your report to tell us what item 25 is listed as? Item 25 is listed as a, a one iPhone cell phone, black in color with a clear case. Your Honor, at this time the state would move to admit state's exhibit 309. No objection. Did you also examine that cell phone for fingerprints? I did. Did you find any fingerprints on the phone? I did not find anything that I could identify. Um, I found a very small amount of fingerprint evidence on the phone. Uh, the result that I had to render uh, was what we refer to as no value for comparison, which what that simply means is that there was the evidence of 
someone's fingers having come in contact with the phone, there just was not enough detail, not enough clarity for me to be able to compare it to anyone. Do you recall examining some other um, shotguns or rifles in this case? Yes, ma'am. That would be a 300 blackout rifle, a Mossberg shotgun, a Browning shotgun, and another Benelli shotgun? That's correct. Did you find any fingerprints on any of those guns? Nothing that I could identify. Um, again, the result of no value for comparison was a result that I uh, reported. And if a gun is has a camouflage print, for example, would that make it harder to find fingerprints on that weapon? Well, not not necessarily. Uh, we, we have we have different. We have some some very bright lights that we would use to to help us uh, pick up anything that might be um, on a camouflage type surface. Uh, keep in mind, we're spraying a fluorescent dye stain prior to using the light source so that does help us see um, the prints much better uh, there are some areas on these shotguns that were uh, like textured which would not be very conducive to prints but as far as the camouflage area uh, you know it, it it makes it a little little harder to, to see but we do have the means to be able to analyze it uh, thoroughly okay. and these items that we've been talking about when you process them for fingerprint evidence you use the super glue fuming method? Yes, ma'am. While you were processing those guns, did you collect um, swabs from each gun? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to hand you State's Exhibit 308 if you take a look at that. Yes, ma'am. The, these, are, these are the envelopes that I uh, placed the swab from, this, from the shotguns. Uh, it's got my date and initials and uh, where it came from on the shotgun. Your Honor, at this time the state would move State's Exhibit 308 into evidence. Okay. Good. Now, did you receive a 30 round magazine that was full of 300 blackout cartridges? I did. Did you test that item for fingerprint evidence? I did. Did you find any fingerprints on that magazine? It was, again, as, as the shotguns, it was all no value for comparison. Um, what about each of the bullets that was in that magazine? Did you examine them in any way? Yes, ma'am. I, I took each one of them out of the uh, magazine and processed all of them individually. Did you find any fingerprint evidence on those bullets? Uh, no, ma'am, I did not. And what did you do with these swabs that you collected? Once I collect the swabs, I allow them to air dry, and then I, once I secure them into envelopes, I seal them, put my date, uh, initials, and then I package them up accordingly, and they ultimately wind up with the uh, DNA department. Uh, I believe in this case, I, I took them down to our evidence control department and then DNA will pick them up from there. All right. One moment. <coughs> no further questions from the state at this time. Do you want to answer any questions from the state? Um, um, all these items were processed in the lab, is that correct? That's correct, yes, sir. And help me to understand this. Um, you processed um, three shotguns? I believe that was right, yes, sir. Um, you processed, were any of them loaded with, with shotgun shells? I don't recall them being loaded. So you did not process any of the... If they were loaded, you didn't process any of the shells in them. Um, I, I, normally, when a weapon comes into the laboratory, it's it's cleared and unloaded prior to it getting to our laboratory. So, um, had they been unloaded, I would have pro or had they been loaded, they would have been unloaded prior to me receiving them, and I would have processed 
what had been inside the weapon at that time. So the, the weapon we identified earlier as as um, Twenty-two. Item number twenty-two. The camo Benelli Super. I'm sorry. Yeah, Benelli Super Black Eagle. The two unfired shotgun shells. <coughs> you process that at the lab. Yes, sir. Was the gun loaded when it came to you? My notes do not indicate that it was loaded. Um, and as as I said, uh, normally when a when a weapon, a shotgun comes into the laboratory it's 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 unloaded prior to it coming to me uh, my notes indicate that it was not loaded and the other shotguns uh, as far, I mean I've looked at your analysis on them um, that, uh, that there were no fingerprints of evidentiary value on the three other shotguns right that's correct um, but there's no indication um, that you process the if they had been loaded and unloaded any of those shotgun shells correct that's correct. I, I only process what was what was given, uh, what was brought into the laboratory. And you process those on June 9th, is that correct? That sounds right, yes sir, June 9th. Okay. Now, um, the cartridges, the, the, uh, there's a bullet and then there's a casing on, on a typical semi-automatic weapon. Were you ever asked to you were asked to process the ejected cartridges that were involved in the uh, in the murder, correct? The 308s. I mean, the yep. 300 blackouts. Yes, sir. And those had been fired, and what you indicated that once a, a bullet or a shotgun shell had been fired, it heats up. Is that is that yep. why you can't get a fingerprint off of it? Well, that that would be one one uh, possible explanation: um, heat, friction. Um, they're on the ground. You know, weather can have an effect sometimes if it's raining or if it's hot or cold. There are lots of things that could have an effect on whether or not a print would be left. And I think your testimony is, that if not rarely, never found fingerprints on an expended casing. Is that correct? Well, I, I wouldn't say rarely never. Um, I, I, I know of cases in our laboratory that have been uh, where they have been uh, able to identify prints on cartridge cases. It just doesn't happen. Uh, very often, but it do, it does happen. Okay, but then you processed um, a number of there was a a, uh, a uh, magazine with a number of 308. I mean, 300 blackout shells that had never been fired. Correct? Yes, sir. Bullets. I'm sorry. That's correct. And that, that's that's a brass piece of brass, right? Yes, sir. I mean, is a piece of brass conducive to fingerprints? Uh, yes, sir. It can be. Yes, sir. Any evidence these? Bullets have been uh, the bullets have been wiped or something or just I mean it, give the please get, explain to the jury why you wouldn't normally get fingerprints off of a piece of brass a unspent bullet why is that well you got to keep in mind that a, that a latent print is, is nothing more than or mostly moisture uh, they're very fragile it doesn't take much to to wipe a print off of, of a surface. Uh, these the cartridges I think that you're speaking of were in a magazine, so they've been they've been shoved into a magazine, um, and then they then then you know then you got to get them out. So uh, so you got you got friction there going on, uh, but most any you know anything that, any surface that's smooth and, and fairly clean and not corrugated or textured can be conducive to prints. Uh, I have developed prints on cartridges before. Um, it just doesn't happen very often. Again, it's a brass surface, almost a polished brass surface. Did you say because it's mostly moisture, isn't there some oil involved in that from the, from the fingers? Or am I wrong about that? Well, you would have, as far as the coming from your fingerprints, from the fingers, or well, from I mean, the finger, that, uh, I mean, it's always just moisture? It, it's mostly 98 to 99 percent moisture. Uh, and then you might have some other substances mixed in there. Um, but it's mostly mostly just sweat is what's you, left behind. You do retrieve fingerprints occasionally, do you not? You find fingerprints on things? Oh yes, sir. I, I, I find I've I've uh, developed quite a few prints in my 30 years of doing okay. this. And once you develop a print, 
you can compare it based on how many points do you have to have a, to do a comparison to make well, a match? Well, there, there's no there's no set number uh, in this in this country uh, there, where you have to have a certain minimum number of points. Um, you just have to have a sufficient amount of clarity and 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 to be able to determine that an impression was made by a certain individual. Okay. Um, did you ever go to the scene of these murders? No, sir, I did not. You were not called out that night? No, sir. So the forensic folks that went out there, did, to your knowledge, did they throw any powder down? Did they do anything to find any fingerprints that night? I honestly don't know. Um, I, I did not look at their um, notes from their crime scene or, or what have you. I really had no uh, real reason to. Um, I was just asked to process the things that they brought. So let me ask you this. We've got a doorknob right here. Doorknob. I just grabbed it to open it. It's brass. Would that leave a fingerprint? It, it's possible. You you have again. You have to consider um, how how much someone perspires when they touch something. You have to consider how soon after the doorknob was touched did someone else grab the doorknob because the latent print is extremely fragile. It doesn't take much to obliterate a print. Um, but you would check if you were on the scene. You'd look. If 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 I was on the scene and I felt like that area was accessed by someone I, I probably would have checked yes sir. I mean if, you, if the if the it, it appeared that there had been uh, a, a shotgun blast to the victim inside uh, a a uh, room behind that door um, and you didn't know whether the door was open or closed um, before that person was um, shepherded in there or walked in there uh, you would want to at least look at the knob right yes sir I, I I probably would but uh, you know I was not on this scene so I don't I don't really know exactly what all they had going on so but uh, but if, if with your scenario that you're speaking of yes sir I, and, I, I probably would have checked and you would expect to see notes somewhere uh, from the crime scene folks that they uh, looked at the doorknob but you can't just eyeball it don't you have to put some powder on it or don't you have to put something on it to raise the, the visibility of the fingerprint well uh, yes sir in, in in some cases you can actually see a print if it if it's more of a what we call a patent print a patent print is a print that might be left behind with a you know in a in a residue it could be in grease could be in blood it could be in dirt uh, anything such as that so but ordinarily when you go to look for prints you've got to do some sort of processing to uh, a surface depending on the surface and depending on just what you're trying to what you're trying to do so if you had a relatively small room where uh, somebody's head had exploded and blood and all kinds of uh, bodily fluids were sprayed over the inside of that room you would want to take a meticulous examination of that room to see if there are any fingerprints in blood or or other bodily fluids would you not would you? I, I, I would, yes, sir. Okay. And you would expect to see something in some report by the crime scene folks where they actually did such an examination, would you not? Would you expect to see notes detailing that they at least looked at it? Y yes, sir. I mean, I, it, you know, again, this is, you know, I wasn't at the scene. I, I, I can, but if you're describing this type of a scene, if it was me, I, I, I would take notes, uh, you know, detailed notes. Uh, you know, because you know, photographs, notes, sketches, all that kind of goes hand in hand. But there should have been, well, strike that. You would also expect to see um, any 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 surface that could have come into contact with um, the perpetrator um, to have been processed, either photographed or processed in some way. You would expect to see that in the notes of the crime scene investigators correct I, I would think in the notes or or in or in their you know testimony or um, anything such as that um, you know there, there should be something to, to explain what was done yes sir okay um, do you know if there was a fingerprint person or somebody that <coughs> had those skills in the crime scene 
uh, team that came out that night? I don't know. I know that there was no one from the Lake Print Department where I were at the scene um, that day. Do you go out to crime scenes? Do you go to crime scenes? I've, I've done plenty in, the, in my earlier days. Um, but I have I have not been on crime scenes for quite some time. Do you have people in your Lake and Print unit that do go to crime scenes? Uh, not 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 really. Um, the, the Lake Print Department, the way it was set up, we, we pretty much are in, in the laboratory setting and we, we process evidence that comes in from crime scenes. Uh, we don't typically go uh, to the crime scene. And so I guess if I'm summarizing this, everything they had you look at you looked at in the lab. Yes, sir. And you found no, when I say identifiable prints, it sounds to me like you found no evidence of any prints. Well, I, I, I found any, any time I report something is no value for comparison, that means that I did find evidence of fingerprints. It just wasn't enough to compare it to anyone. When any time I say nothing was observed, that means there was nothing observed. So. Um, I mean, I looked at all these. Other than the um, no value for comparison on the cell phone, that would mean you saw something, but you didn't have enough to compare. Uh, yes, sir. And you know, the, no, it, was, it was no value. You know, keep in mind again, their latents are fragile. Um, you've got weather involved. Um, you know, water, rain, that sort of thing uh, certainly uh, is is detrimental to. Uh, fingerprint evidence being left behind. So other than the cell phone, everyone else says no fingerprint evidence was observed. That would mean there was nothing, not even a partial, right? Yes, sir. Any time that result is in the report, that's what that means. So yes. Other than the cell phone, you didn't even find a, any, any evidence of fingerprints, not a partial, not a smudge, not anything. Well, I, I believe there were some additional uh, long guns that came in to me uh, where I did get no value for comparison, uh, but the initial shotgun that came into me was nothing was observed. Yes, sir. And the initial shotgun would have been number 22. Uh, yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Um, and would it surprise you to know that uh, Mr. Murdoch was seen holding that shotgun, um, had actually uh, retrieved it? From his house, Objection, brought it down to the Honor, murder scene. Counsel's testifying. Response. I'm just citing evidence that the state's already put into evidence. I'm not testifying to it. It's these are facts that have been already established by the state. He's an expert. He can opine. Pardon? He's an expert, therefore he can give an opinion. Uh, the objections overruled. Would it surprise you to know that Mr. Murdaugh was seen that evening when the first responders came holding that shotgun um, and, and, uh, his, and the state has indicated, um, I mean, that's not in conflict. I mean, no one's challenging that. And yet there were no, I mean, you found no evidence of fingerprints. Is that correct? Right. Yes, sir. And, you know, that that's, you know, Prints aren't always left on surfaces when you touch them. Um, you know, just because you touch something does not mean you're going to leave a print. Um, and there are all kind of variables as to why. Would you agree with me you found no prints on any of the items you, you were asked to examine? Cartridge cases, fired, unfired, shotguns, the shells in the shotguns. Uh, you just found no prints whatsoever. I, I found none of value for comparison, um, which tells me that there there was something there, but it just wasn't of value for, to compare. And it's only yes. on the uh, cell phone. The cell phone and then the additional long guns that came into me uh, later. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, Court's indulgence. Done right. Thank you, um, Agent Darnell, um, you were previously um, lieutenant of crime scene. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. I was actually promoted to lieutenant over the Lake Print Crime Scene Department in 1998, uh, where I was in that role for about six years. And um, in your experience in that position, are um, crime scene personnel trained to look for fingerprints at a crime scene? Yes, ma'am. Uh, back when I was a lieutenant over the crime scene department, we used to do the crime scene, we did the printing, we did we did everything. Now it's 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 two separate departments. We have a late print department and we have a crime scene department. The crime scene department, as I understand it, they are trained in how to process crime scenes, which would include how to uh, process certain things on its own scene for fingerprints. For in other words, if it was something that was large and not not uh, not able to transport back to the laboratory. They are. They do. Ha they do get some training in how to process for prints. And with such a bloody scene, did you get any bloody prints in this case? I, I was not uh, submitted any uh, bloody prints uh, in this case. Thank you. Nothing further. Please step down. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Thanks, sir. Call your next witness. Swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give to this court to be the whole truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Have a seat on the witness stand. Repeat your name and spell your last name for the record. Blake Johnson, last name. J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Hi, Agent Johnson. Hello. Um, could you tell the jury where you work? I work for the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. And how long have you been with SLED? Been with SLED a little over five years. And um, what are some of um, the duties of your position? At SLED, I work for the investigative services in the Low Country region, and as part of that, I investigate crimes within the lower 12 counties to include homicides, officer involved shootings, cases such as that. And um, with your involvement in the investigation of um, Paul and Maggie Murdahl's murders, um, did you have a chance to um, collect some bubble swaps in that case? I did. I'm going to show you what's been marked as tapes exhibit 338 and tapes exhibit 339. <coughs> this one is a buckle swab that I took from Claude Rowe, C.B. Rowe. And that takes exhibit 338. And this is a buckle swab that I took from Connor Cook. Okay. And how do you know you took these two buckle swabs? Because of the writing on the outside. Um, this is the exterior envelope. If I open them, the one that I have side would be inside. All right. And how did you collect these buckle swabs? I was provided uh, buckle swabs. They come two to a pack in a sterile pack. Um, they're opened, and the inside of, between the cheek and gum of both subjects are swabbed, and they're put back in the envelope and sealed. And sealed? Yep. Okay. Um, they're sealed so nobody um, can tamper or alter those buckle swabs? Yep. Evidence tape is placed on the seal, um, and it's signed and initialed, or initialed and dated. Your Honor, at this time, the state removes states exhibit 338 and 339 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. We're admitted. And Your Honor, we have no further questions for this witness. No questions. Thank you. May Thank step you, down. Judge. Your next witness. Thank you. 
stand on the Bible and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this court to be the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you. You have a seat on the witness stand. Repeat your name and spell your last name for the record. Lawrence Wiggins, W-I-G-G-I-N-S. I believe it's um, Chief Wiggins now, is that correct? That is correct. Um, are you the Chief of, is, of Allendale? Is it Sheriff's Office, Police Department? Yes, so I'm currently employed as the Chief of Police for the Town of Allendale. And but back in um, 2021, where were you employed? I was employed with the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. I was assigned to the investigative services and I worked out of the regional office in Walterboro. And um, at that time, were you involved in the investigation of the deaths of um, Maggie and Paul Murdoch? I was uh, preliminarily. Okay. And did you have an occasion to collect some buckle swaps? I did. I'm going to hand you State's Exhibit 30, 336 and 337. You could take a look at those and tell us what we have there. We have buckle swabs taken from uh, Mr. Roger Davis and Anthony Cook. And you collected those swabs? I did. And how do you know you collected it? My initials and... I'll consent to the admission, the admission of these rather than going through the process of how he, how he identified them and collected them. Now she's welcome to do that, but I'm just trying to save a little time here. All right. Tate's Exhibit 336 and 337. Well, Your Honor, we would have no further questions for this witness then. No questions, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. The state would next call Chandler Horney. Swear from the testimony you're about to give this court to be the truth, so help you God. Okay, I have a seat on the witness stand. Please repeat your name and spell your last name for the record. Hi, um, my name is Chandler Horney, H O R N E Y. And um, Agent Horney, can you tell the jury who you work for? I work for the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Okay, and what is your position there? I'm a special agent with the Vice Services Unit. Okay. And were you involved in the murder investigation of Paul and Maggie Murdoch? I was. And did you collect some buckle swabs or in this case? I did. Okay. I'm going to hand you State's Exhibit 340. You will tell us what those are. 
Um, these are the collected buckle swabs from Morgan Dowdy and Miley Altman. And how were those collected? Um, they were actually collected by a coworker, Special Agent Anthony Sampson. Um, in my presence, he took the swabs of the inside um, of both of these individuals' cheeks. And then um, when he took the swabs, he placed them in this envelope. Okay. And they were placed in um, bags that were sealed not to be tampered with? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time, the State Removes takes Exhibit 340 into evidence. No objection. Submitted. Um, we have no further questions for the State. Sorry, Your Honor. Any questions? No, sir. Thank you. Step down. Thank you. Calls Joe Moore Abialde. Do you swear from the testimony you're about to give this court to be the truth? So help you God. Okay, have a seat on the witness stand. Please repeat your name and spell your last name for the record. Joe Mar, Albi all day. Spelling my last name is A L B as in Bravo, A Y A L D E. Albi all day. If it makes any easier, my peers call me Joe. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. And um, you did tell me a little trick to pronouncing that last name there. Yes, ma'am. Okay. What was that? If you uh, remember the phrase, I'll be here all day and drop it here, I'll be all day, you got it. <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing that with me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, and you work for SLED, is that right? I do. Okay, and um, did you have the chance to collect some buckle swabs um, in the investigation of the murders of Paul and Maggie Murdoch? I did. I'm going to hand you State's Exhibit 342, 343, and 344. We'll take a look, please. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and State's Exhibit 342 is a buckle swab you collected from who? All right, this uh, Exhibit 342 is from Mr. Randy Murdoch. Okay, and then 343? 343 is a DNA uh, sample collected from a Hippolito Torres. This final uh, buckle sample was collected from his son, Alan Gonzalez. And how did you collect these buckle swabs? Yes, ma'am. Uh, th th these were collected via a DNA or buckle swab kit, uh, which is essentially is a swab is a special agent. Uh, John explained to you earlier. So it's simply a swab from each side of the inner cheek placed into a secured envelope and then uh, sealed in a evidence envelope such as this one. It would be sealed so it was not um, tampered with, is that right? That's correct, ma'am. Okay. At this time, this tape removes tapes 342, 343, and 344 into evidence. It says okay. offense. Any objections? No, sir. They're better than no objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, State has no further questions for Jeff. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you for the indulgence one moment. No questions, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Call your next. 
right. Next witness is going to be fairly uh, lengthy, and Mr. Fernandez is going to call him, and we'd ask for just a moment to get the exhibits out that he needs and get them in order so it moves uh, early before the, the jury, if we could. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a brief break.
Welcome back to Law and Crime. We are still live in South Carolina and uh, they're on a bit of a break. Uh, so uh, to bring you up to speed on what you may have missed this morning, it was the trial within the trial earlier, that whole financial uh, situation, uh, whether that cr created the motive the prosecution says was necessary for Alec Murdoch to kill his wife and son. That's still undecided. How much of that, if any of that, is going to get before this jury? So that's going to play out as this day unfolds. Hopefully that'll be resolved soon. It, it will expand the breadth of this trial in so many ways if it does come in. So in the meantime, while we're on this bit of a break, gives us a chance to look around the country. There is other stuff happening. We may be obsessed with this case, but there is uh, other stuff going on in Florida. An alleged sex predator has been arrested in a sting operation. And here with those details, Long Crimes, Sierra Gillespie. This case shows that even the guy next door could potentially be a predator targeting your child. When Reagan Beresford thought he was meeting up with an underage kid for sex, he was instead greeted by Cape Coral police. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. Put your hands behind you. Get out of the car. Put your sunglasses down. Put your hands behind you. Body camera video shows the Florida sting operation in action on September 1st, 2022, when the 52 year old is handcuffed and detained. But the story doesn't start there. Two months prior, Beresford's former neighbors called 911, saying he was sending inappropriate messages to their child. I'm pissed because I had a gut feeling and I didn't have enough. That's okay, you did it. And now it's in front of me yeah. and I'm mad. I'm running He's loose. meticulous. This is not, I have a feeling this is not his first mm. rodeo. Legendary investigative reporter Chris Hansen has spent years tracking down predators. He co-founded the True Blue streaming network for even more true crime coverage. Hansen tells Law and Crime Network this case is rare because the suspect knew the victim personally. We typically see strangers approaching children online in these various social media platforms. What's unique about this, the guy was a former neighbor. He knew the family. He knew this girl. And yet, in some ways, it's very similar to the other predator cases because the grooming, he found his target. And he kept chipping away and trying to tear down the barriers we have in society between adults and children to, you know, fulfill his sexual fantasy of being with this child. It's frightening. Law and Crime Network received hours of body camera footage from the Cape Coral Police Department as part of the investigation into Bearsford's arrest. Much of the video is redacted, meaning it's been blurred or blackened out. When police interviewed the victim's parents in July 2022, only portions of their audio were released. This is not a threat. This is not a promise. This is an instinct. Mm. We're, there's no more contact. That's death. Yeah, of course. If this man shows up on this door, I am taking that as a threat to my children. The victim's parents tell officers Beresford may have been grooming their child, enticing them with money. He was giving obscene gifts and... And he's alluring them with money because they're young adults yeah. wanting to like be... Candy, you know? But instead of taking the bait, the child reported Beresford to their parents. This is a case where the child, it appears, did the right thing because the child reported this inappropriate sexual contact to the parents and the parents reached out to the police who then conducted their own investigation and as we see in this very alarming body cam video uh, went out and, and put together a sting operation and captured this guy before he could try to sexually assault this child get out of the car get out of the car get out of the car put your hands behind you get out of the car put your sunglasses down put your hands behind you In the months leading up to Beresford's arrest, the would-be victim's parents agreed to assist in the investigation. I'm going to put in my report that they're interested in working with detectives. Um, I'm talking to this guy because, like, it's gotten to that point where, like, if the child was naive enough to go alone with him somewhere, like, probably something would happen. The Cape Coral PD put some time and thought into this and, uh, you know, created a scenario where an arrest could be made in a safe environment without harming anybody, including the child who is targeted in this case. So it all went to, to plan. And now this guy is going to face justice. Before his arrest, officers messaged Beresford posing as the child. Court documents show Beresford sent messages reading, quote, 
I know you are extremely hot and sexy. Just thinking of you turns me on. Another text read, quote, I would love to bring you to my home and into my bed. I don't want you to ever get in trouble, but I'm so excited and looking forward to seeing and spending time with you. He had a very sexually explicit conversation, was clearly trying to groom this child, and then showed up with condoms at a, a pre-scheduled you know, scheduled location to, to try to consummate this fantasy. And the police from that jurisdiction down in Florida were there to, to arrest him, all captured on body cam. Body camera footage from the day of Bearsford's arrest shows officers finding something of interest inside his vehicle. There's a bag. Let me bring the jury. Thank you, and may I call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. May I please support? Yes, sir. State calls Paul Greer. My name is Paul Greer, G-R-E-E-R. -E -E Paul, how are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. Take a moment to unpack yourself if you need to. Paul, if you would, uh, please introduce yourself to the jury and tell us a little bit when you graduated high school and where you went for education. Sure. Um, my name is Paul Greer. I am originally from the upstate of South Carolina, went to school um, and graduated high school in 2009. Um, upon graduating high school, I attended the University of South Carolina and uh, received a Bachelor's of Science in Biological Sciences from the University of South Carolina. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to pull that microphone a little closer so we can all hear you. Yes, sir. No, thank you. All right, Paul, walk us through a little bit about your career. With whom are you currently employed? I'm employed at the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, which is commonly known as SLED. All right, and tell us a little bit about your professional career. How did you get started at SLED and uh, what it is that you do there? Yes, sir. Um, after uh, completing my Bachelor of Science at USC, I uh, began an internship at SLED in the Forensic Services Laboratory. I specifically did that internship with our Fire and Tool Mark Department. Um, I interned there for several months and ultimately um, achieved a position there in that unit. Um, I began my employment officially at SLED in March of 2014 in the Firearms Department, um, where I began uh, training to become a Firearms Examiner. All right, and are you currently employed as a firearms examiner uh, with SLED? Yes, sir. All right, uh, Paul, and Mr. Greer, if you would, walk us through what that required in order to become a firearms examiner. Sure. In order to become a firearms examiner, there's a lot of extensive training on the job that must be conducted. Um, at SLED, I began an in-house training program that we refer to as the Fireman Toolmark Course of Instruction. 
Um, during this time, again, it was extensive, approximately three years or so, um, I assisted other examiners who were qualified on the job, um, prepped their cases, I learned how to work those cases. I looked at thousands of um, fired ammunition components on the microscope and did many comparisons of those. Um, during that time, I also completed multiple written and practical examinations. Um, at the conclusion of that uh, training program, I was given a comprehensive final exam. That included some mock casework within our laboratory. Um, I successfully completed all of that training in that mock casework and was able to begin working cases on my own. Our forensic, our, in addition to the comprehensive uh, qualifications and testing required to become a forensic examiner, are forensic examiners and SLED also subject to yearly uh, testing as well? Yes, sir. Um, we do the competency um, at the conclusion of our training program, um, but we also participate in proficiency testing each year um, within uh, an area in our discipline. Um, so that is completed. I complete a proficiency test each year, and that just uh, assures that we're maintaining our competency. Thank you. Paul, are you a member of any um, professional organizations? Yes, sir, I am. And which, ones would that, which one would that be? I'm a member of the Association of Firemen Tool Mark Examiners, um, which is also known as AFTI. Have you had any opportunity to attend additional trainings or conferences uh, under the umbrella of firearms and tool mark uh, examinations? Yes, sir, I have. Could you please explain a couple of those or a few of those, uh, if you would? Yes, sir. AFTI um, hosts an annual conference each year. And AFTI, uh, I might add, is an international organization. Uh, it's a group of firearms and tool mark examiners around the world, as well as other scientists and members from um, the academic, academic world. Um, we get together each year, and I attend that when I'm able, in order to share information and, and see what's happening within the field of firearm and tool mark examination. I've attended several of those conferences, and I've also attended some regional conferences that have been hosted um, by the FBI laboratory in Quantico. And uh, speaking of laboratory, is your laboratory um, accredited? Yes, sir, it is. And what is the accreditation it, it operates under? Um, the SLED laboratory is accredited under ANAB. Um, that is a, a, a national organization that follows um, ISO 17025 standards, and those are international standards. So our laboratory is um, operating at this, within the same set of standards as other labs in the United States that are accredited with ANAB and also those who follow the ISO 17025. And in order to maintain accreditation, are there, is there an inspection process that ANAB requires? Yes, sir. All right, and explain if you would the, the kind of the couple of inspections that, that are typically required. In order to maintain our accreditation, um, we have a visit approximately every four years. Auditors come in to the laboratory to um, check our casework, review our files, make sure that we're operating within those standards, and they, uh, they watch us perform casework. That's a big, huge component, and they do this for all the disciplines within the laboratory. And, and that audit every four years within that cycle helps to ensure that we are, we're meeting those standards. Um, internally at SLED, we also have internal audits each year. So even though um, the ANAB inspectors that come every four years, um, we may not see them at, every year. There is some type of audit being performed within our departments and in our casework each year. Thank you. Does the SLED laboratory operate under a uh, policies and procedures guideline for the overall agency? Yes, sir, we do. All right, and explain a little bit about how that involves the lab. Correct. Um, SLED in general has a, a large set of policies that we must adhere to. Within the laboratory, um, each department has a manual that they must follow that gives them information on how to conduct their everyday um, work and how to perform casework. Um, additionally, and following the um, ANAB accreditation, um, we have a SLED quality manual that is uh, specifically for the laboratory. Um, we must follow that as well. And those are all guidelines to help us um, within to conduct casework. And in addition to the SLED quality assurance manual, there's, there's, would there additionally be a SLED firearms department manual that you have to comply with? Yes, sir. There is a, a, firearms, uh, excuse me, a firearms manual that we must uh, follow. Okay. Just very briefly, please explain what that involves. Yes, sir. Um, that, that, again, is just a, a document that gives us information on how to conduct 
our day-to-day uh, -day casework, um, what to do um, with evidence, how we should examine that. Um, it also gives us information into our training program, um, any type of uh, calibration or measurement um, references that we need to consult for our equipment that we use. All of that information is contained within that manual that we um, have to follow and can reference. All right, and if you would, please explain uh, to the jury what firearms identification, generally the subject matter, what that is. Sure. Um, firearms identification is a discipline in forensic science um, where our main objective each day is to examine those fired ammunition components. So imagine a fired cartridge case or a fired bullet, and we're looking at those in order to determine if they were fired by a specific firearm. Thank you. Um, how long, and how long again had you, have you been working in SLED, in the SLED laboratory? I've been employed in the firearms department at SLED for almost nine years. And have you had an opportunity to testify in, in court such as this? I have. Would that be uh, both state and federal courts? I have testified in state and federal courts, yes sir. Okay. Approximately how many times, or do you know how many times? Um, approximately 27 times, yes sir. Your Honor, at this point, state moves to admit uh, Mr. Greer as a firearms and toolmark examination expert. Your Honor, no objections to his qualification. He's so qualified. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Greer, I'd, I'd like to take the moment to kind of uh, educate the jury a little bit on firearms. Yes, sir. And if you would, please please tell us a little bit about the, uh, well, first of all, are you familiar with the two kind of cartridge rounds we're, we're going to primarily be talking about today? Yes, sir. And are you familiar with the two kind of uh, firearms we're going to generally be talking about today? Yes, sir. All right. If you would, please give us a little, uh, an intro to firearms, uh, beginning with perhaps a shotgun. Tell us what makes that unique type of firearm and how it generally operates. Yes, sir. Um, in general, a firearm is a mechanism that uh, propels a projectile through the combustion of gunpowder. Um, as as uh, he was stating, there are several different types of firearms, and one of them um, is a shotgun. Um, a shotgun, if you, if you imagine, is a long gun, um, typically that is designed to be fired from the shoulder, um, and that has a smooth bore. And what the bore is, it's just the inside of that barrel, so there's no rifling inside that barrel typically. Um, a shotgun is also uh, different than um, maybe a handgun that you may be familiar with, and it fires shot shells. And, and a shot shell is a, a cartridge, if you will, that could be plastic or metal that can contain multiple projectiles or a single projectile. And when you said uh, barrel, smooth bore, and rifling, would, would rifling mean sort of the interior of the, the barrel where the bullet exits is spiraled inside? Correct. That rifling um, is in barrels in order to give a bullet that's traveling down that barrel its rotary twist and, and spin so that way it can um, travel to a target or its destination. And does that rifling assist in the bullet traveling in a straight line consistently? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? The rifling, spinning the bullet, making it go out, does that allow it to travel in a straight line? Uh, yes, that rifling that's inserted into that barrel, um, if you'll think of kind of like a quarterback throwing a football, it helps it give it that nice spiral so that it, it can fall, travel um, more efficiently. And, and kind of the uh, opposite of that would be the smooth bore of a shotgun. How does that affect the uh, pellets or the BBs inside of the shotgun? Um, so in the sh a typical shotgun, you don't have that rifling that gives it that spin or twist, but that's not the design of the shotgun. Um, so when those pellets or, or a slug or whatever is traveling down the bore of that shotgun, um, it is just traveling out the barrel um, based on uh, the combustion from it firing. Okay. And if you would please describe to us what type of ammunition a shotgun will shoot. Um, typically, um, you, you use a shot shell. Um, that can be uh, made of some type of plastic, typically we see that, with some type of metal head on it. Inside that uh, shot shell, um, there can be multiple projectiles. Um, you hear of pellets, um, we, we think of birdshot, buckshot, that's what would be inside of a shot shell. Also in there, there may be other components um, that could be plastic or um, some type of paper material, and that would be a wad. And those have different uh, jobs within a shot shell. Those can be to protect the pellets, um, to keep them together as they travel, to provide some type of cushioning between those pellets and um, the powder. Um, so they all have different various purposes within inside that shot shell. And, uh, Mr. Greer, did you bring with you some demonstrative items to kind of just demonstrate generically what you're talking about in a shot shell? 
Yes, sir. All right, can I can I say that real quick? Yes, sir. Yes. <coughs> Career, if you would uh, begin with the shot shells that uh, you brought some demonstrative exhibits is that correct that's correct if you would just please hold them up show them to the jury and explain what it is we see when we're what we're looking at and what what the components are in there sure <clears throat> um, again these are just two examples of a shot shell um, here you have a plastic uh, body there of the shell with a metal head on this end of it that is uh, the end that's going to be up against the breech face of the fireman in this middle you'll see um, a small circle that's the primer area, and that's what's going to be struck by a firing pin in a firearm so that um, it will fire. That's what's going to detonate inside the shot shell to cause it to, to be fired. Um, out this end, you see it's crimped on, on this end. This is the end that the uh, projectiles or the pellets that are inside of the shot shell will exit and travel uh, down the barrel of that shotgun. Thank you. All right, Mr. Greer, the second firearm uh, would be, if you would, talk about a little bit about what the AR platform is. Sure. An AR platform is something that um, is commonly seen uh, throughout America. Um, originally, it was designed by Armalite, and it's just a modular uh, platform, and it's a rifle, a semi-automatic rifle in its, in its normal state, and that's what we have here today. And what would be the more common caliber that you might find on the air, our platform? Yes, sir. Um, typically, uh, what is very common um, that we see in the laboratory and that you may be more familiar with um, is it's uh, chambered in 223 Remington caliber 5.56 NATO. Um, that is a very common caliber for an AR-15 uh, type firearm. Okay. And um, what were some of the items that you examined in the case as far as rifle calibers? In this case, I received uh, one rifle, and it was um, chambered in 300 blackout caliber. All right, explain to us what the 300 blackout round is, and maybe how it's it's similar and uh, different from a 5.56 round NATO. Sure. Um, again, you may be familiar with the 223 Remington 5.56 NATO caliber. Um, the 300 blackout uh, cartridge is is sort of similar to that. Um, when that was designed, it, it was designed so that it could be used with a lot of the original um, features of an AR-15. Um, so the overall dimensions of those cartridges are, are very similar, with the exception of a shorter case length and a much um, heavier or larger bullet. And uh, 300 Blackout being a, a, re a relatively, at least compared to 5.56 NATO round, um, were some of the components interchangeable on the AR platform? Um, it's my understanding that when that 300 blackout caliber was developed, um, it was designed so that some of the components from the original um, AR-15 type that were chambered in the 5.56 NATO or the 223 Remington could be used with a 300 blackout. And it is possible, maybe not ideal, but possible to use a um, magazine that would be formatted for the 223 5.56 round in a 300 blackout rifle. Yes, sir, I would say it's possible. And did you bring um, any 223 and 556 and 300 blackout rounds with you today for demonstrative purposes? Yes, sir, I have two. All right, would you please uh, identify the two and uh, tell us uh, what we're looking at and what, what the similarities and differences would be? Sure. Um, to start off, this is an example of a 223 Remington. Um, this is the one that you may be more familiar with. Um, I will show you now, um, side by side, this is the 300 blackout. Um, and I'm trying to do this so you can see. Um, you can see that their overall dimensions there are a little larger. I mean, excuse me, are about the same, except some, with the exception of the larger bullet. Um, 
and I'll give you a little bit of anatomy here of, of the cartridge. Um, what we would refer to as um, this item right here is an unfired cartridge. Um, terminology in our firearms department is, is very uh, key to us in being accurate in what we do. Um, so we would refer to this as an unfired cartridge. Um, that contains a bullet, which is this portion right here, this copper colored um, projectile, and that's what's going to travel down the barrel of the firearm towards the target. Um, again, on this end, just like the shot shell, there's a primer there in the middle. Um, you see the circle object there. Um, and that's what the firing pin is going to strike so that way the, it can detonate and uh, cause the cartridge to be fired. Um, when it's fired, um, we will have a cartridge case, which is just the brass colored um, portion here. And that is the cylindrical component there that holds it all together. It holds the primer, the bullet, and the gunpowder inside of it. Thank you, Mr. Greer. Permission to approach, just yes, for sir. demonstrative purposes, I'm going to put it on the uh, helmet. Mr. Greer, if you would just pay attention, you have a little video screen there. Let's see if this will work. All right, Mr. Greer, can you see these two bullets on the screen? Yes, sir, I can see the eye. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to work. <laughs> All right, can you see them clearly? Uh, yes, sir, I can. All right. <laughs> What's the big black thing on the screen? Um, <laughs> appears to be a phone. <laughs> <laughs> In your expertise, that's a phone. Um, the two rounds we see there, uh, the top round, can you identify which one that is? Um, the one that is uh, up against the foam there would be the 300 blackout caliber uh, cartridge. And then, uh, as you said before, the below, the round below that would be the uh, 223 slash 556 round? Yes, sir. And uh, seeing the actual projectile, meaning the item that exits the barrel of the rifle, would that be that tip, uh, the cylindrical tip on the top? Uh, yes, sir. And I believe, if I remember correctly, both of those projectiles were uh, copper and colored, if you can distinguish that on the, the screen. Okay. And uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but I'll ask, did the, uh, as compared to each other, does the, five, the 300 blackout have a higher grain, typically, than the 5.56? It's possible. Um, the bullets come in different grain weights, so that is a much larger bullet, so um, I would expect it to be heavier. And when we're, we're all going to hear about grain weights. Could you explain what that means also? Sure. Uh, grain is a, a term that we use in firearms, and it's just a, a unit of measurement. Um, so when we measure our projectiles, we are going to measure those in grains. And just as a common um, way to relate to that, um, if you imagine 7,000 grains, uh, that's equivalent to approximately a pound. Thank you. So measurements and bullets are done in grains, basically. Yes, sir. That's what we refer to them. Going back to shotgun shells very briefly, are there various types of shotgun shells and gauges or calibers? Yes, sir, there are. Could you explain a couple of the types that you might commonly find and then uh, just some of the calibers so we know what we're talking about? Um, sure. Some of the more common gauges in shot shell, and gauge is just uh, referring to the size and how we um, are able to determine what that firearm is chambered in. So um, a 12 gauge is something that's very common. Um, that's a very common shotgun that I would expect to encounter. Um, you may also have heard of or be familiar with a 20 gauge. Um, that's another one that may be common. Or, or 410 bore, which is, is a type of shot shell as well. Um, those are some of the more common ones that we uh, would see in our laboratory setting and that you may be familiar with. Um, again, throughout those, um, there are all different kinds of shot shells loaded with different projectiles, um, loaded with birdshot, loaded with buckshot, and they all um, s will serve a purpose within, um, within their own respect. Um, but those can have multiple projectiles, hundreds of projectiles. It could have just one large projectile, which we refer to as a slug. Um, so there's lots of uh, options, if you will, uh, within a shot shell. And all those of this may be obvious. A buckshot is typically used to hunt what type of game? Um, I'm not hunting often, <laughs> um, but I would expect a buckshot could be used for something, um, you know, as it suggests, a, a buck. Um, you would expect maybe a larger animal. Um, again, I'm, I'm not a hunter, but that's where I could imagine that. 
Thank you, Mr. Greer. Before we move on, um, and, and, and speaking about the uh, <clears throat> area of forensic science of firearm examinations, is that an area that is uh, subject to peer review? Yes, sir. And uh, could you explain to us what that means? What's the peer review process and, and why that's important in forensic science? Sure. Um, within a firearms and toolmark um, examination, this is something that's been around for years. Um, firearms examiners have been uh, learning about uh, the firearms identification process, building uh, studies and designs and experiments throughout um, many years. And it's part of that process in, in designing those studies and doing this research um, within firearm and toolmark, they're going to uh, draft an experiment, conduct an experiment, um, publish an article on their findings, and, and during that process, um, there can be review, um, and there will be review of, of the article of the experiment, where other scientists um, within our field or other scientists or, or researchers can examine that and see what was going on during that process and say whether they agree with it um, and share their comments, and that's part of that peer review process. Um, we, as an AFTI member, I have access to our AFTI journal where a lot of those peer review articles um, are published and they're able uh, for other examiners to, to look at, for other scientists and researchers to look at and, and, and help uh, b bolster or their opinions and thoughts on, on firearms identification. And personally, do you know how many exams you've done, you've conducted? I do not have a number of examinations that I've conducted while at SLED. Um, however, at this point, I would say it's somewhere in the thousands. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to uh, ask you, did you um, receive uh, a, a, a volume of items uh, concerning this case for review? Yes, sir. I did receive um, several items to examine um, in this case. And generally, did you uh, have an opportunity, we're going to go through those items very shortly, but did you have an opportunity to, in general, review a significant amount of items for um, identification, possible identification? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you pre prepare a report in, after uh, conducting these examinations? Yes, sir, I did prepare a report. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to ask us if we would go through a number of items very shortly. Um, do you have a copy report and is it needed in order to uh, refresh your memory and be able to specifically recall each individual item? Uh, yes, sir, I do have a copy and um, I would appreciate being able to refer to it. Okay, very good. And prior to your testimony today, have you had an opportunity to, to uh, well, first of all, generally when items are submitted, do you know anything about the case? Um, generally when items are submitted to the SLED laboratory, um, I do not have information about the case. I do not. Prior to today's testimony, have you familiarized yourself at least very briefly with the layout of the scene of the crime? Yes, sir, I have. And what, specifically paying attention to what on that crime scene layout? Um, I reviewed um, a crime scene layout um, in relation to where some of the marker numbers were that are listed in my report. Um, those just reference numbers, and I reviewed where those were in relation to, to the crime scene that e the evening um, where the two bodies were. And is that just to assist us when we reference item number X, Y, or 1, 2, or 3? It, it allows us to then, you then, to testify as where that was located. Yes, sir, it can. All right, um, Agent Greer, I'm going to uh, go down the list of items, and I'd like you to identify the item that was received mm -hmm. for me, beginning with item... Item numbers two through five. The slide item two through five? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, your items two through five? Did you conduct a review of that item? Uh, yes, sir. I did look at uh, sled items two through five. And when, while I find those items, if you would, please explain how you receive items in general, how you receive items in the lab, um, what the condition is when before you review them, and then what you do ultimately with that item. Correct. Yes, sir. So as uh, items are submitted to the sled uh, laboratory, uh, those can come from agencies all over the state to include our own sled crime scene department. Um, those items are given assignments for, uh, for multiple departments depending on what the requesting agency um, is, is asking to have completed. Um, we are a full service laboratory, so sometimes the evidence has to travel through 
to other departments before it arrives to me in the firearms department. Um, typically, um, if you want something like latent prints or DNA to be processed on those items, it would go there first because when I get the item, I may decontaminate it or, or uh, touch it, and those uh, prints or DNA may uh, be, not be relevant anymore because you would find my, me on it. Um, evidence travels throughout the laboratory to those departments and through our evidence control department. I receive those items either from those analysts or from our evidence control technicians. And when I receive that item and before I begin my examination, I want to make sure that the item is uh, submitted to me in a manner that I can uh, tell that it's not been tampered with. Um, so we use a lot of heat sealed pouches. So I'll make sure those are sealed or our cardboard box that it's sealed up and I can tell that um, there's either evidence tape or initials of that sealing examiner uh, prior to me so that way the evidence has been um, preserved in a manner that I know uh, no one has altered with it. And just so we're clear, thank you, uh, Mr. Greer. Just so we're clear, when I refer to items, sometimes I'll say items too. Does that refer to the items that you received them as, as a SLED designation? Yes, sir. Um, one other thing about the SLED laboratory, when evidence is submitted to the lab, it receives its own unique lab number that's specific to our laboratory, and it also uh, receives new um, item numbers, and that's so we can track it throughout the laboratory, and um, our analysts throughout the lab can report and identify those uh, clearly. Thank you, Mr. Greer. I'm going to hand you what's been entered into evidence already as States Exhibit 63 through 68. And I believe they correlate to items two through seven on your report. Would you please take a, look, a moment to look at these items and let me know if you're familiar with them. When we receive these items, I do uh, mark the packaging, and I'm also looking for uh, my, my heat seal pouch, and this is how I package the evidence after I examined it. So I'm just confirming that I see some of the information on these items. Yes, sir, this appears to be um, what was submitted to the SLED laboratory as items two through seven in your state's exhibit 63 through 68. Thank you. And did you have an opportunity? I'll take those from you. Did you uh, have an opportunity to examine these items? Yes, sir, I did. And if you would, please tell us what your findings were for these items. Um, I determined that each of those items, um, they were all fired um, S and B heads. Excuse me, Your Honor. I, I'm renew my prior objection to the opinion testimony. Um, based upon the hearing we had, if it's for the record. Yes, sir. You may continue. I determined um, that each of those were um, one fired um, SMB head stamp 300 blackout caliber cartridge case, um, and that was items two through seven. Um, that's what each of those items were. Mr. Greer, an item on the uh, screen in front of you would be what's marked as States Exhibit 63. Is that representative of the collection of uh, items that you reviewed in that batch? Yes, sir. All right. There is a blackout round. Do you, do you, uh, were you able to see the head stamp on it? And I can give you back one of the items if you would. Were you able to identify the head stamp and who the manufacturer of that round was? Yes, sir, I was. All right. Who was that? Um, the, the manufacturer of item, uh, items two through seven was uh, Cellier and Bellow, and you may hear that um, referred to as, as SMB. 300? Yes, sir, and head stamp 300 blackout. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm handing you what's been marked. And then we're going to have it's already a state's exhibits 33 and 34. Jim, do you want to see those? 33 and 
33 and 34, which I believe correlate to 9 and 10 on your report. Would you please uh, take a look at these items and let me know if you recognize them. Yes, sir, I do. Okay, and please tell us what they are. Um, sled item nine, which is state's exhibit um, 34, um, is a fired federal premium double alt buck uh, three inch magnum shot shell. And sled item 10, um, which is stakes exhibit 33 is one fired Winchester dry lock number two um, 12 gauge shot shell. And uh, after your review of the scene, where were items, your items two through seven located? Um, after reviewing the, uh, the crime scene diagram, um, I was aware of the uh, marker numbers. Um, that those were recovered from and then reviewing that diagram is my understanding that those um, items two through seven the 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases and um, were located around or near um, the body of Margaret Murdoch. All right and I'm referring now to your items nine and ten states 33 and 34 where were those at your review of the crime scene um, photo, uh, diagram, where were those identified and retrieved from? Um, those appear to be um, in or around the storage room area um, near the, the kennels. Thank you. Putting these two up on the screen, Mr. Greer, are these the items you just testified to having examined? Yes, sir, they are. Okay, thank you. Now, after right now, we're identifying a number of items. Is it uh, would it would it be fair to say that we're going to go over your results then at the conclusion of the identification? Uh, yes, sir. All right, referring to item states. States exhibit number four, your item number 22, would you please direct your attention to that? Yes, sir. and entered into evidence of State's Exhibit 4. Please take a look at this firearm. Let me know if you're familiar with it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this firearm is unloaded. It's safe for me to handle. I will keep it pointed in a safe direction here. Um, I'm going to look for for some of those identifying marks that I placed on on this shotgun. <coughs> yes, sir, I do recognize this shotgun. All right, tell us what that gun is. Um, this shotgun was determined to be a uh, one Benelli model Super Black Eagle 3 semi-automatic shotgun in 12 gauge with a serial number of U573210E17. Thank you. <coughs> Was there anything that accompanied State's Exhibit Number uh, Four? Uh, yes, sir. Um, also submitted uh, with that firearm was an accessory, which was the sling, and um, one unfired Federal Premium Double Alt Box 
buck three inch uh, 12 gauge shot shell and one unfired Winchester Super X game load 16 gauge shot shell. Now I think you just testified that 12 gauge, this is a shotgun is what gauge? Um, that is 12 gauge uh, shotgun. And uh, I think you just mentioned that loaded in it was a 16 gauge. Could you explain what the process was ejecting? Is that the proper gauge for that shotgun? No, sir. That uh, this, The unfired ammunition as it was submitted to me um, was received in uh, another package. Um, I did not remove it from that firearm. However, a 16 gauge would not be uh, correct for use in, in that firearm. Did you have to manually uh, remove it from the, from the shotgun? It was already removed when I received it. Right. <clears throat> I'm handing you what's been marked as states and entered into evidence as states exhibit 250, uh, slot item 8. Slide item eight, but states item two fifty. Take a moment to review it. And let me know if you are aware of what it is. Uh, yes, sir. I recognize this as sled item eight. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to examine and review that item? I did. Uh, what did you determine it was or is? Um, slit item 8, uh, stakes exhibit number 250, uh, was determined to be uh, one fired bullet, and that was listed as a near tire impression at marker 8. Okay. And you were able to do further analysis, which will get you the results to determine its weight? Yes, sir. Very good. So as you testified before, this would be the bullet minus the casing that it originally came in. Is that correct? Uh, Yes, sir. That is uh, just one fired bullet. And that's what it looks like when it doesn't have the back part on it? Yes, sir. That's just a, a bullet without um, any cartridge case attached. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to direct your attention to States Exhibit Number 20, Sled Item 14. to you then ask if you conducted an exam of this item. Yes sir I did. All right, what are the results? Um, I, sled item 14 which is takes exhibit 20 uh, was determined to be 24 birdshot pellets listed as um, from dog food storage room. Can you repeat it for my purposes? These are pellets from what? Uh, yes, sir. 24 birdshot pellets um, listed as uh, from dog food storage room. When you testified before and you, you presented what a shotgun shell looks like. Would, would that be what's inside a shotgun shell ultimately? Uh, yes, sir. That would be an example of birdshot pellets that uh, would be loaded into a shotgun shell. Mr. Greer, I'm going to direct your attention to what's been entered into evidence as States Exhibit 76, sled item number 12. Did you have an opportunity to review this item after you take a look at it? Yes, sir. All right, tell us what it is, please. Um, 
Sled item 12 states Exhibit 76 uh, was determined to be one fired bullet listed as from bedding inside doghouse. I'm going to direct your attention to States Exhibit 102, slide item 11. Already entered in evidence. Please take a look at this item. Let me know if you're familiar with its contents. Yes, sir. This is sled item 11, States Exhibit 102, and that was determined to be one fired bullet jacket fragment, three bullet jacket fragments, and one piece of lead uh, listed as defect in ground gravel marker 13. Thank you. All right, I'm going to refer to what's been identified as States Exhibit 109. Sled item 137. Should please review this item and let me know if you recognize it and if you perform an examination of it. Uh, yes, sir. This is a uh, sled item 137, States Exhibit 109, and it was determined to be one piece of lead listed as from hair on the item 92 dress. At this point, State would move for 109 to be admitted into evidence. <laughs> Moving on to States Exhibit 110, which is sled items 67 and 68. I'll direct your attention to that. They've been marked as, uh, for identification purposes as, as States Item 110. No objection. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as evidence as 110. If you would, please take a look at it. Let me know if you've uh, recognized it and performed an examination on it. Uh, yes, sir. States Exhibit 110 um, represents two sled items. Sled item 67, which I examined, uh, determined to be 48 birdshot pellets listed as from left shoulder and head of Paul Murdoch at autopsy. And uh, sled item 68 um, was one piece of plastic listed as from left shoulder and head of Paul Murdoch at autopsy. When you say where it's from, that's because that's what was identified on the item when it was submitted to your to you for review. Yes, sir. That's um, solely based on how it was logged into our system by the submitting uh, personnel. Just to now. All right. I'm going to refer your attention now to three <coughs> items just to speed along the process a little bit. States 111, 112, and 113 marked as identification purposes. Sled items 69, 66, and 104. So if you please take a look at those in your items in your in your report. Your Sled item 15 minutes, 2.45.
Welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Anjanette Levy, and you are watching our lunch show Q&A. I am live at the Walterboro, in Walterboro, South Carolina, at the Colleton County Courthouse, where we are on a lunch break in the state of South Carolina versus Alec Murdoch. We've been hearing from a firearms examiner from SLED, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Uh, he was just kind of getting into the meat and potatoes of his testimony before we took that lunch break. Uh, but earlier in the day, much of what happened this morning had to do with Alec Murdoch's finances and whether or not the judge will allow the jury to hear some things about his financial state at the time of the homicides, about the financial crimes he's accused of in criminal court here in South Carolina. He's accused of embezzling, stealing more than $8 million. So it's a big deal, and it's a big decision for Judge Newman to make because he has to decide whether this is more probative than prejudicial. So he's been hearing testimony outside of the presence of the jury about these issues since yesterday. One of the witnesses that Judge Newman heard from was Chris Wilson. He is the former best friend of Alec Murdoch. So let's listen to a little bit of what Chris Wilson told the judge during testimony. And what did he say to you? I mean, the first thing I asked him is, you know, Alec, what the, what the F or what the H is going on here? You know, what is going on? And have you done something else to me or that involves me that I don't know about? Because I know about this and I've got to deal with this, but is there something else you've done that I don't know about that I need to, that I need to be concerned with? And what did he say? He broke down crying. Um, said I can't. I said I can't write this second. He went inside, came back out with some paper towels, and told me that he had had um, a drug problem, that he was addicted to opioids, and that he had been addicted for I don't remember if he said 20 or 20 plus years, but it, I mean, it, you know, for 20 years or so. Did he say anything about the money? He told me that he had that he had been stealing money. Did he have a particular phrase about what he had done to you? Me up. He said he you up. Me up or me up or me off or something like that. But was, I think it was he me up. And he said that he, he admitted to you he had been stealing client money. Yes, sir. Said he. So he confessed that to you, is that correct? He said you, he a lot of people up. Did you hear anything else about Elf? I did. About how long after you left Alec did you hear something? I had stopped at my office in Bamberg or at the post office to pick something up. And um, I was somewhere between Bamberg and Columbia when I got a call. Uh, it was either from Randy or Lee Cope, but I believe it was Lee Cope. And what were you informed? That Alec had been shot in the head and that he was on a helicopter going to the hospital in Savannah. And I think it was Savannah Hospital, but they said the hospital, but I believe they said Savannah Hospital. What did you do in response to that information? What the devil's going on? I thought he tried to kill himself. I didn't think he was suicidal when I left, but when I heard that, I thought he tried to kill himself. Did you uh, go to the scene or did you return back home? I went back home. Did you try to reach out to Alec after that? I did not. Um, I talked to his brother, Randy, I think some that same day and some on the next day. Um, but by that time, frankly, all this had, for lack of a better term, blown up um, to where I didn't think I'd be able to talk to Alec. And I don't know that I wanted to. Wow. Uh, Chris Wilson, uh, Alec Murdoch's former best friend, uh, testifying about Alec Murdoch admitting to stealing from not only clients but his law partners. A very powerful testimony. Jury not seeing that, just the judge to determine whether or not the jury should hear it. So he's got a big decision to make. Let's bring in Michael Bryant. Uh, Michael, a wonderful host here on the Law and Crime Network, letting me kind of crash his show here, his party here on a Friday. Uh, Michael, what do you think of all of this? Because I, I keep going back and forth on this. I know the rule. He has to determine whether it's more probative than prejudicial and how much he will let the jury hear about this, if anything. 
What are your thoughts? Because I just think we are getting into this whole new realm. I know this has to do with the state's theory of the motive in this case, but we're getting into this whole other area. Um, do you, are you getting the feeling the judge is going to let this in? Do you think the judge should let it in? Boy, you know, uh, it is. If we were to just look at the financial evidence and those alleged crimes, that's interesting enough in itself. But to think that that's the motive for the two murders, it, it, it really is unbelievable. And, and I don't mean that in a legal sense. I just mean it's bizarre. Whether or not the judge lets any or all of this in, I still don't really know. My gut says it's going to be a, you know, Solomon-like split the baby. Something's coming in. All of this, I don't mm -hmm. know. And no matter what comes in, if there is a conviction, I guarantee it's going to be uh, the number one appellate issue. You know, too much was let in. Not enough was let in. Whatever the judge decides, and I do not want to be wearing the black robe uh, for this particular decision because I think it is so pivotal in how this case plays out and how mm -hmm. any appeal, if necessary, plays out. I, I think it's a huge decision. I wouldn't want to be in this judge's shoes either. It, it's, it's a big decision because it can create appellate issues. We've seen it happen in the past that convictions, uh, should this case result in a conviction, they've been overturned because of this type of thing. So there's a lot that's uh, happened this morning. And, you know, one thing I caught on to, and I don't know if you caught this, Michael, uh, they were talking about um, with the CEO of Palmetto State Bank, and the CEO was saying, well, the beach house was in uh, Maggie's name, and it sounded like there was some refinancing going on, and, you know, I, I and it was, it was up for collateral in some way for some other loans, so it's like, kind of gets you to thinking, is that relevant? Could it be relevant to the motive? Uh, we just don't know. We're going to have to wait and see what the judge lets in, and you know, what the jury thinks of it. It yeah, would be that, up to them to that decide stuff, whether that's enough of a motive. Yeah, that stuff might be a little far afield because that's, you know, the, the movement of assets, not unusual in any corporate structure, any partnership. If you're doing it to avoid liability, obviously it becomes an issue on that front. But I think that's really starting to get a little bit far out there in terms of is that part of the motive. That's more of the mechanics uh, and, and less motive, in my opinion. Well, Michael, let's get to a couple of quick questions before we take a break. Um, our first one comes from Leanne Smith from YouTube. Is his son still, son still there in the gallery? I'll answer that. Yes, Buster is still there. Uh, next one, Chelsea from YouTube asks, how many people with this mindset he couldn't have shot both of them with two different guns has actually ever shot one of those types of guns? I think that's a good question, Michael. What do you think of that? Because this is a family who was quite proficient with guns. They hunted, they had shotguns, they had these blackout rifles, they had all kinds of stuff going on with the guns on that property. So what do you think about that? I yeah. mean, how many people with this mindset of two people would have to have done this have actually shot these weapons? I think it's, it's made a bigger deal than it should have, and here's why I think that. Remember the AR assault type rifle, that's the Blackout 300. AR is Arma Light rifle, Arma Light. They are super light, it's like a military weapon. You could sling mm -hmm. that over your shoulder while using a shotgun, which is a much heavier uh, a gun and, and more unwieldy. We mm -hmm. know that the sequence of events was shotgun used on Paul and then the uh, Arma Light right. type item on Maggie. So you've got that slung over your back, the Arma Light, and you're holding the shotgun, you use it, you set it down, throw it down, you whip out the Armalite. We know that it was used first to debilitate Maggie, she was shot in the legs, and then more close range to effectively finish her off. I don't think this whole, oh my gosh, two guns, gotta be two people. I, I, don't, think that's, um, mm -hmm. I don't think that's an end all be all to, to uh, an, any defense, I really don't. And let me tell you, if you've ever shy, uh, fired a shotgun, if you haven't fired a shotgun, you really have to brace yourself. I mean, you, it will knock you backwards if you aren't set up right to do it. I mean, it's it's not easy. Uh, let's get to this question, Michael. One last one before we take our break. Nick Jacks, 222, one of our frequent Twitter people, one of our Twitter followers asks, do you think Alex would have been arrested for the murders without the financial crimes? I think that's a really interesting question because a lot of these financial crimes were indicted before the homicide uh, indictment. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great question. It always always makes me wonder why the, the financial crimes weren't resolved by jury. I know that the uh, right to speedy trial was effectively invoked by Murdoch, so they couldn't be. 
Uh, it might have helped clear up some of these issues. Um, but I don't know. You know, we don't know enough about all of the prosecution's case at this point to know how heavily they are relying on and did rely on the determination that these federal crimes uh, or these financial crimes were going to be attributed to Alec Murdoch. Uh, they may have total independent uh, um, evidence that they think seals the deal against him, and then the financial crime information or the allegations on the financial crimes was just kind of, you know, a cherry on top. Too early to tell, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely too early to tell. We still have a long way to go in this trial. We are going to take a quick break, but keep those questions coming to us both on Twitter and in our YouTube chat. And when we get back, we'll get to as many of them as possible. And when we get back, we will have a very special guest. The attorney for Gloria Satterfield's sons, Eric Bland, is going to be with me. So you will not want to miss what he has to say about Tony Satterfield testifying earlier today. I'm Ann Jeanette Levy, and you are watching Law & Crime, coming to you live from Walterboro, South Carolina. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Ann Jeanette Levy coming to you live from Walterboro, South Carolina. We're on a lunch break in the trial of Alec Murdoch, which is going on right behind me in the Colleton County Courthouse. And joining us is Eric Bland. Hey, the, hey good Eric. afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Good to see you in person again. Yes. We, we formally met in person, not virtually, earlier this week. We first met virtually. And, yeah. Uh, I was walking through my house and I heard you use my name when you were doing a drop and it was pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been talking about you all week. so. Uh, 
<laughs> quoting from our interview, which was I, I really enjoyed. And now, after hearing you last night make some comments, I've got a million more questions. But we'll get to that okay. and our viewer questions, sure. uh, which we'll be taking here in, in just a moment. But uh, first of all, I just want to, um, you know, you for our viewers who don't know, which uh, you know, I mean, I think most of them do. Eric represents Gloria Satterfield's two sons, and Gloria Satterfield was the housekeeper and nanny for the Murdochs for like a little more. 20 years. Right. I, I mean, she was like a member of the family. That's what I'm saying. So tell us about that. Yeah, she she was definitely woven into the fabric of the Murdoch family, not just with Alex, Maggie, and the two boys. She prim she primarily spent a lot of time raising Paul, believe it or not. Oh. Um, but she worked for all the family, uh, John Marvin, for Randolph, for oh. their children, babysitting, uh, very close with the mother. I think her name was Miss Libby. So even went away on vacations. Um, so she considered herself, and I believe they considered herself, to be part of the family. And the boys, in a way, um, were considered uh, a family as well. They definitely revered Alex. I know the two sons revered Alex Murdoch. So Gloria Satterfield slips and falls. We've heard the 911 call on the front steps. Uh, something about the dogs, possibly. That's not mentioned. The dogs aren't in the 911 call. Alex mentions that later on in an interview he did with the insurance company. She uh, slips and falls. She's bleeding out of her ear, according to what Paul said on the uh, 911 call. And sadly, she never wakes up. She does. Right? Uh, a little bit. She's in and out in the hospital for three weeks. She developed some other complications because she had uh, 12 broken ribs and she had a fracture on her head so there was some things going on internally that compromised her health um, but she, she couldn't say what happened she Is never that right? said what happened she would uh, whisper I love you or love or she would say you know she would be able to acknowledge ginger uh, her sister who was Tony and Brian's aunt but no uh, conversations took place when we talked a couple of weeks ago and we know her body has been exhumed uh, not yet I thought it was going to be. It was going to be. Going to be exhumed. Pardon me. Uh, Sled is looking into this. But that was the last thing I heard was in June of last year. And obviously since June they've been very busy because that's when the criminal charges came against Alex for the murder. So it's probably on their radar somewhere down the line or maybe not. Don't know. But you had told me when I asked you a couple of weeks ago that whether or not the boys, um, Tony and his brother, believed that there was foul play here and you you made it sound like no they did not no they 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 did they do not and uh, my partner Ronnie and Richter and I do not and, and I believe that simply because if they wanted to kill her they would have killed her you don't try to kill somebody and then let them get in an ambulance semi-conscious with the possibility that they will wake up in the hospital and say no, the dogs didn't push me down the stairs. You know, Paul, God forbid, push me or, or Maggie or somebody yeah. else. So if somebody's going to try to kill somebody, I think they're going to do it. They're not going to let him get in an ambulance. Well, Tony took the stand this morning. We will get to that in our next break. Uh, but right now, we're going to take questions sure. from the viewers. And let's bring in also Michael Bryant from Law and Crime and Gigi McKelvey, who's here in Walterboro with me. So uh, we're going to take these questions. The first question uh, comes from Jen Lynn C. Since Michael Tony Satterfield testified today, will any other victims' families testify? Hakeem Pinckney's mother would be extremely impactful. What do you think of that? Um, she would, but it obviously depends on Judge Newman's ruling. I don't think you're going to see, I don't think you're going to see any more testimony um, in connection with the 404B motion. If the judge lets in the 404B evidence and then it passes a 403, which is does the probative value outweigh the prejudicial effect, um, it depends on what are those charged but un con uh, not convicted crimes he lets in. I believe he's going to let in uh, a significant amount, and I'm sure we'll talk about that as the show goes on. Uh, let's uh, get a question here now to uh, Michael Bryant and Gigi. Um, did he inherit any more net from his father, Pam G5019 that, that reminds me of that Jenny song, like kind of anyway, uh, you know, the, with the phone number. Did his wife refuse to put the house up as collateral for a loan? Why are they not directly tying the financial crimes to his wife and son's murder, just presenting facts? Michael, what's your take on that? Because we're they right did. now. Oh. They did. Um, the bank um, 
Chad Malachowski talked about that this morning, that there was a delay in getting the collateral for the Beach House for a loan that they made to Alex, and that's why um, Creighton was suggesting that the bank was undersecured on that last loan. There was a delay in Maggie not willing to sign over her interest in the Beach House for the collateral on that loan, and that's another temporal mm -hmm. financial pressure that he was under. And we're going to talk about, as I guess in the show goes on, what those temp temporal pressures were. Uh I'm going to ask you this, Michael Bryant, uh, back in the studio. I, I, you may not know the answer to this. I don't know if any of us know the answer to this. Um, critic Su at Critic Susan from Twitter asks, where did all the money Alex misappropriated go? I'm not buying his opioid addiction unless he was taking gold-plated Oxycontin. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. You're right. And uh, I find it hard to believe that his uh, addiction, as, as bad as it seemed to be after so long, uh, would eat up that kind of cash. Uh, that would be shocking to me. So I don't think we've heard uh, all the uh, details we need for the money trail. He doesn't have an opioid addiction. It would take a 10,000 pound elephant to, to eat all that. And, and you heard Chris Wilson yesterday say how surprised he was when the opioid addiction was posited to him. He's his best friend. His law partners would have noticed it. Judges would have noticed it. There was no indication he was missing court. You think it's a lie? I think I think it's overblown. So he, you think he had like a celebrity thing where a crisis happened and he went to rehab? You know that typical. No, I mean I, he, he, you know, he obviously was swollen when you saw him. He may have had use opioid use, but there was not an opioid addiction. I, All I, right, uh, Gigi, we'll get to you when we come back. Uh, we have much more to discuss. Eric Bland staying with us. Uh, questions, keep them coming. I'm Anjanette. Levy and we've been coming to you live from Walterboro, South Carolina, and you are watching Law and Crime.
I'm Antoinette Levy, and welcome to Law & Crime, coming to you live from Walterboro, South Carolina. We are outside the Culleton County Courthouse uh, talking about the Alec Murdoch trial while we're on a lunch break. With me right here next to me is Eric Bland. He is the attorney for Gloria Satterfield's children, her two sons. Uh, Gloria Satterfield was a former housekeeper, nanny, really an extended family member of the Murdoch family uh, who passed away in 2018 after slipping and falling at that Moselle property. Uh, also with me this hour, Michael Bryant of Law and & Crime and Gigi McKelvey of Law & Crime too. Gigi's with me here just across the way in Walterboro. So we're taking your questions this hour and talking about what's happened in court so far this morning. Keep those questions coming to us both on Twitter and YouTube and we'll get to as many of them as possible. Let's take a look at Tony Satterfield's t testimony because he testified this morning in front of Judge Newman and this is because the prosecution wants to introduce uh, all of this evidence to the jury about financial misappropriation, misdeeds, theft uh, that Alec Murdoch has either admitted to or is accused of. As uh, motive as motive. Um, it has to be ruled to be more prejudicial than probative, or probative than prejudicial. Let me flip that around. Sorry about that. Um, it's 4 feet 4B evidence. The judge is hearing this testimony without the jury there to determine whether or not it would be proper for him to allow it in as part of the motive in this case that the prosecutors want to tell the jury about. So let's listen to a little bit of Tony Satterfield's testimony. As time went on, did you have conversations with Alec asking him about the case and what was going on with the case or anything like that? Uh, yes, not very rarely, but every few months or so. And what would he tell you just generally? Over, um, over the first, it was hard, hard, and he knows why it was making progress, and he kind of left it in that. He said it, it was hard, but they were making progress? Yes. Did he tell you anything about whether or not you and your brother were going to get any money? Uh, the medical he bills were paid? said he was hoping. Did he give you any idea, any idea of the amount? Uh, if I remember correctly, one time he said he was trying to get each of you at least $100,000 a piece. Each of, each of you, you yes. and your brother? Yes. Okay. Um, at some point in time, did your family advise you that there was some media reporting about a settlement in the case? Yes. All right. And at that time, had you heard anything from Alec or Corey or Chad or anybody about a settlement in the case? No. All right. And what, if anything, did you do after your family? Did they ask you to do anything? Uh, yeah, they said you might want to kind of follow up on it and kind of see. Right. And did you make a phone call to Alec? Uh, yes. All right. And what month was that in? Uh, I believe the last time I talked to him was in June of 21. June of 21? Yes. Around the time of the murders? Yes. And what did you ask him? Uh, I can't believe what I asked him, but um, it was still making progress and be ready to settle, you know, by the end of the year. He told you it was still making progress and he was hoping to settle by the end of the year? Yes. Did he tell you that they had already gotten a settlement for $505,000? No. Did he tell you that they had already gotten a settlement for $3.8 million? No. Had he ever told you that there was an umbrella policy for $5 million? No. Did he ever mention to you anything about Forge? No. Did he mention anything to you about structuring any settlement? No. Did he, you give him permission to steal your money? No. Ultimately, in the wake of all of this, you've come to find out that there was a settlement for $505,000, correct? Uh, yes. And it was diverted by Alec Murdoch, correct? Yes. And ultimately, you've come to find out that there was a settlement under the umbrella policy uh, for $3.8 million, is that yeah. correct? Yes. Or thereabouts, correct? Yes. And a large proportion of that was diverted by Alec Murdoch, is that right? Yes. Did you ever get one cent from Alec Murdoch when he was still, uh, before all of this happened? No. And it took, after this happening, and it took a legal process for that to happen, is that right? Yes. And ultimately, is it your understanding that he confessed judgment to taking money from both of those, is that yes. right? In June of 2021, you made a call to him asking the status of this case, is that correct? Uh, I can't remember if he called me or if I called him, but yes, I talked to him in June of 2021. You talked to him in June of 2021? Yes. And there were reports in the media about that settlement, correct? Yes. You had a family member who saw an article in somewhere. Do you know, remember where the article was published? Uh, I don't remember exactly where they found it at or seen it at. Okay, but, but after that article was published, that's when you st started making inquiries and you contacted Mr. Murdoch? Uh, 
yes, once they seen the article or whatever, they were like, you need to follow up on it. And uh, yes, and I can't remember if he called me or if I called him. And did you, do you know whether you called him on the cell phone? Uh, it was on his cell phone normally. That's how I called him, yes. So you called him on the cell phone? Yes. Okay, and his cell phone record would reflect, how many times did you call him? What was that? How many times did you call him? Like, uh, once, twice, three. We talked like three or four times, you know, throughout the whole year, if I remember correctly. Okay. And, and when you called him after reading some article about a settlement, do you know if that was before or after Maggie and Paul were murdered? Uh, it was around the time, but I don't remember if it was before or after. That was Tony Satterfield, Gloria Satterfield's, one of her sons, uh, testifying about learning about this settlement. $4.2 million, really, uh, in settlement money, insurance money that Alec Murdoch had gotten for him and his brother uh, through his home insurance policy, and there was an umbrella policy as well. Uh, Eric, I was, when they said, uh, called Tony Satterfield to the stand, I, everybody gasped where I was sitting. Nobody expected that. I told you I saw a young man sitting from behind next to you, and I thought you brought your son to court. Yeah. So, um, I mean, how did you think Tony did? Well, first it was $4,305,000, and Alex worked in concert with Corey Fleming, who's also charged in this uh, criminal scheme. But I thought Tony did amazing. I was just so surprised because I had no expectation, you know, a young man that is unfamiliar with the legal system. In fact, I was supposed to testify after him, but he did such a compelling job from a victim impact statement, and you really saw how vulnerable he was that Alex took advantage of him. That um, I talked to Creighton after the Creighton Woodards, the prosecutor, after the uh, Tony got done, and he said, there's just going to be duplicative if we put you up at this point. Now, at the trial, I think I'll end up testifying, and Tony will too, but he did great. If the judge lets it in. I, I know you think it's all coming in. Not but. all. No, no, no. I think temporal and time is going to come in. I think the pressures that, that can be shown that he was under on June 7th, now the, any number of those pressures will come in. I'm not sure that we'll get as far back as Pickney, uh, Thomas, Moore, or Badger. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get to our questions uh, from our viewers. You guys have been submitting great questions. Uh, Gigi McKelvey is here with me in Walterboro, South Carolina. Michael Bryant is here with me as well. So, Gigi, uh, this question is coming to you. Um, Silver Hour from YouTube asks, what about Alec Murdoch's brother? Is he going to testify in this? He, he, he has two brothers, Randy and John Marvin. So uh, do you think that Randy and John Marvin, do you think we'll see them, Gigi? Randy is on the prosecution's witness list, so I'm interested to see how they're going to bring him in. We'll see. There's 255 witnesses, so I'm not sure how many of those are actually going to testify, but it would be very powerful to have one brother on the stand for the state and the other brother is sitting at the defendant table. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, and so Jill Ballard from YouTube asks, so if they, they were trying to avoid a trial within a trial, Michael Bryant, wouldn't, uh, it, with it, okay, sorry. If, so if they were trying to avoid a trial within a trial, wouldn't let the financial evidence in do exactly that? Michael, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I'm not sure we're trying to avoid it. I, I think if it's done, and it's done in a lot of cases, we've seen this before, it has to be handled properly. You don't want that, I'll call it the sub-trial, the B-level trial. You don't want that to to overcome why you're really there, which in this case is a double murder trial. Um, so I think it can be done. It has been done before. It's a matter of managing it, and of course the judge is in charge of all of that. I have to say the judge, uh, Judge Newman in this case, has been very uh, open about a lot of things coming in that I thought maybe shouldn't have come in. So I would be surprised if more, uh, if we don't see more of the financial evidence than less. You know, if it's a 50-50 split, I think it's going to be on the above 50% side of the scale. There, It can be done. I agree. Interesting. Uh, Gigi, uh, this question is from you from uh, Tom Kaiser from, or I'm sorry, this is from uh, another one of our viewers. Um, judgmental from YouTube. Could financial crimes be uncovered during the trial? I think anything's possible in this case. I don't think we've seen the last of financial crimes to be exposed at the hand of Alec Murdoch. I mean, it's far reaching. 
I just, you know, speaking of the Satterfield boys, you think about all the years that she dedicated to that family and probably spent more time with the Murdochs than her own boys. For him to do that to her sons, it's just something I can't wrap my head around. So who knows what other things he's done that will come to light. And it, I think it will. We will, we shall see. I mean, there, there have been a lot of financial documents flying around in this trial. Uh, our next question is specifically for Eric Bland. Uh, this is from Devixa from YouTube. I hope I got that right. Which re the revelations have come out now that the trial is underway that have blown your mind so far, if any? Well, lots. Um, Paul being shot first for one, um, the Snapchat, video which probably shows that he changed his clothes before the going uh, at, before calling the police after 10 o'clock when he's allegedly discovered the murders um, the phone evidence that places him in the kennels um, the, you didn't know about this before the trial no okay no. the entire um, narrative that Maggie was asked to come to Mazel from Edisto to go visit um, Alex's ailing father who was dying in the hospital and to that they would ride together from Mazel yet after 9.05 at night he leaves the property he doesn't get her doesn't pick her up doesn't talk to her and doesn't even go see the father he goes to the mother's house we also learned um, a GSR which is gunshot residue on the seat belt and the blue jacket that he took to um, his mother's house so the state has done a really good job I think of keeping Dick and Jim, Dick Harputlin and Jim Griffin, um, diverted. I think the the blood splatter on the spatter on the shirt is going to turn out to be a Trojan horse. I'm not sure that's going to be the major piece of circumstantial evidence. And Dick and Jim have spent about three months on that. Mm -hmm. Well, they may not introduce it at all. I'm right. not sure they should. I mean, it just seems too contentious and silly. Correct. Like, it seems like they ruined the shirt. Just get rid of it, okay? Right. But they had so much backup circumstantial evidence that they were very confident. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bryant, this question is for you from Tom Kaiser from YouTube. Could Alex get a manslaughter conviction due to pressures and so-called drug addiction, or is it murder or nothing? What are your thoughts on that? Because it would, I, I think... You know, they'd have either side would have to ask for a lesser included offense, and of course, the judge would have to approve that. It's always a you know a, a, a play in a poker hand kind of situation here. Will the prosecution, at the end of their case, at the end of the entire case, feel like you know let's let's hedge our bets here, let's let's ask for the lesser included just because we got to get this guy for something. I don't think the prosecution's figured that out just yet. I would be surprised, based on what I'm seeing so far, if they don't ask. For lesser included, but we just don't know. It's their call, and it's too soon to, to see what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Gigi, let's get one over to you. Julie Imholz from YouTube asks, do we know if Alec had life insurance on Maggie and Paul? That was discussed today, at least from what we heard uh, through, I, I'm not sure the name of the company, but he did not have insurance on them as far as we know, which is surprising. And that's what we've, yeah, that's what we've heard from the defense team, at least. They've said, they've said no. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, we might, we might find out something new. I don't know. I think the defense would know, though, if uh, that, that was true. High net worth individuals wouldn't do that, though, because um, he has enough money that he wouldn't have had a policy on Maggie. Usually you get a policy on the spouse that if, God forbid, ha something happens to the husband, she can continue to raise the, the children kids, yeah. until they're 18. These kids were over 18 years old, so I don't think that there was a need for a policy on the spouse because he was such a high net worth, in theory, a high net worth individual. In theory, of course. Uh, sweet Whispers from YouTube. Have the Satterfield boys gotten money yet? Eric? Yes, we, uh, we have been fortunate and we've recovered um, in excess of seven and a half million dollars for them um, from various sources, from Corey Fleming, from his law firm, from Palmetto State Bank, um, and from uh, Alex's law firm. We have uh, recovered um, significant money from them to put them in a position that they don't have to worry for the rest of their life. Plus, we have the $4.3 million judgment that's being used in this court today. Um, as a financial pressure that Alex was under. Um, when we got it, I don't think Jim and, and Dick really understood how it was going to be used. And the next day after I got it, I gave it to our state's 
ODC, which is the Office of Disciplinary Council, and he was disbarred two days later. Wow. Uh, so it was a big, big deal. It was a big get. Yeah, I mean, and he he essentially admitted to it. Yes. He, the, he, the confession of judgment with the, that settlement, he literally said, okay, I did it. Yes. You got me. Make it right. Um, so he's, Yeah, they've been made uh, almost whole. You know, we would argue that there was an income tax implication and the loss of use of the money. But they, if, if, if everything was paid under the $4.3 million, mm -hmm. they would have only gotten about $2.9 million. And they've gotten now, we've gotten them, once we netted out our fees, well in excess of $4.5 million. Wow. So it's been good. Uh, Jen from YouTube, Michael Bryant, uh, the, she asks, does the prosecution need the weapons if they can prove that other rounds are on the property with the same markings as the rounds that killed Maggie and Paul? What are your thoughts on that? Because that's basically what we're hearing about from Paul Greer. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we've seen many cases that have been uh, res result in convictions without the murder weapon. What I don't like is the use of all these other weapons, which are ag agreed not the murder weapon, to prejudice this jury into thinking thinking, well, hey, a gun's a gun's a gun. They have shotguns just like the one used to murder Paul. They have the 300 blackouts just like the one used to murder Maggie. So therefore, uh, bing, bing, bing. I've just connected those dots. I hate to see the jury do that. I'd, I'd like to see more. I think it's harmful to have this prejudicial type e exposure of these other weapons if they can't create a more significant link to the actual weapons, whether they're found or not. The connection to the defendant has to be made, and I'm not sure it's been made yet. And we're waiting to see if that if that connection is going to be made. Uh, let's see. Let's get to some more questions. Um, you know, Gigi, I guess I'm just going to ask you this question. You live in this state, and you know a lot of people in this state. What are you hearing? And you have your, your podcast, too. What are you hearing from people about this trial so far? Are you hearing from people in the state and in the area that that say they think the state is doing well, they think the defense is doing well. What are your thoughts? A lot of my listeners uh, feel that the, the motive just doesn't fit. I mean, that's kind of the main thing I'm hearing all over is why would you commit a double murder if you're trying to take focus off your financial crimes? That seems to be the most thing that I'm hearing, there are people who say it fits. It's kind of all over the place, but I'll tell you one thing, a lot of people who are local and just across the state do not think he'll be found guilty. That's what I'm hearing. They think it'll be a hung jury because there's still fear in this community that that grip is still here of the Murdochs for, you know, it's been here for almost 100 years. It's interesting. It's kind of all over the board, mm -hmm. really. Well, and it only takes one jury, juror for a hung jury, and we still have a long way to go in this trial. So even thinking about deliberations at this point, you know, we're still very early, but it's always interesting to see how the public is viewing this, especially when you talk to people right here in Walterboro or in other parts of the state. Uh, so we are taking your questions live. Uh, submit them to us on Twitter and in our YouTube chat, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We're going to take a quick break. If you're watching on YouTube, stay with us. We have to do this for the network. It'll just be a couple of minutes. I'm Ann Jeanette Levy coming to you live from Walterboro, South Carolina, and you are watching Law & Crime.
Welcome back. I'm Ann Jeanette Levy, along with Eric Bland, an attorney for the sons of Gloria Satterfield, the former Murdoch family housekeeper and nanny. And uh, we are coming to you live uh, here from the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina. Gigi McKelvey is over across the way. Michael Bryant is in the studio in New York. And we are taking your questions this hour, so keep them coming to us. But let's listen to a little bit of testimony from earlier today. We heard from the CEO and president of the Palmetto State Bank, and that is a bank that Alec Murdoch owed a lot of money to uh, on June 7th, 2021, when these homicides took place, the, the deaths of Paul and Maggie Murdoch. And we heard from the president and CEO of the bank because he's talking about how much money Alec Murdoch owed, and the judge is considering whether or not to let the jury hear this evidence to prove motive in this case uh, by prosecutors. So let's listen to a little bit of what Jan Malinowski told the judge uh, about Alec Murdoch's financial condition on the day of the homicides. All right, do you recognize that document? I do. Tell me what that is, please. Uh, it's a the minutes of the executive committee of August 12th of 2021. All right. And uh, a number of topics were discussed, but primarily the uh, relationship of uh, Richard Alexander Alec Murdoch right. and his total relationship uh, with the bank. All right. And this is on August 12, 2021? Correct. Right. Can I get the elbow, please? <coughs> All right, so these are the minutes that you're referring to, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and there's a discussion right there, including a reference to a uh, memo that was distributed outlining the uh, bank's relationship with uh, Alec Murdoch, is that correct? Yes, sir. And there's a reference also to the total indebtedness that Alec Murdoch had to the bank at that point in time. Yes, sir. As of, as of the day of that memo that was presented to the executive committee, uh, Mr. Murdoch owed directly or indirectly $4.2 million. $4.2 million, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. At that time, was there any discussion or any record of a discussion of any loan to Alec Murdoch for $750,000? No, sir, there is not. Again, that's July 20th, 2021? That's correct. All right, going back to this uh, August 12th, 2021 uh, executive committee notes, I want to walk back just a little bit and tell me, was there, uh, did Alec Murdoch come up in any discussion among the board members prior to August 12th, 2021? Yes, it and did. Tell me about that, how that happened, please. Uh, on August 9th, uh, Norris Lafitte, a board member, uh, sent an email to members of the executive committee and the board asking for a full accounting of uh, Mr. Murdoch's relationship with the bank. All right. And can you pull that mic just a little bit closer? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. And uh, what, what happened after that? Did that spark any particular activity? Sparked quite a bit of activity, conversation, and then activity inside the bank that day. All right. And explain that to the court. What happened? Uh, shortly after... Mr. Lafitte, uh, Norris Lafitte sent his email to uh, members of the executive committee and the board. Um, the uh, a, a, a deposit was made to Mr. Murdoch's account uh, in the amount of $400,000, which cleared up an overdraft, a large overdraft, which had been in his account that day. All right. And who caused that deposit to happen? Russell Lafitte. All right. And so there was a significant overdraft in Alec Murdoch's account? On that day, yes, sir. Was it over $350,000 overdraft? Yes, sir. And so Russell Lafitte caused a $400,000 to be deposited into his account? Yes, sir. And that was after the email from Norris Lafitte asking about Alec Murdoch on August the 9th? Yes, sir. All right. 
Um, at that time, that Russell Lafitte cost $400,000 to be put into Alex's account to cover a over $350,000 overdraft. Were there any loan documents or any sort of application or anything uh, in existence supporting any such uh, disbursement? No, sir. Just put the money in there. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, that was some really interesting testimony. Alec Murdoch was completely over leveraged. He owed that bank more than $4 million. I can't even imagine. I can't imagine Gigi uh, McKelvey, who's here with me in Walterboro, walking into a bank. I know I've had to go through, jump through the hoops of getting a mortgage before. Uh, walking into a bank and just having somebody say, yeah, I'll put $400,000 into your account. And document it later. Yeah, document it later. I mean, I, I felt like I literally had to, like, go through um, the most extensive whatever of my life to get a mortgage. It, I mean, obviously, we were approved and everything, but, you know, it was kind of annoying. And Alec Murdoch could just walk into Palmetto State Bank, and they're like, sure, here it is. I mean, it's like a money tree. Creighton had to probably the best line of the trial so far, and it was outside the presence of the jury when he said it's the most generous overdraft policy in the history yeah, of the bank. Yeah, that drew some chuckles. But Gigi, what do you think of that? Because uh, I've never heard of such a thing. Well, I haven't either, but it sounds like Alec Murdoch was able to walk into any establishment and get what he wanted, whether it was a bank or wherever else. You know, a lot of people wonder, where did that money go? You know, you hear of lottery winners who end up bankrupt. It's not hard to blow millions of dollars. That's the big question that my listeners have is, where did all that money go? Because it sure didn't go to an opioid addiction like uh, Mr. Bland said earlier. Right. I, I just think, I mean, I've... I've covered the opioid epidemic for years. I've never met somebody who was addicted to opioids who spent millions of dollars on it. It just doesn't, it just, that doesn't jive. He, he I, had teeth, he, you know, he didn't have a hollowed out face. People who are serious But that's like meth. But, but opioid does the same thing if you, if you, and I've had a lot of opioid cases. The fact of the matter is he didn't really have a rich lifestyle. He didn't own an airplane. He doesn't drive a Ferrari. They didn't go to France every year. So that money is somewhere. And that's the last prong that I think we have to find out. I think the FBI is working on it. Um, and the harder they squeeze him, the more they tighten his chest. And if he gets a conviction here or he gets an LWAP life without parole on these financial crimes, he finally may talk and we may find out. Yeah, everybody wants to know where's the money, right? Where's the money? Show me the money. All right, uh, Pass Nola from YouTube asks, if it's a hung jury, Michael Bryant, will they retry him and possibly ask for a change of venue? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're reading the tea leaves here. I don't know about a change of venue. Uh, I, I think it would stay put, I really do, unless there's some evidence of, of some bias or something that they couldn't overcome. Uh, I think it definitely would be retried, maybe rethought, but I think it would definitely be retried. Hey, I want to contribute to the, um, the misappropriation of funds discussion, if I can, Anjanette. Do you mind if I do that? I want to ask, yes, of I want to ask Eric a question. In California, uh, yeah, we have a client trust fund account. So you get a case resolved. You go, and in this case, I had a client that you know, needed the money right away. So I said, Let, let's do what we can do. I go to the bank. I literally put the check in the client trust fund account. From there, it's dispersed. My office gets whatever we get. The client gets whatever they get. Almost immediately, I get a note from the state bar saying, hey, there's a problem with your client trust fund account, co-mingling. You know, if there's a word that draws, uh, you know, kind of mm. puts ice in the veins of a, an attorney, it's co-mingling. That's ticket-taking stuff. You lose your license, as uh, Alec Murdoch learned, at, learned uh, in this case. My question then is, with, with the bar in California at least so sensitive, oh, by the way, uh, I immediately got on the phone to the bank, can't tell you the name, but the initials were Wells Fargo, and they screwed up, and they had changed the money <laughs> out of order, and it made it look like I'd done something wrong. Clearly, I hadn't. It was fine. But Eric, in South Carolina, what are the safeguards there to protect client money and trust fund issues like this? Well, we have an ob obligation to deposit settlement proceeds in a IOLTA account, an interest-only lawyer trust account, where the interest goes to the bar. And the check has to clear before you disperse. Even though you may have other money in your account for other clients that's in trust in the escrow account, um, you have to wait until the check clears. So it may be a little different than, in, than the rules in California, but... Um, you know that's how it's done and, and a lot of uh, you know lawyers are a self-policing profession we don't get our accounts audited 
Um, you don't have to submit an audit trail every year, uh, an audited statement of your trust account to the bar. It's a reactionary. We're not proactive. So the bar only comes in and looks at a trust account when they're on notice of an infraction or a complaint. So a lot of times lawyers can be out of trust. They could borrow money. You know, it happens frequently in lawyer closing cases where lawyers are closing attorneys and they get money in from the sale of a house that's supposed to go to pay off a mortgage. Instead of paying off the mortgage, we have a lot of cases where the lawyers will continue to pay the monthly mortgage amount for a couple months, get used to those funds, maybe put it into a stock, see if it'll uh, increase, and then they'll pay off the mortgage and satisfy the, uh, the mortgage later on down the road. But what invariably happens is the stock doesn't appreciate, it goes down, and then they uh, have a problem and they can't um, clear the mortgage. All right, so uh, that was a lot. Sorry. <laughs> it was okay Sorry. though. No, but he answered your question, Michael. Uh, let's do a round robin here. I'm just gonna ask all of you really briefly before we have to sign off. Uh, what do you think the likelihood is? You can give me a percentage. Uh, what likelihood do you think the financial crimes are coming in? Gigi, I'll start with you. I think they have to come in in some capacity. I don't know about all of it because we'll be here until, you know, uh, Christmas, but yeah, they got to come in as part of the motive. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, it's going to lengthen this trial depending on the degree to which the stuff comes in. It's, I don't think it's a yes or no, it's a how much. Eric? They're coming in. Uh, I agree with Gigi that it's going to be a question of how much. Um, I think a significant portion is going to come in, but he'll throw a bone to the defense and not let it all in. I think this judge is um, going to let more in than he probably would. This probably is going to be one of his last cases. Mm. So he'd rather get a conviction and get himself reversed on appeal for letting too much in than getting reversed on appeal for not letting enough in. Oh, boy. Yikes. Uh, that's, that's a big decision for Judge because Newman, who's really re well respected around the state. He is, because this is a testament on where our bar stands. We were really stained by him stealing almost $10 million. So our state was uh, damaged, but our bar really suffered bruised, really bruised. And I think he's trying to reform what the public thinks of lawyers in our mm -hmm. state. Interesting. Well, Eric, uh, Eric Bland, thanks so much for coming on. We Absolutely. hope you'll come back. I yeah, it was great to have you. Gigi, thanks so much. Michael, I'm going to throw it back to you after this break, uh, but we appreciate everybody joining us for our, our Q&A session. And uh, we'll be right back. I'm Anjanette Levy, and you've been watching Law & Crime coming to you live from Walterboro, South Carolina.
Crime, everybody. Michael Bryant here, and we are still on lunch in the uh, Alec Murdoch murder trial. I hope you had a chance to join us for the lunch with Anjanette Q&A. We're doing that uh, every day. Kind of floats in terms of time, depending on when the court actually takes their lunch, and they are still out uh, probably for another 10 minutes or so. Uh, I want to bring you up to speed on one of the uh, trial within a trial issues that was dealt with earlier today. Uh, again, these are all witnesses testifying outside the presence of the jury on the financial misdealings of Alec Murdoch and whether or not that stuff should come in to the murder trial itself to establish motive. The prosecution says the defense opened that door. They want to run through it with a lot of stuff. One of the people that testified today was Jan Mal uh, Malinowski. He is the Palmetto Bank, uh, bank president who took over for Russell Lafitte, who you may remember was kind of in cahoots with the defendant on a, a scam, financial scam. Not really good for a bank president to be involved in those, so he lost his job and this witness took over. Let's go and take a look at this testimony. Are you um, aware that on the day Maggie Murdoch was, well, Maggie Murdoch was murdered sometime the night of June the 7th. Are you aware that she was scheduled to meet your appraiser at Edisto on June the 8th? No, sir. The, uh, the Moselle pro <coughs> property was titled in Maggie Murdoch's name in June of 2021, correct? I believe that's the correct. The bank had, had filed mortgages on the property that predated whenever he, that was transferred to Ms. Murdoch, right? Yes, sir. The Edisto Beach House was titled in jointly in Alec Murdoch and Maggie Murdoch's names, correct? At one point. Before her death. I believe it was in her name solely at the time of her death. You do? Are you sure about that? I believe so. Okay. And what information are you relying upon to say that? Uh, looking at the Colleton County uh, deed records. Does the bank undergo routine FDIC audits? Come out of State Bank? Yes, sir. And had Mr. Murdoch's relationship with the bank ever been flagged in any audit? conducted by the FDIC or their contract auditors? To my knowledge, no. You were just asked about whether or not Maggie was going to be meeting an appraisal at the Edisto property, but you've testified in no uncertain terms that that appraisal was to renew the mortgage that was already in existence that had matured, correct? Yes, sir. It had nothing to do with a new 750? Yes, sir. We just... Uh, Talked about the negative $347,000 overdraft policy, correct? Yes, sir. In two months, his account had went to negative $347,000. Yes, sir. If it had come out that Alec Murdoch had been diverting fees from his law firm, if Alec Murdoch had been forced to resign from his law firm, if it had come out that he had been misappropriating money from his clients, would the bank have continued to pay charges coming in on that account? No, sir. No. No, sir. No uncertain terms about that? No, no uncertain terms. So all this testimony about the relationship in the bank, if the truth had come out, it's a new ball game, correct? Yes, sir. And in the wake of all of this, Russell Lafitte was terminated and you became CEO, is that correct? Yes, sir. And now there's a new sheriff in town at Palmetto State Bank, correct? Yes, sir. 
Thank you. So just a, a splash of the financial uh, misappropriations testimony that came in this morning. It began yesterday uh, in the afternoon this morning. Again, outside the presence of the jury on this collateral issue of money. Was it the motive for Alec Murdoch to kill his wife and son? Uh, here to chat about this is Joe Richardson, civil rights attorney. He's in Southern California. Joe, good to see you. Um, you know, I, I'm having trouble with this as a motive. I think it's a whole different mindset to be a conniving, greedy guy that's coming up with a scheme to, to scam your clients out of money and, and defraud uh, all these folks for money and, and, and turn that into, you know, to protect that scheme, I'm going to kill my wife and son. I got a problem with that. Yeah, I mean, I think it is interesting, and and to the to that point, um, you know, the the interviews during the lunch there with Anjanette, um, you know, uh, kind of revealed some of the area folks are like, you know, well, why would that be a motive? Why would someone do this to draw attention away from or develop sympathy? You know what I mean? To draw attention away from financial misgiving. So they're really going to have to connect the dots. We see what's happening. You know, a lot of this is probably going to come in, you know, on some level or another. But they still have to connect the dots about why it makes sense, why he really believed that he would go so far as to kill someone, um, family members. Uh, in order to divert attention away uh, or curry sympathy related to some financial misgivings. I'm not sure I get it yet either. My sense is at some point we're supposed to all get it, but I'm not sure if I got it there. And and it, it, they've got to be careful to make sure they get all the jurors, you know, because if one doesn't get it, the jury hangs. Yeah, and I, and I really feel like if they were to start deliberating today, that's that's where we'd be. Heading. And, and you know, the other, the other argument is here's a guy that has uh, hired a relative to, to kill him. Uh, it didn't go so well. He survived. So if somebody's willing to do that, you know, maybe, maybe this whole big scheme makes sense somehow. Let's talk about the guts of, of this trial, the one that at this point is in front of the jury, the double murder trial. How do you feel it's going? Uh, how do you feel the prosecution's case is being presented? Well, I mean, I think the prosecution's pr uh, presentation is fine, but I think that the defense is getting some knocks and some hits on on cross. You know, the idea that uh, it is not, you cannot throw out the notion that perhaps there were two people at the scene. The, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, that you can't find the, the actual murder weapons. Um, there are some things there that the defense can use. I mean, clearly everything's about believability, right? You know, even if there are two potential theories, um, you know, uh, that theoretically creates trouble for the prosecution, but at the same time, uh, can they and can they get past reasonable doubt or beyond a reasonable doubt in terms of how this put to, it is put together? There are some damning things. If there are some credibility issues, because it seems like, based on some of the presentation, that um, he was actually at on site and at the dog kennels uh, and at the property, basically when he says that he wasn't. So the cell phone evidence is going to be going to be huge. So the lady had to testify very briefly to catch a plane yesterday. So some of those things are going to figure in. I think that's going to be as important as anything in terms of them making a presentation that no, he said in interviews, et cetera, he was here, but he was here. So why is he lying about that? That might be as big as anything. Yeah, I think that's that's clearly a huge issue. Uh, in favor of the prosecution and the other evidence suggesting that he wore different clothing earlier in the day. So when did he change his clothes? We now know better the proximity between the crime scene and the uh, house. Have you seen my drawing? Uh, you know, so he had time to get to the house and change clothes. If it wasn't planned and he had them somewhere near the crime scene. All of that stuff uh, is going to be just huge in this case. Joe, good stuff. Stay where you are. We're going to take a quick break here, keeping an eye on the seal of the great state of uh, South Carolina when they come back live any moment now, I expect. We will jump in there. Let's take a break. Come right back.
may be seated. You can bring the jury. Thank you. You may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court? Yes, sir. Uh, beginning with items, State's Exhibits 11, uh, 111, 112, 113, I believe right before we broke, I presented to counsel and was going to offer it to the witness, and I believe it was uh, without objection going to be uh, offered into evidence. That's correct. Without objection. Without objection. All right, Agent, or uh, Mr. Greer, <clears throat> please review um, what's been marked as State's Exhibit 111, 112, 113. Slide items 66, 69, and 104. If you would, please let us know if you had an opportunity to inter inspect those items and analyze them. Uh, yes, sir, I did. Um, State's Exhibit 112 is sled item 66. And that was determined to be three fired bullet jacket fragments and seven pieces of lead listed as from Margaret Murdoch at autopsy. Stakes exhibit 11. 111? Yes, sir. Excuse me. I apologize. 111 is sled item 69. And that is one combination wad listed as from left axilla of Paul Murdoch at autopsy. In state's exhibit 113 is sled item 104. And that was one birdshot pellet listed as found with Paul Murdoch's clothing. <coughs> All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to direct your attention to State's Exhibit 90, Sled Item 31. Did you have an opportunity to inspect this item? Um, I did inspect a Sled Item 31. Is this the item you inspected? Firearm is unloaded, safe to handle. Yes, sir, I see my identifying marks um, as slit item 31 on this firearm. Tell us what this is. Um, that was determined to be one Browning model Auto 5 Light 12 semi automatic shotgun, 12 gauge, with serial number 03867NV211. And did you conduct further examinations on that firearm that we'll discuss in a little bit? Yes, sir, I did. I'm going to sh show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit and entered into evidence. State's Exhibit 89, item 30 on your report. Did 
Did you have an opportunity to inspect that firearm? Um, this firearm is also unloaded. Yes, sir, I did. And how do you know that? Um, when I'm looking at these firearms, um, we uh, scribe our evidence if possible um, in multiple locations. So I'm looking for those identifying features of that sled lab number and that item number as well as my initials on some of these items that I was able to, to mark that. So I, I see that on this firearm. Thank you. of our results that we'll discuss shortly. Did you conduct additional testing on that firearm? Uh, yes, sir. Handing you what's been marked as an entered into evidence as states exhibit 91. That would be your sled item number 32. if you recognize that firearm, if you, uh, in fact, were the one that uh, received it and conducted examinations on it. Um, this firearm is also unloaded. I'm going to look again for those um, identifying marks. Uh, yes, sir, I identify this as my sled item 32. I'll direct your attention to what's been entered into evidence as States Exhibit 91, I'm sorry, States Exhibit 88, and sled item 33. Are you familiar with that item? Um, this firearm is also unloaded. Yes, sir. I am familiar with this item. Is that the item that you uh, conducted tests on? Yes, sir. This is the sled item 33. States Exhibit 210, which would be sled item 34. That's been entered into evidence. Collectively as item states item 210. Are you familiar with the contents of that evidence package? Yes, sir, I am. And what are they? Um, Sled item 34, States Exhibit 210, um, was determined to be one magazine and 26 unfired um, Celia and Bellow 300 blackout um, caliber cartridges. And was sled item 34, but this State's Exhibit 210 included with the uh, rifle we just uh, took a look at? Uh, yes, sir. It was submitted in the same uh, package as the uh, rifle. Moving on to States Exhibit 143 through, sorry, States Exhibit 143, 144, 150, and 148. Entered into evidence already, that would be sled items 166, 167, 168, and 169. 
Yes, sir. Okay, menu has been marked as those exhibits. Would you please take an op a chance to review those? Let me know if you're familiar with them and if you had an opportunity to uh, analyze them. Yes, sir. I believe I have seen these items. Okay. Tell us what they are, if you would. Um, each of these uh, four items um, are 12 gauge of uh, federal shot shells, and they each all have the uh, markings that are consistent with each other a federal premium double lock buck three inch magnum and do your notes indicate where they were located um, I have an indication based on the packaging okay where the packaging indicate um, the packaging for um, six is a bit 150 um, from what I can tell says from red bin on workshop bench for six is a bit 144 says from Red Bin on Workshop Bench. Stakes Exhibit 143 says from Red Bin on Workshop Bench. And Stakes Exhibit 148 um, also says from Red Bin on Workshop Bench. All right, thank you. Now I'm going to hand you what's been uh, previously entered into evidence as states exhibits 145, 146, 147, and 149. That would be sleds um, number 162, 163, 164, and 165. Uh, same as before, if you wouldn't mind, please uh, take a look at those and let me know if you are familiar with their contents. Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us what they are. Um, all four of these items um, are Winchester 12 gauge shot shells, and they all appear to have the same information on the shot shell of dry lock 3 inch with the number 2. hand you what's been uh, previously entered into evidence as States Exhibit 213, sled item 45. Please take a look at the, uh, that piece of evidence and let me know if you are aware of what it is. Uh, yes, sir. This appears to be a, a box for um, ammunition um, in the 300 blackout caliber. And does, uh, does that box indicate the maker of that 300 blackout ammunition? It does. Who's the manufacturer? Um, Cellier and Billo. SMB? Yes, sir.
Exhibit 260 contains sled items 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39. I'm handing you what's been now admitted to evidence of State's Exhibit 260. Please take a, if you would, please take a moment to review those items and let, you, let me know if you're familiar with them. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I am familiar with this evidence. Right. And what are they? Um, these are sled items 35 through 39. Um, these were each of uh, fired 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases um, with the head stamp of Cellier and Bello. Thank you. Previously, a state's exhibit 261. For identification purposes only, just a reference sled item numbers 108 to 135. now admitted under state's exhibit as state's exhibit 261 um, please take a moment to review those items um, any notes or uh, information you might have on them and let me know if you're aware of what they are uh, yes container a B uh, was submitted to the laboratory um, and it um, is to contain sled items 108 through 135. I am familiar with, with these items, and this package appears to um, not have been tampered with since I sealed it last, as I see my initials and seal date there at the bottom. And what's um, inside that package? Inside this package, there are um, 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases, as well as 12-gauge uh, shot shells. And did you have an opportunity to perform an analysis on these items? Yes, sir, I did. offering you what's been marked as state's exhibit 398 that would reference slide item 22.4 and I believe without objection we'll offer it as evidence you would please uh, take a look at that item and uh, cross-reference with your report and let me know if you're familiar with what it is Yes, sir. Um, this container contains um, two sled items. Um, that's item, sled item 22.4, um, which is a swab of debris that I took, a reddish brown debris swab from the right side of the item 22 receiver. Which item is 22? Remember item, item 22 was the camouflage um, Benelli model Super Black Eagle 3 semi automatic shotgun. Um, and it also contains sled item 22.5 which was another swab from that same shotgun and that was um, reddish brown debris swab from the left side of the item 22 receiver above manufacturer information and tell us a little bit about the swabs and what you're looking for with that uh, yes sir 
When, when I receive uh, items of evidence, a part of my process in documenting the evidence and opening the evidence is to look to see if there's any foreign or trace material on that item. Um, when I was examining this firearm and opening it for the first time, I took note of that. And when I did that, I, I noticed two, those two areas um, that I saw reddish brown debris. Um, in order to preserve that prior to my examination, I uh, swabbed those items um, so that way they could be uh, collected and um, maintained. Mr. Graham, I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 399, which references slide item 22.7. Uh, State would offer that into evidence after you identify it, and I believe without objection. Uh, yes, sir, I do recognize this, and this package is still sealed with my initials and seal date. Um, item 22.7 um, was the unfired 12-gauge shot shell that was submitted with the item uh, 22 camouflage Benelli uh, Super Black Eagle 3 shotgun. Um, during my testing, I used that submitted ammunition that came with the firearm um, to test fire the, the weapon with, and that is represented here as um, sled item 22.7, um, States Exhibit 399. Okay. Before we move on to your analysis and your results, if you would please um, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about the uh, firearms identification process and the number of ways that you use to identify uh, whether a firearm shot a particular projectile. Sure. Um, as we were discussing earlier, when I receive evidence in, to the laboratory and I begin my examination, um, there's a lot of documentation that has to happen. Um, first, as we're opening the evidence, we're going to, um, one, make sure um, to preserve any of that trace or foreign material. Um, we take the use photography to document the evidence as we're opening it and to photograph the actual item itself and that trace material or foreign material. Um, we also use a lot of uh, departmental worksheets where I take notes on the firearm, um, the magazine, uh, the fired components such as the cartridge case or the bullet and also um, any other thing that we need to document um, throughout the process or unfired cartridges. Um, we take note of all of that, writing down all of these characteristics that we're seeing on the evidence. Um, in order to do our examination though, uh, we have to look at these um, fired ammunition components, these cartridge cases and these um, fired bullets, and look at their, uh, their class characteristics. So we're gonna count um, on a bullet. We're gonna look at its rifling, trying to determine um, its caliber through weight and measuring it and um, counting those number of lands and grooves that comprise that rifling like we spoke earlier. That's what gives that bullet that twist. Um, we document that. Um, we may also look at those cartridge case and look at those things that have the same class characteristic. That could be the caliber of that cartridge case, the shape of that firing pin, and any overall features. Um, items that share the same class characteristics will compare together. Um, and it's kind of like climbing a ladder at this point. Those items that share the same class characteristics, we climb to the next uh, step on that ladder and we compare those items. Um, we're gonna look at those fired bullets with each other, those fired cartridge cases with each other, and we're gonna look at all of that under um, high uh, magnification. We use a comparison microscope in our laboratory to look at these items. And basically, if you think back to a, a biology lab that you may have had in school or some kind of science lab, when you look through a microscope, that's what we're doing. But we're using this comparison microscope to look at two things at one time. And we use, uh, it uses an ocular bridge so we can look through like a set of binoculars to look at these things. Um, we can change the angles that we're looking at, all these tiny little scratches and striations and impressions on the evidence. Um, that you can't really see with the naked eye. We're going to look at it under that magnification and compare all of that to each other um, to help us reach our final goal, which is a conclusion. Um, if we have firearms that are submitted, um, we'll also have that documented. 
Those firearms that have the same class characteristics, for instance, if we have a gun that's the same caliber as our fire bullet and it shares the same rifling specifications, then that means we can compare that bullet um, with test fires from the firearm. So I'll make sure the firearm is safe to fire and we'll shoot that firearm within our laboratory. Um, we have several different ways to do that with a water recovery tank um, and a, a tunnel that we're able to shoot and recover those test specimens that I physically shot from the firearm. Um, I'll compare those test specimens with each other to look at how those marks that I was um, looking for under the microscope that we were talking about to see how they're reproducing on those test fires in um, the, whether that be a bullet or cartridge case, compare that under the microscope and then compare that where necessary um, to the submitted evidence. Um, after looking at all that, I would reach a conclusion about whether this was fired by this item or not. Um, or, or whatever that conclusion may be, I arrive at that and I write that conclusion down. Um, at that point in time, another qualified examiner within our firearms department will review the evidence themselves. They'll look at all the submitted evidence and compare that with each other and with those test specimens that I fired and arrive at their own conclusion. Um, if they're in agreement, then they'll sign off on my conclusions um, and a report can be drafted. And that's how we get the information out to, to our customers through our report. <coughs> Um, at SLED we have the 100% micro verification process where everything that we're issuing a conclusion on um, is, is reviewed by another examiner. So that case file, all that documentation that I generate um, goes to uh, that examiner or reviewer. It goes, undergoes a technical review and an administrative review before a report can be released. Um, and in a nutshell, that's, that's how we work each case. Um, there, there are different parts, there's different items of evidence that we get in each case, but that's a quick overview of how each case has worked and, and those, uh, that process was applied to this case. Thank you. Mr. Greer, speaking of the, the peer review process that goes on in the lab, is that conducted uh, blindly, meaning the person reviewing your, your report doesn't <coughs> know what your findings are? That's correct. Okay. Could you explain, so the, the su subsequent reviewer doesn't know what you decided in your uh, first prime, prime opinion, is that right? Right. I'll look at the evidence myself, um, arrive at a conclusion, and um, the second examiner will look at it um, w and come to their conclusion on their own. Um, if Once they have arrived at their own conclusion, looking at the evidence with their own eyes on the microscope, they'll read my results to see if they're in agreement with m what I have determined or not. And that, I think you just testified, but was that done in this case? Yes, sir, it was. Tell, uh, before we move on, please tell me what it means for a, a um, cartridge casing to be cycled through a weapon. What does that mean? Sure. Um, if you think back when we were looking at the cartridge um, earlier, an unfired cartridge, um, when, we're gonna, when we look at these items under magnification on the microscope, there are several different areas that we're going to be concerned with um, in looking at for those microscopic scratches and impressions, um, those little striations. One of those would be um, a firing pin, and that's what uh, comes through the breech face of the gun to detonate the primer. Um, also the breech uh, face marks on that primer from the gun. Um, ejector marks, that's what kicks that cartridge out of the gun or the cartridge case, extractor marks, that's what pulls it out of the chamber of the firearm so that it can be pick, kicked out, and also um, chamber marks, and that's on the body of, of the cartridge case, that cylindrical portion. Um, so when we're looking at evidence, our ultimate goal is to say something was fired by this gun or they were fired by the same gun. Um, and we do that and we can rely on that firing, those firing pin par marks and those breech face marks because that's what struck the primer and calls it to detonate and fire that cartridge. Um, there's other things that we can look at um, just to single out like extractor marks and ejector marks um, and chamber marks of such that we can look at to say that a cartridge um, has traveled through a gun. For example, if you were to load a magazine, insert it into um, a semi-automatic firearm, pull the slide back, load that cartridge into the chamber and then you decide you're not going to shoot or you need to remove that cartridge for any reason, you would pull back on that slide of the handgun and the cartridge would be extracted out of the chamber and ejected. Through that process, um, there can be marks left on um, the cartridge. Um, that also would happen when you're firing it, but 
That's not what detonated that primer and set that off. Those ejector marks, those extractor marks. Um, and that just means that that cartridge, we can say, has traveled through that firearm at one point in time. Um, that's not to say it was fired by, but it's cycling marks that we're seeing as it's cycled through that gun. So, so <clears throat> is it accurate to say then that the cycling marks are separate and distinct from the actual firing pin marks that when you're reviewing these under a microscope? Uh, yes, sir. As far as um, what we're looking at geographically on the cartridge case, um, those would be in a different location when we're looking for those ejector marks or extractor marks or chamber marks. Um, that's not something that we typically would be seeing on um, the primer area that detonated that cartridge. Thank you. If I could, uh, beginning with your results, um, if, if we could begin with your <clears throat> examination of all the shotgun shells, so the actual shells that were retrieved as part of uh, your analysis, beginning with items, sled items, 9 and 10, which would be states item 33 and 34. Could you tell me where these items were retrieved? Remind us where these items were retrieved from, first of all. Um, sled items 9 and 10, that states exhibit 33 and 34. Um, items, item 9 was from marker 9, and item 10 was from marker 10, which is my understanding that it was um, at the, the feed or storage room. And I'm going to put these on the Elmo, but if you would tell us what your analysis of these items would be. Yes, sir. Um, objection to these opinions um, based yes, on sir. prior ruling. Please proceed, um, Mr. Griffin. Yes, sir. Um, when I compared and examined those two shot shells um, with each other, I determined that. Um, those two shot shells have been fired by the same firearm. And do you know the make and model of, or the make and manufacturer of those two weapons, uh, sorry, projectiles or shells? Yes, sir, I do. All right. Um, so item, item 9. nine. Yes, sir. Which, uh, item 9 is which item? Um, item 9 is the red and color shot shell, which is States Exhibit 34. Okay. That was a federal premium double alt buck three inch magnum shot shell. And sled item 10 was is the black and color shot shell, state exhibit 33, and that is a fire 12 gauge Winchester dry lot uh, number two shot shell. All right, Mr. Greer, moving on to. <clears throat> Uh, referencing item 22 collectively? Yes, sir. States exhibit 399, 22.7 on your report? Yes, sir. States exhibit 399. Um, did you have an opportunity, Gardner? Could you tell us what that is? Uh, yes, sir. That was um, the unfired 12 gauge shot shell that was submitted <coughs> originally with the item 22 shotgun, which is the camouflage color uh, Benelli shotgun. Could you go ahead and open that uh, package for us, please? Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> Do you have scissors or just? again where that item was retrieved from um, this item was originally submitted with the item 22 camouflage Benelli shotgun um, that was submitted to uh, the laboratory 
meaning it was actually loaded into the shotgun? Um, when I received it, it was not loaded in the shotgun, um, but this was an unfired shot shell um, as it was submitted. This is the, the shot shell that I test fired in that shotgun. Factory, this item is. Uh, yes, sir. Um, this is also a 12 gauge federal shot shell, and on the um, the shot shell itself, it also says federal premium double lock buck three inch magnum. I direct your attention back to state's item 34. Are those two items consistent with each other? Uh, yes, sir. Um, it does appear that they are consistent um, in construction and um, their head stamp information. If you would, since uh, let's work through the number of firearms that were identified by you. Did you have an opportunity to uh, test those firearms with the projectiles retrieved? Uh, yes, sir, I did. What were your results for item 30, the Mossberg pump action shotgun? Um, in regards to uh, the two shot shells? Correct. Um, uh, my, my results after examining that, it was determined that the item 30 shotgun um, did not fire the items 9 and 10 shot shells. And could you move on to item, uh, your item 31 states item, one moment, I'm sorry, and the item you just referenced was states item 89, the Mossberg shotgun, states item, states exhibit 90, sled item 31. Could you please tell us about that item. Yes, sir. Based on my examination, um, it was, I was able to determine that item 31 was not fired by, excuse me, that item 31 did not fire items 9 and 10. All right, concerning states exhibit 91, your uh, sled item 32, that would be a Benelli Super Black Eagle 2, black in color. Could you tell us your results of that? Yes, sir. Uh, based on my examination, it was determined that item 32 did not fire items 9 and 10. Item 32 uh, was, however, recovered with a, a number of rounds in it. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That is correct. And what were those rounds? Um, those, item 32, uh, the Benelli model Super Black Eagle II shotgun, um, was submitted with two unfired 12-gauge um, shot shells, Federal and Winchester. All right, did you have an opportunity to compare the shot shells with item 22, the camouflage color Benelli Super Black Eagle 3? Yes, sir, I did. All right, and if you would please uh, tell us your findings concerning item 22. Sure. When I compared uh, sled items 9 and 10 with those test shot shells that I fired through the item 22 camouflage shotgun, the results of those comparisons were inconclusive. Um, I was unable to determine whether or not items 9 and 10 were fired by item 22 or if they had been fired by another firearm with similar characteristics. And were you able to eliminate item, <clears throat> item number um, 33 from this, this round of testing concerning the shotgun shells? 
That's correct. The shotgun shells were not fired by the item 33 rifle. Moving on to your results, uh, sorry, moving on to your testing, or did you conduct additional testing of 300 blackout rounds? Yes, sir, I did. And of the cases of the ammunition, both fired, ex expand, so shell casings or unfired ammunition, were the ones we examined today that were retrieved from the scene what, what make and manufacture were they of? The cartridge cases were head stamped with the S&B um, logo and 300 blackout caliber. Did you have an opportunity to test fire and examine uh, sled item 33, states item, states exhibit 88? The PS, uh, the uh, 300 blackout rifle, black in color. Yes, sir, I did. All right. Could you please tell us your results from that examination for that weapon? Um, in regards to test firing the weapon? Correct. Yes, sir. Um, when I examined the item 33, um, I test fired it using the item 34 magazine. That was the magazine that was packaged alongside the rifle. Um, during that test firing, the first available cartridge in the magazine, as I inserted the magazine into the firearm, it was fed and chambered into the rifle um, correctly and as I expected. Um, the cartridge was successfully test fired and then it extracted and ejected from the rifle again as I expected it to. However, as the firearm cycled, uh, meaning when that bolt was coming back forward to load the next available cartridge in the magazine, um, it failed to feed that cartridge into the chamber, and I had to manually cycle it to, to load the next cartridge into the chamber. Um, that issue did not prevent me from test firing uh, the firearm, and no further analysis uh, to determine that cause was uh, conducted. Referencing your results, uh, slide item 128 in your exam, were you able to identify any ca cartridge casings that would have been fired by item 33 rifle? Your item 33 states exhibit 90, um, states exhibit uh, 88. Uh, yes, sir, I was. And just to be clear, we're talking about this 300 blackout rifle. Is that correct? And we're talking about your item 33? Yes, sir. That is uh, the sled item 33 that I examined and test fired. What were you able to identify with the uh, rounds recovered, 300 blackout rounds recovered? Please list their, their item numbers as well. Uh, yes, sir. Um, so I compared all the 300 blackout um, cartridges that I received, and based on my examinations and comparisons, I was able to determine that uh, sled item 38, 109, 110, 121, 126, and 127 were fired by the item 33 rifle. And those would be various items that were recovered that we've been through and identified in the state's exhibits. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. So some of them you, you would say were fired by item 33. That is correct. I know you mentioned before with item 33 or sorry, uh, state's exhibit 89. I'm sorry, <clears throat> state's exhibit um, 88. I know you'd mentioned before that it wasn't working properly. Does that inhibit your ability to test it in any way? Uh, no, sir. I was able to test fire that firearm and uh, recover those test specimens that I needed in order to make those comparisons. Do malfunctions occur in firearms from time to time? Uh, yes, sir. They can occur. But nevertheless, you were able to uh, simulate the fire. You were able to fire the weapon eventually. Yes, sir. I was able to, to test fire the weapon and recover those uh, test specimens that I needed. All right. I'm going to reference sled items 2 through 7, 35 through 37, 39, 108, 111 through 120. Do you understand what, which items I'm referencing? Yes, sir. I do. And how did you compare those, or how did the analysis go when compared with item uh, 33 states, item 88? Uh, yes, sir. Um, when I compared those those items, that was items 2 through 7, 35 through 37, 39, 108, 111 through 120, and 122 through 124, 
and 128 with each other. And when I compare those with those test specimens that um, I fired through item 33, the results of those comparisons were inconclusive. Um, again, that means I was unable to determine if they had been fired by item 33 or they had been fired by another firearm or firearms with similar characteristics. Uh, still on item 33, states, item, states exhibit 88, the recovered 300 blackout rifle. Were you able to um, compare the ejection and extraction marks of various 300 blackout rounds recovered and casings recovered? Yes, sir. And what was your what was your findings concerning some of those items? And please list the items, and we will go back and identify states' exhibits in a minute. Yes, sir. Um, in looking at the mechanism marks on items 111, 114 through 115, 118 through 119, 123, and 128, I was able to determine that those items um, had all been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the item three rifle excuse me, the item 33 rifle at some previous time. All right. Mr. Greer, I'm going to ask you, Your Honor. I'm going to renew my objection to the next uh, opinion that he's about to offer based on our prior rulings, just for the record. Yes, sir. Prior arguments and understanding the court's rule. Yes, sir. Mr. Greer, I'm going to Real quick reference on your chart, on your list, items marked uh, sled items 2 through 7, 35, 36, and 37, and sled item 39. And that would be states exhibits 63 through 68. Just please verify that I've handed you states exhibits 63 through 68 and, and identify if they correlate to items 2 through 7 on your chart. Uh, yes, sir. Um, these states exhibits 63 through 68 are sled items 2 through 7. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as take the court's indulgence. States exhibit 260. States Exhibit 250, which correlates to slide items 35 through 39. Please verify that for me. Yes, sir. This is States Exhibit 260, um, which is a container that is to contain slide items 35 through 39. Okay. <clears throat> slide items 2 through 7. States Exhibit 63 through 68. After a review of the crime scene, um, where were those where were those located? Um, after reviewing the crime scene diagram, it's my understanding that those uh, cartridge cases um, were at marker numbers that were uh, near or around um, the body of Margaret Murdoch. And those would be 300 blackout rounds, is that right? That's correct. That, there are 300 blackout caliber. Or they were spent casings? Yes, sir. Those are uh, fired cartridge cases. And states uh, exhibit 260, items 35 to 39, what are those again? Um, those were um, all fired 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases, um, head stamped with the SMB logo with the, and 300 blackout caliber. And where were those items recovered? Um, listed on our submission documents, um, those were from the ground at side entrance door. Have you physically been there to the Moselle property? Uh, yes, sir, I have. Are you familiar with this, the ground at the side entrance door? Yes, sir, I believe so. Is that the side entrance that leads into the 
pool table in the gun room? Uh, based on my understanding of, of the scene, yes, sir. Um, I believe that is where those were collected from, near that door that goes into that room. We have, we have 300 blackout round casings from collected from around Maggie's body, and we have 300 casings collected from the house. Is that correct? That's correct. And do we have no, do you have any notes? Did you take any contemporaneous notes on the condition of items, your items, 35 to 39, those collected at the side of the house? Um, yes, sir, I do believe so. I'm, I'm going to reference my my case file here to confirm. Would referencing your file help you refresh your memory on that matter? Yes, sir, it would. Um, during my examination, when I looked at items 35 through 39, which were those were recovered um, near that door area, um, I did note that um, they were tarnished and weathered um, in my case file. Mr. Greer, tell us what you found concerning those items. Um, based on my examination, um, it was determined that um, items 2 through 7, um, 35 through 37, and 39 um, had matching mechanism marks, and it was concluded that those items had been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. So if I understand it correctly, the items collected right by Maggie had been extracted, to, loaded into, extracted to, and ejected by the same firearm that were identified that items were picked up by the side of the house. Yes, sir, that is correct. Additional items were collected as well, and did you have an opportunity to analyze those? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And identify the slide item numbers, and then we'll identify the, the uh, state's exhibit numbers. Um, those were slid items number 108, 113, 116, 117, and 122. Handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 261, it's, which includes uh, various uh, items. And what are they again? Uh, yes, sir. This is a container that contains uh, multiple 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases and um, fired 12 gauge shot shells. And in that <clears throat> in that collective bin include 300 blackout rounds uh, of the items you just listed. Yes, sir, that's correct. All right, tell us what your findings were for those items. Um, where, where were these collected? Um, based on the submission documentation, um, those were collected um, from areas such as from to the left of a shooting chair near field, um, from a right corner near field, um, from in front of a shooter's chair under a table. Um, Would you like me to uh, identify each location? For those items, have you had an opportunity to review some uh, body-worn camera footage and evidence and, and kind of identify what that actually meant? Oh, yes, sir. What, what, and generally, when it says left leg and right leg and near the front or back, what is it talking about? Um, it, it appears that there's some type of uh, shooting area um, that those were collected from. Okay. What were your findings concerning those items? Um, it was determined that those items um, and to include items 108, 113, 116, 117, and 122, also had those same matching mechanism marks to conclude that they had been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm as those at the crime scene around Margaret Murdoch's body and those uh, several recovered from the home. So the items collected around Maggie, Margaret Murdoch's body matched the items collected outside the house, which matched items that were collected in the field at the shooting range. Uh, yes, sir. I was able to identify that the cartridge cases uh, recovered items two through seven near the, uh, the body um, did have matching mechanism marks with several of the items from the area around the home and those in the shooting field and several of those in the shooting field to conclude that some of those had been, or excuse me, that those had been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. So 
I'm going to reference slide item 8. That would be states item 250, states exhibit 250. I'm going to put it on the screen. What is that item again? Remind us, please. Um, sled item 8 was one fired bullet um, determined to be 300 blackout caliber listed as near tire impression at marker 8. Recover from the scene? Uh, yes, sir, at marker 8. Is that a fire projectile? Yes, sir, that is a fired bullet. Is that, how much does that bullet weigh? Um, according to um, my notes when I weighed that projectile, um, it weighed approximately 147.4 grains. And you what's marked as Exhibit 213. Remind us again what that is. Stakes Exhibit 213 appears to be an ammunition box um, marked cellular and below and 300 blackout caliber. What are the grains indicated on that box? On the side of this box it has information about the um, the projectile and it says 147 grains on the side. Is item is, is state's exhibit up on the Alamo, is that consistent with a 147 grain projectile? Uh, yes sir, um, that bullet appears to be intact um, and based on um, my examination and looking at these fired bullets as a part of a, an examination, I would say that would be consistent with uh, having being 147 grains. Did you inspect sled item 12? Yes, sir, I did. Tell us your results of that. Sled item 12 was one fired bullet, uh, determined to also be 300, most consistent with being 300 blackout caliber, um, and it was listed as from bedding inside doghouse. And did you have an opportunity to weigh that projectile? Yes, sir, I did. And what was the result of that? Um, when I weighed that projectile, it was approximately 146.8 grains. Is that consistent with a 147 grain unfired ammunition? Yes, sir. I would say that would be consistent with 147 grains. I'm going to show you <coughs> what's been marked as state and evidence as states exhibit 143, 144, 148, and 150. Could you please remove those collectively and let me know if you are familiar with the make and manufacture of those items. Um, State's Exhibit 143 is a 12-gauge um, federal shot shell. It says federal premium double lock buck 3-inch magnum on this shell, on the side of the shell. State's Exhibit 144 is also a 12-gauge federal shot shell. Um, on the side of it, it says federal premium double lock buck. 3-inch magnum. States Exhibit 148 um, is also a 12-gauge federal shot shell. On the side of it, it says federal premium double lock buck 3-inch magnum.
And State's Exhibit 150 is also a 12 gauge federal shot shell um, with the same information of federal premium double lock buck, three inch magnum. Are all of those four exhibits that you just reviewed of the same manufacturer and same make and model? Yes, sir. They appear to um, have the same information and uh, also in their case, excuse me, in their construction as well. If I use one for demonstrative purposes, all the rest are the same? Uh, yes, sir. They appear to be all consistent. Showing you what you just identified. This would be States 143. Is this the item you just looked at, Mr. Greer? Yes, sir. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 34. Remind me again which item that is. Sled item 9. State's Exhibit 34 was sled item 9. That's correct. And what's the make and model of that? Um, sled item 9, State's Exhibit 34, was a fired 12 gauge shot shell. Um, with the federal premium double lock buck three inch magnum red in color. Showing you what's been marked as state's exhibit 399. This would be, yeah, where's, where's item nine from? Um, item nine is listed as from marker nine. And again, based on my understanding of the crime scene uh, document, that was um, near or around the, the speed room. And marked as state's exhibit 399. Sled item 22.7, where is that item from? Um, sled item 22.7, um, State's Exhibit 399, was the unfired 12 gauge shot shell that was originally submitted as item 22 with the camouflage Benelli shotgun. State's item 4, and you've already reviewed this. Exhibit 4 for the state, 22 for you. Is that the same shotgun that you're referring to? <clears throat> yes, sir, this is my item 22 shotgun. Camouflage Benelli Super Black Eagle 3. Is that right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And all those items are of the same model and manufacturer, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, they all appear to have the same uh, head stamp information and information on the side of the shell and their case construction all appears to be consistent. Reference your item 10 now. Well, first, let me collectively hand you what's been marked as State's Exhibits 144, sorry, State's Exhibits 145, 146, 147, and 149 collectively. Please take them out individually, review them. Let me know if you recall what they are. Make and, model, make and manufacture is what I'm interested in. Six exhibit 145, um, it's head stamp Winchester 12 gauge with dry lock 3 inch and a 2 on the shell. States exhibit 146, it's head stamp Winchester 12 gauge. On the shell it says dry lock 3 inch number 2. Sticks Exhibit 147 is head stamp Winchester 12 gauge on the shell dry lock 3 inch number 2. And Sticks Exhibit 149 head stamp Winchester 12 gauge on the shell dry lock 3 inch number 2. You know to indicate where those items were recovered? 
Um, based on the packaging. What is the packaging? Where does the patchy packaging indicate those items were recovered? Um, the packaging for State's Exhibit 145 um, says from a state box on bookshelf and gun room. State's Exhibit 146 says from Kent box on bookshelf and gun room. State's Exhibit 147 says um, from nightstand in Paul's room. And Stakes Exhibit 149 says from a state box on bookshelf and gun room. And hand you what's been marked and identified as States Exhibit 33, slide item 10. Where was that located? Um, sled item 10, um, again, was a fired 12-gauge shot shell, um, head stamp Winchester 12-gauge on the side, dry lock 3-inch number 2, and that was located at marker 10, um, which, again, based on my understanding, was uh, near that feed room. Identify, please, the make and manufacturer of that item. Um, yes, sir. It was uh, head stamp Winchester 12-gauge, uh, and on the shell it says dry lock 3-inch Two. Is that consistent with the making manufacture of all the other items you just reviewed? Yes, it really is. Are those all the items you just reviewed, Mr. Group? Yes, sir. All right, no further questions from the state. We'll take a few minutes break, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Do, do not discuss the case.
Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden. Well, we are covering the case of Alec Murdoch in South Carolina. He is accused of the murder in a brutal way, putting a shotgun to his son's forehead and killing him, and then also killing his wife with another weapon, according to the prosecution. Well, what was the motive? The state says it's his financial motive. It's because he was stealing from clients. He was trying to pay Peter uh, by robbing Paul, and then he was just spending money money hand over fist well in their attempt to do this out of the presence of the jury uh, the judge has been listening to testimony from various victims and one of the victims is uh, Mr. Satterfield now who is he he is the son of Gloria Satterfield she was the longtime 20-year housekeeper she was considered a member of the Murdoch family in 2018 she was found at the bottom of the steps uh, at the same place that the the killings occurred uh, according to uh, the Murdochs, the dog, one of the dogs uh, tripped her and then she died in the hospital several days later. Well, there was a civil suit, but unfortunately, the money, over $4 million, never got to Satterfield's son. But why don't we listen to one of those sons on the stand this morning in front of the jury? As time went on, did you have conversations with Alec asking him about the case and what was going on with the case or anything like that? Uh, yes, not very rarely, but every few months or so. Right. And what would he tell you just generally over the um, months? First, it was hard, hard, and he knows why it was making progress, and they kind of left it in that. You said it, it was hard, but they were making progress? Yes. Did he tell you anything about whether or not you and your brother were get any money? Uh, the medical he bills were paid? said he was hoping. Right. Did he give you an idea, any idea of the amount? Uh, if I remember correctly, one time he said he was trying to get each of you at least $100,000 a piece. Each of each of you, you yes. and your brother. Yes. Okay. Um, at some point in time, did your family advise you that there was some media reporting about a settlement in the case? Yes. All right. And at that time, had you heard anything from Alec or Corey or Chad or anybody about a settlement in the case? No. All right. And what if anything did you do after your family? Did they ask you to do anything? Uh, yeah. They said you might want to kind of follow up on it and kind of see. Right. And did you make a phone call to Alec? Uh, yes. And what month was that in? Uh, I believe the last time I talked to him was in June of 21. June of 21? Yes. Around the time of the murders? Yes. And what did you ask him? Uh, I can't believe what I asked him, but um, it was still making progress and be ready to settle, you know, by the end of the year. He told you it was still making progress and he was hoping to settle by the end of the year? Yes. Did he tell you that they had already gotten a settlement for $505,000? No. Did he tell you that they had already gotten a settlement for $3.8 million? No. Had he ever told you that there was an umbrella policy for $5 million? No. Did he ever mention to you anything about Forge? No. Did he mention anything to you about structuring any settlement? No. Did you give him permission to steal your money? No. Ultimately, in the wake of all of this, You've come to find out that there was a settlement for $505,000, correct? Uh, yes. And it was diverted by Alec Murdoch, correct? Yes. And ultimately, you've come to find out that there was a settlement under the umbrella policy uh, for $3.8 million, is that yeah. correct? Yes. Or thereabouts, correct? Yes. And a large portion of that was diverted by Alec Murdoch, is that right? Yes. Did you ever get one cent from Alec Murdoch when he was still, uh, before all of this happened? No. And it took, after this happening, and it took a legal process for that to happen. Is that right? Yes. And ultimately, is it your understanding that he confessed judgment to taking money for both of those? Is that yes. right? In June of 2021, you made a call to him asking the status of this case. Is that correct? Uh, I can't remember if he called me or if I called him, but yes, I talked to him in June 2021. You talked to him in June of 2021? Yes. And there were reports in the media about that settlement, correct? Yes. Joining me to discuss this testimony and more, our own Gigi McKelvey, who has been down inside that courtroom. Gigi, good afternoon, and I, I can't wait to ask you this question. I know Tony Satterfield was not testifying in front of the jury, but what happened in the courtroom? How are people feeling about when this young man did testify that, that Alec Murdoch stole over $4 million from him and his brother, and he was then ejected, by the way, his trailer that he lived in was foreclosed about, uh, on depravity? 
Yeah, it's unbelievable. And you think about, you know, over two decades, she dedicated to this family, helped raise the boys. They called her Go-Go. And of all people, after she died on their property, he stole millions of dollars from her two boys who she probably spent less time with because of her job raising helping raise Paul and Buster, as well as working around the house. People were shocked and disgusted by that. Yeah, and, and when he got off the stand uh, and he's walking out, what was the reaction of the courtroom, even if the jury wasn't there? Well, yeah, the jury wasn't present, but, you know, I think everybody felt very proud of him. He got up there and, and stated the facts. He did not seem intimidated sitting with Alec Murdoch facing him. I think everybody just felt some some pride for that kid he did a great job that that is just wonderful i know his attorney said that uh, was on a lunch break and said he didn't have to go on after him because he did such a good job and i think we were all like with our our mouths agog and said wow wow this is fabulous that he was able to do that but there's been more happening in the courtroom with the firearms expert mr greer on the stand has he made a connection to any of the guns around the property or that may have been around the property since the actual killing weapon at least the 300 blackout has not been found we did finally hear the answer to that and it is yes the, the the casings found around maggie murdoch's body match some of the older casings found all over the property so that means that shell casings found on the gun range right by the house and around maggie's body were likely fired from the same weapon so we know at least now likely one of the very own murdoch uh guns was used to kill maggie and that is, alone is horrifying. And then I also, I think I heard some testimony that there was a shotgun shell, a buckshot, and a birdshot, uh, the ones, the, the shells that were used to kill uh, Paul, that indeed there's another item that this examiner couldn't tell whether or not uh, that was owned by the Murdochs, whether it was the murder weapon for Paul? Right. It was just undetermined. He was not able to certainly say that that shotgun shell had been fired from a shotgun that he had possession of and test fired there at the sled lab. But with Maggie, he was able to determine, in fact, those were the same shell casings ejected from the same gun. And, and Gigi, I have to ask you this question now, uh, because his presence, Mr. Greer, is in front of this jury. How is the jury reacting to what he is telling them? Yeah, they were very engaged. They, I, don't, I didn't see anybody nod off. This is the time of day where jurors tend to get a little sleepy after lunch, but not today. They were hanging on every word, especially when it got to the results of going through the motions of identifying all of the uh, pieces of evidence. But when he gave his results, all eyes were on him. Uh, amazing, Gigi McKelvey. I know you have to get ready to go back into the White House, as we're calling it, because while they, they're on a little yes. bit of an afternoon break, they will be continuing that testimony so the state can seek to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Alec Murdoch was responsible horrendously, I may say, for the murders of his wife and his child. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. And staying with me here, uh, joining me, waiting uh, patiently, uh, Michael Korobonix, uh, a Jersey boy, one of the great trial lawyers in New Jersey. I met Mike in federal court one day. We shared the same client for about 30 seconds until uh, he was, I was nice enough to take over from him. And joining us for the first time, uh, Christopher Adams. He is from South Carolina, right there in the heart of things. So I have to bring the two of you on. I'm going to ask you both the same questions. Mike Korobonix, you were listening to this with me on a Friday afternoon. Now, you just heard Gigi say the jury is hanging on every word. How about you? What do you think the effect this has on the jury about the shotgun shells and or the bullet casings being ejected from the same weapon that killed uh, Maggie Murak? I, I think it's interesting to see how it's going to work out because, quite frankly, as was mentioned, it only said likely. We're in a criminal case where you have to prove elements of the crime beyond the reasonable doubt. I, I don't really think this has a lot of substance because it only shows a likelihood. Cause we have no and that now is needed. Bring the jury.
Sir, cross examination. Just want to see if we can agree on one thing, and that is you're not here to tell this jury that any of the weapons in this room were used, in your opinion, to murder Maggie or Paul, correct? Uh, based on my examination of uh, the evidence, um, I had, was able to identify that there were um, matching mechanism marks in items around, um, that's my friend, the body of Maggie Murdoch and um, other areas of the property. And in regards to the two shot shells in comparison with those uh, shotguns, um, items 9 and 10 were inconclusive with the item 22 shotgun. So that means you, you cannot and you did not and you are not offering an opinion that item 22 shotgun was used to murder Paul Murdoch, correct? My result was inconclusive, um, and what that ultimately means is I'm not able to determine that. It's, it's a possibility that it could have been fired by that shotgun, and it also could have been another firearm with similar characteristics. Meaning it's just equally possible it wasn't that gun. That's possible. And this 300 blackout. We know a 300 blackout was used to murder Maggie Murdoch, correct? Um, based on um, the evidence that I received, I did have um, several um, projectiles that were 300 blackout caliber um, that were most consistent with that, as well as several cartridge cases that were head stamped that caliber. And you're not here to tell this jury, in your opinion, that this 300 blackouts laying on the floor here was used to murder Maggie Murdoch, correct? Um, the results of the comparisons of those cartridge cases, um, items two through seven, um, with test fires from that uh, item 33 rifle were also inconclusive, uh, meaning it's, um, I was unable to determine if those cartridge cases were fired by item 33 or they've been fired by another firearm. Well, how many shot, how many cartridges were found at the murder scene of 300 blackouts? Do you remember? Um, based on my understanding of the crime scene, um, I believe I was only submitted items two through seven. Um, so that would be six uh, fired 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases. Um, and again, I, I was not at the scene um, to recover those. That's just what was submitted to, to me and based on my understanding of, of the, the evidence. Okay. I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to stay on the 300 blackout for a moment. And I'm going to show you what we marked as uh, Defendant's Exhibit 69. Excuse me? Just what I previously Yeah. And, um, and, and you have your file there, but take a look at Defendant 69 and see, tell us if you recognize that document as coming from your firearms file. Report, excuse me, extended report. Uh, yes, sir. This um, state's exhibit. Defendant's exhibit. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Defendant's exhibit 69 um, does appear to be a copy of um, two pages from my case file. Thank you. Your Honor, we would move defendant's exhibit 69 in the evidence. I believe without objection. Not objection. So admitted. Yeah. I Uh, this is page number 67 and 68. We're going to pull it up on the screen. And, and while we're doing that, um, Agent Greer, is this your worksheet for the 300 blackout that's here in the courtroom? 
and sled item 33, which bears state's exhibit number 88. Uh, yes, sir. That would be a, a, a copy of my worksheet for sled item 33. Okay. And this is the, this is the item that you're not prepared to tell the jury here that, in your opinion, was not used to murder Maggie Murdoch. Um, based on my examination of the cartridge cases, or several of those cartridge cases that were recovered from all the locations, um, the results of those comparisons were inconclusive. I'm unable to determine if they were fired by that firearm or by another firearm or firearms with those similar characteristics. But you did test fire this uh, item 33, correct? Yes, sir, I did. And um, on the second page of Exhibit 69, um, Doug, if you'll pull up the description of what happened, and if you'll tell the jury what problems you encountered when you test fired item 33, which is State's Exhibit 88. Yes, sir. Um, during the test firing, um, I loaded the magazine um, with cartridges. Um, that was sled item 34. And I inserted that into the magazine well of the sled item 33, the rifle. Um, I chambered the first available cartridge into the firearm and fired it. Um, that went as expected. Um, the cartridge was fired. It extracted and ejected from that firearm properly. Um, however, as that bolt was going back forward, um, I would have expected it to pick up the next available cartridge from the magazine. However, it didn't and I had to manually cycle that bolt again to load the next available cartridge from the magazine. Um, that issue did not prevent me from test firing it and I was able to um, collect those test specimens that I needed um, and no further analysis to determine the cause of that was conducted. So when you say you had to manually, it says as a firearm cycle the next available cartridge in the magazine failed to feed in the chamber. So then you had to manually do it. How, how do you manually do it? Uh, yes, sir. On the, um, the top of the firearm, there's a charging handle. Um, I had to pull back on that charging handle, which in turn pulls that bolt backwards. And when I did that and released it, it was able to then go forward on its own and pick up the next cartridge from that magazine that was inserted into the firearm. Okay. And you had to do, do that every time you fired um, Exhibit 88, is that correct? Yes, sir, I believe so. During my test firing, um, I did have that phenomenon occur. So is it fair to say Exhibit 88, item 33, was malfunctioning when you tested it? Um, it did not uh, work as I expected it to. Um, I would have expected it to, to fire um, and load that next cartridge as it should. Um, however, when we're test firing these firearms, um, we're holding them in different ways because we're test firing them in a bullet a recovery tank, which at the time was a, a vertical tank filled with water. So I had to hold it in kind of a, a strange position. Um, but it, through all my test firing, I did have this situation occur. Um, but again, no other testing to determine why that um, was happening um, was conducted. And I was able to test fire that gun and collect those test specimens. And and is it fair to say you were not able to rapid fire, pull the trigger, pull the trigger, pull the trigger, and shoot uh, bullets in immediate succession? Um, during my testing, I had to, to manually load that next cartridge in. So it just took the amount of time that it would take me to, to do that step, if you will. Instead of the firearm performing that function for me, I had to do it. Um, and, and, and that's what I did in this case. Okay. And then, um, all right. Were, were you able to get the um, projectile out of the water tank and compare it to the two projectiles found at the murder scene, I believe? I don't know if it's item eight or. As part of your analysis, did you compare ejectiles from item 33 to the projectiles found at the scene? Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. I did collect those test fired bullets from our water tank and I did compare that um, where appropriate with the fired um, projectiles that were submitted. And did you reach any conclusions based upon that projectile comparison? 
Um, yes, sir, I did. And what were those conclusions? Um, based on the observable physical characteristics of items 8 and 12, um, those are sled items 8 and 12, I determined those to be most consistent with 300 blackout caliber. Um, item 8 um, may be suitable for identification with other evidence. And item 12 sustained damage, um, and it was unsuitable for identification with other evidence. Um, that means that due to the damage that it had sustained, um, there were no identifying identifying features that I saw under the microscope that I would use for identification purposes. Um, I also received several other um, projectiles and fragments that I compared to the item 33 rifle. Um, due to damage in their size, the caliber calibers items 11, 66, and 137 could not be determined. They were just too small for me to um, make any determination about their, their caliber. Um, Due to damage and the limited marks of value that I saw on item 11, specifically the fired bullet jacket fragment and the item 66 fired bullet jacket fragments, I was concluded that those may or may not be suitable for identification and used and compared those later on to the rifle. Um, based on um, the no marks of value that were displayed on the item 11 bullet jacket fragments, item 11 piece of lead and item 66 pieces of lead, um, though I determined those were unsuitable. So again, due to uh, there being no marks of value for me to compare, I was unable to, uh, to compare those with those test bullets. Um, item 137 bore some type of strided marking. However, I was unable to determine the origin of those marks and, and use those for a, an identification purpose. And um, it was determined that it was also unsuitable. Um, lastly, the uh, three items that I did compare with those test specimens that fired from those rifle, which were item 8, the item 11 fired bullet jacket fragment, and the item 66 fired bullet jacket fragments, the results of those comparisons were also inconclusive um, with each other and with those test specimens. And that was due to damage and just insufficient markings for us to base our opinion on. Um, it could not be determined where whether those items were fired by item 33 or by another firearm or firearms with similar characteristics. So exhibit 250 is the projectile that was found by marker 8, I believe. Let's confirm that one with Lucy. Yes, sir, that is correct. Um, States Exhibit 250 was sled item 8 um, near tire impression at marker 8. That's correct. And I, I believe you just, as you're reading from your report, told the jury that, that you couldn't make any conclusions about the projectile seized at the scene from the projectiles fired in a water tank from this 300 blackout laying on the floor in here. Is that right? That's correct. The results of those comparisons were inconclusive, so I'm unable to determine if item 8 was fired by the rifle or by another firearm with similar rifling characteristics. Well, aren't, aren't the rifling marks on a projectile as it goes through the barrel more reliable when making firearm identifications than, than most any other tool marks that you rely upon? I wouldn't say they're more reliable. We do uh, rely on the rifling in that barrel to, to mark those projectiles, and that's what gives those markings on the, or puts those markings on those bullets. So we're able to look at them and do a, a firearms identification examination on them. Um, d tools, firearms, all mark evidence. Um, again, I was unable to do that in this case, and our, my results were inconclusive. I mean, that's due to the damage that these may have sustained and to just insufficient markings that, uh, that were on the bullet when I looked at it. There was not enough of those markings on there for me to determine if they were fired by item 33. But the item 8, exhibit 250 there, um, do you recall whether there was human organic matter on that projectile when it was recovered? Um, let me refer to my notes. Um, I don't have um, documented in my notes that there was any farm material or trace on it as I received it. But uh, we know that I, that projectile was recovered at the murder scene. 
at marker 8. Is that right? Near the tire. Yes, sir. Near the tire and person at marker 8. That's correct. And you made comparisons of projectile, excuse me, of, of shell cartridges, the back end of, of, the, of the full bullet that were, that were collected at the shooting house on the property at Moselle. Um, did you not? I don't have the numbers, but we went through them a moment ago. You did. Let me ask you to take a look at the projectiles that were found. I believe they're items, well, nope. They are items 108 through 125. I'm not sure what their state exhibit numbers are, but, but if you look at 108 through 125 in your report, those are uh, spent 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases. Uh, sled items 108 through 125 uh, was determined all to be fired 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases. And in your report it references left of shooting chair near field, right front corner, um, etc. Maybe you don't know, but um, well, are you aware those were collected at a gun house at a firing range on the property? Um, yes, yes, sir. And I'm going to back up. I misspoke earlier. It's 108 through 124 are the 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases. But based on my understanding of everything, yeah, there was some type of shooting um, field or stand that um, I believe those were collected from, and that kind of seems to coincide with the item descriptions, which is what I'm familiar with. Okay. And, and were you aware that when you're sitting in the shooting house and you're you know, target practicing that there was a earthen burn? That the shots were fired into? No, sir. I've never seen this area. Okay. Would it have been helpful to your analysis if the investigators had dug out um, items from that earthen burn of the projectiles, such as what's sitting in front of you as States Exhibit 250? We're able to look at bullets. Um, that are submitted. Um, we don't have any type of restraint. Um, it may have been helpful. Um, bullets, as we've seen here, um, come to us in all shapes and <coughs> sizes due to their damage that may have, they may have sustained. Um, so I'm, unable, I'm unable to really answer that question without seeing the evidence and determining if it would be helpful. Okay. I want to ask you um, a little more about the conclusions that you've reached as uh, documented in your report. And I'm particularly uh, focused on item 128, and I'm still talking about the uh, Buster 300 blackout that's laying on the floor here in the courtroom. And just, just so we're clear, there were items, the cartridges that we talked about, the back end of the bullet, that you were able to conclude that they were fired, they were fired by this gun, right? Yes, sir. I was able to determine in looking at the totality of the marks on those cartridge cases that there were items submitted to me um, have been fired by that firearm. And, and your conclusion that, that they've been fired by this gun, um, the, and we're talking about the cartridges, one is cartridge 38, which is up by the residence, correct? Yes, sir. Slid item 38, that's my understanding. Um, and it was submitted as being recovered from um, near a door. Well, and that's the door that you testified that you saw when you went on the property. Yes, sir. I believe so. That's my understanding. And, and so, um, it's been a long week two weeks, but there was a sled agent early in the case who had body cams going around picking up sheriff spent shell cartridges adjacent to that door, and you believe this is one of those, correct? 
Um, that's my understanding that those items came from the area outside that gun room door. And you concluded that 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 item 38, along with some other items found at the shooting house, which would be, um, well, 109 and 110, you concluded. Where, where 109 and 110 found? Yeah, that's the shooting range, correct? Uh, yes, sir. As submitted to the lab, collected item 109 was collected from right front corner near field, and item 110 was in front of shooter's chair under table, table near field. Okay. And so, one spent cartridge found next to the door up at the house, main residence at Moselle, and then you've got five uh, found at the shooting range that you say, in your opinion, were fired by this gun. Yes, sir, that is my opinion. But then you've also, also matched other cartridges, according to your report, items 111, 114, 115, 18, 19, 123, and it says 128 um, in your report that you say were loaded into, extracted, and ejected from this rifle. That's correct. But you don't say they were fired from this rifle. That's correct. But there were spent shell casings found at the shooting range, correct? Yes, sir. And, and those were fired cartridge cases, in it, and it's just plain term. They had been fired. Um, when I'm looking at the totality of all these markings, again, we go back to the, those five areas that we're really going to look at. Um, the marks that I saw that were in agreement that I made that uh, conclusion and based my opinion on um, were those ejector or uh, lug and extractor marks and that's um, not what detonated that primer. So that's the difference there. So we know those marks can occur when that cartridge or fire cartridge case is cycling through there, but that's not what um, detonated that cartridge, and, and that's the difference in, in that result. Yes, sir. Well, let's look at it from the other side of the coin. So you're saying that the breach marks on the primer, where the firing pin hit the primer, did not match up. Um, item rifle 33, the, the breech marks on the firing pin didn't match up on these uh, spent cartridges. 111, 114, 15, 118, 119, 123, 128. Um, no, sir. Um, when I, I did compare all of these cartridge cases to each other and with those test cartridge cases fired from it, um, those items 111, 114, 115, 118, 119, 123, and 128 um, due to insufficient corresponding markings on those on that primer and in those breach face marks I was unable to determine if they were all fired by item 33 or by another firearm or firearms with similar characteristics. I did examine those and the results of those comparisons were inconclusive. So you're saying it, you, you didn't you're, you're not telling the jury they don't match, it's just you couldn't match them. They're inconclusive. The, my results of those um, comparisons are inconclusive, yes, sir. Okay. And then you also, in your report, reached the same, um, you, you conclude that it's inconclusive on whether item 33 states exhibit 88 um, are you saying it's inconclusive whether item 33 exhibit 88 fired two through seven that's correct are you saying it's inconclusive as to whether item 33 which is exhibit states 88 um, at some point in time loaded and ejected extracted from item 33? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Well, we just talked about there's a difference between firing and then cyc cycling and <coughs> extracting. Yes, sir. Two marks? Yes, sir. Did, did, you look at, did you look at State's Exhibit 88 to see if 
the extraction marks match, matched up to items two through seven? Um, based on the evidence that I received, um, I was able to determine that items two through seven um, had those matching mechanism marks with um, items 35 through 37, 39, 108, 113, 116 through 117, and 122 um, to conclude that those items have been loaded into, extracted, and edited from the same firearm at some previous time. But you can't identify the fire, the firing firearm, the gun. Um, right, correct. In terms of being fired by, I was able to determine that several items had been fired by that rifle, and the results of those comparisons um, with the other items, items 2 through 7, 35 through 37, 39, 108, 111 through 120, 122 through 124, and 128. Um, those comparisons with each other and those test cartridge cases fired by the item 33 rifle were inconclusive. And so, um, let's see if I can understand what you're talking about with regard to your conclusions on that items two through seven, which were shell casings found at, near Maggie's body and other spent cartridges found around the Mobile house and at the shooting range, you conclude that they were loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. That's correct. And for those, I, I guess we have the same issue. You, you looked at the primer, the breech marks on the primer, and you couldn't make any conclusions on those, right? When I looked at the, um, the primer area where those breech face and firing pin impressions are, um, the results of, of including that in a fire by result were inconclusive. Um, and that, that is the results for items 2 through 7, and 35 through 37, 39, 108, 111 through 120, 122 through 124, and 128. And, and again, aren't the breech marks in the firing pin, aren't those more reliable than extractor marks when you're doing an analysis? Um, during the, the marking of these specimens, if you will, through firing, um, the machining process to, to create those firearms, um, we, we see tool marks on fire cartridge cases and fire bullets um, from multiple different processes. Um, I can't say that one's more reliable to mark than the other. Um, it's, it's all due to the machining process and also um, due to the individual wear and tear of that firearm through use of it um, and repetitive use or abuse of the firearm. That can also add to the markings in each or of those locations that we're looking at, whether it be something from the breech face from the firing pin, um, those extractors and ejectors, or even the rifling in the barrel. All of those um, variables can play into those markings and um, and how we see those and how they reproduce on our evidence and how um, individual they are to each gun. Well, that, that does bring me to another point. It, isn't your opinion based upon conclusion that every 300 blackout manufactured in the world, whether it's put together by John Bedingfield or mass assembled at Palmetto State Armory or anywhere in the world that each one when they um, cycle a bullet through and inject it will produce its own unique like no other in the world its own unique tool mark in that in that what your opinion is based on again during that the manufacturing of, of these um, components. Is, that, is that a yes or no um, I would like to explain it a little more your Honor, can possible. I get a yes or no and then an explanation You're objecting. You can answer the question. Restate the question. Isn't your opinion based upon the the presumption, or the or the basis of your opinion is that every 300 blackout manufacturer in the world produces its own unique set of tool marks when it cycles a bullet through? Yes or no? Uh, I would like to answer that with a little bit of explanation, if possible. 
Your Honor, I would appreciate a yes or no, and he can explain all day long. If you can answer yes or no, you must answer yes or no, then explain. Can you repeat the question one more time? I apologize. Is it your opinion, in this case, about the shell cartridges being fired from the same 300 block out, isn't that based upon your presumption that each 300 blackout manufacturer in the world makes unique tool marks when it cycles a bullet and ejects it? And it's hard to say. I have not looked at every 300 blackout. Um, that's in the world. So it's hard to answer that question, but but again, based on my, my knowledge of, of that process and how they're made, I'm able to, to support my answer um, without but, answering it uh, in a yes or no manner, I suppose. But, but you're saying you, you, you found shells here, shells, cartridges here, cartridges there, cartridges at the murder scene, and, and they all have uh, very I mean, it, not all the marks are identical, but enough marks are close enough to being identical. In your opinion, they were fired by one weapon in the world. Um, it's my opinion that those um, had all been cycled through the same firearm at one point in time. Yes, sir. Um, but not fired by the same firearm. Uh, no, sir. That's not what my my uh, my conclusions say. Um, the as far as being fired by that firearm or by the same gun. Uh, those results are inconclusive. So that means that the markings on the breech, because they were all fired, they all have a fire pin hitting the primer, and you call that breech markings, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Those are breech face markings um, that we would see on the primer. And there were dissimilar dissimilarities between those where you couldn't reach a conclusion. That's correct. Those uh, shared, again, those same class characteristics. Um, so we, were, we compared those to each other. Um, Based on our comparisons, um, that's correct. There were not enough. Um, there's not enough agreement. There was insufficient agreement there for me to reach a conclusion um, based on uh, my training and experience and looking at all of these cartridge cases that I could say that they were um, fired by the same firearm, and that's how we arrived at that conclusion. And um, can you say when those? Um Two markings were made on the, or when the, scratch that. Is there any way to determine, for you to determine, uh, um, when the shell casings, cartridges, were cycled and ejected in this one firearm that's unique to all others in the world? Like, I, I can I cannot date um, when those were fired or when those were loaded into, extracted, and ejected from a firearm. No, sir. I cannot put a a time stamp, if you will, on that, yes, sir. And, and you can't state whether it was a 300 blackout assembled in um, 2016, given for Christmas gift, or if it was a replacement given in 2017 or 2018. I mean, you don't know what year the gun was that cycled and ejected. That's correct. I do not have knowledge on the year of manufacture of these firearms. Okay. Now let's move on to the um, shotguns, and you were uh, clear a few things up. You were you were shown a lot of um, items that were taken un unfired. Shot shells, and this is 12 gauge. I'm going to show you exhibit 143, 144, 145, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way to 15. I'm, I'm not going to ask you to take these out, but, but I want you to um, take a look at all those and tell me when those were seized or taken in the evidence in this case. Okay. 
Um, I do see a date on the packaging. Um, some of these packages are ripped right through it. Um, that states 9-13-21. Okay. And so you, you understand that is June, July, July, three months after these murders, right? Uh, yes, sir. That uh, September 13th would be several months after the murders, yes, sir. And that those were seized at different places around the property? Uh, yes, sir. According to uh, the information here, um, it appears they were from, from different locations um, that and where they were collected from. Yes, sir. Okay. And, um, and I guess you don't know whether, I mean, the property of Moselle was open to Alec Murdoch, I mean, from June till September, as far as you know, right? I have no knowledge of, of that, no, sir. And if he had the mind to, he could go out and remove it. Every, every shotgun shell on the whole property, right? I have no knowledge of how the, uh, the scene was maintained. Right. Well, it would appear that no one removed any shotgun shells since you have them there in your lap, right? Um, it, it does appear that these were collected um, from these areas listed on the package on September 13, or I assume as September 13 as it's dated. Um, and labeled by the uh, the person who collected these. Okay. Um, let me show you. Exhibit 63 and 6, and what I marked is Exhibit 63 and 64. And these are pages 51 and 55 from your report. And will you just confirm this for me? 63, 64, pages 51 and 55 from your report. Um, yes, sir, I do recognize um, Defendant's Exhibit 63 um, appears to be a copy of uh, an Item 10 worksheet for the um, fire shot shell. And Defendant's Exhibit 64 um, appears to be a copy of my worksheet for sled item 14, which were uh, 24 birdshot pellets. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to introduce in the evidence Defendant 63 and 64 in this time. Okay. And, and just, uh, Doug, if you'll pull up 63, which is page 51 of the report, and, and Agent Greer, will you tell the jury? Um, what this is? Uh, yes, this is just a copy of one of our standard worksheets that we use to document evidence in the laboratory. Um, so this is an ammunition and cartridge case worksheet, which is why I utilized it when I was um, documenting the item 10 uh, fired shot shell. And this contains um, my notes that I took on that that item. Okay, and, and just so that we're clear, are we talking about Exhibit 33? This is the black colored shot shell that was found in the feed room where Paul Murdoch was murdered? Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. Um, State Exhibit 33 is uh, the item we're discussing. And and you you have a name under notes. It says on shot shell, it says, quote, dry lock, three inch, two. You see that 
Yes, sir, I do. You see that done? Can you highlight that? Thank you. And, um, and again, um, the exhibit there, it, and that's what you're talking about, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And uh, number two is the size of the pellet? Uh, yes, sir, that would uh, refer to the size of the, the pellets or bird shot that was, um, that we would believe to have been loaded into that cartridge, or that shot shell, excuse me. Okay. And then um, if you'll go to exhibit 64, page 55, Doug, and it's 55 in, in your report, um, Agent Greer. And are these the um, pellets that were provided to you to an, analyze the, the number two size pellets? Uh, yes, sir. Sled item 14, um, I determined to be 24 birdshot pellets, and those were listed as um, being from dog food storage room. Okay. And, and if you'll look at under the caliber, it says number two, and it says steel. These were steel pellets, were they not? Uh, based on my uh, examination and based on uh, my observation, um, yes, sir, they were magnetic. Um, so that would, uh, that would provide that they had some steel in them, yes, sir. And, um, and birdshot can either be steel or lead, I suspect. Maybe there's a third kind. Um, there, there can be multiple different um, metals used in, in making pellets. Um, lead is, is one, steel is one. There's, there are also other metals that can be used um, in making pellets, yes, sir. Have you analyzed any of the um, Winchester dry locks that were seized in September? of 2021 to see whether they're steel or lead? No, sir, I have not um, analyzed the, their contents. Okay. Now, here you've got um, Exhibit 64. Uh, you've got grain weight. And I'm, why don't you explain um, what you're referring to? Oh, I, I, I guess I needed, um, I'm missing a page for that. So if, if you'll if you look, look at your page 54 in your file because I it says continued from Wade and, and I guess that's on page 54 is that right um, no sir that's just referencing from the weight category that's um, kind of the top portion of the page okay. um, I just continued my thoughts down below well so help me out here you say there's five pellets weigh 3.4 grams and then 18 pellets only weighed 3.6 grams. How, how does that work? Um, I weighed each of those pellets individually. And again, we're weighing in grains. And um, when I weighed those on our scale, um, that is what I documented. Five of them weighed 3.4, and that should be um, a piece. Um, 18 of them e each weighed 3.6 grains, and one pellet weighed 3.8 grains. Okay. So the, the total of them all together was um, approximately 86.4 grains. Great. Thank you for explaining that. Um, you also weighed the grains of, um, of the 300 blackout projectiles. And you don't have that in front of, the, front of us right here, but did you not weigh the grains there? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And you got it to tell us what they were. I have my notes here. I believe you said 147 grains. States Exhibit 50, which is your item 8 on your report. Uh, yes, sir. When I weighed sled item 8, which was one fired bullet, um, it was approximately 147.4 grains. And are you familiar with how 300 blackout ammunition is sold, what weight classes there are? Um, I don't know all of the, the weight, different weights of, that are within that caliber, no, sir. Do you know there's like a subsonic and then supersonic? Um, again, I don't know everything about that caliber. Um, there are various weights that bullets are sold in for each caliber, um, so I would not be surprised at other grain weights, but I don't know um, all of them off the top of my head today. So. You I mean, as far as you know, the only weight you could ever get is 147 grains, right? Um, the, I, when I weighed these items, item 8 and item 12, 
Um, they weighed approximately 147. mentioned in your testimony that um, item 32 which is exhibit 91 had a Winchester and a federal um, 12 gauge shotgun shells in here do you remember that uh, yes, sir, they did have um, two unfired 12 gauge shot shells submitted with it. That's correct. But you did more than that when you testified shortly ago. You said one was a Winchester and one was a federal, I believe. Uh, yes, sir. One is a federal uh, premium heavyweight TSS, and one is a 12 gauge uh, Winchester Longbeard XR, I believe. Oh. The Winchester is not a dry lock, correct? Um, no, sir. The, the markings on, on that shell said a long beard XR. Nope. And um, the Winchester found the murder scene is a dry lock, correct? Uh, the item the 10 shot shell, which was recovered from marker 10, which um, I do believe my understanding is that around the, the body of Margaret Murdoch was a Winchester 12 gauge shell um, and it says dry lock on it. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. And then item 22, which is the gun that Alec Murdoch, Murdoch came down, was holding or was leaning up against his Suburban when Deputy Daniel Green arrived. Um, that was you understand loaded with a 12 gauge and a 16 gauge shell correct when I received it um, it was unloaded um, but I did receive a 12 gauge shell and a 16 gauge shell that's correct and if you fire a 16 gauge shell and a 12 gauge shotgun what's likely to happen um, that's something that I have not uh, done um, so I'm unable to answer that question is it dangerous to do such a thing um, as a firearms examiner, I would recommend um, shooting the ammo that your firearm is chambered for. Um, I can't predict what would happen if you shot that shot shell or attempted to. All right. You, you spoke of this uh, review process at SLED with regard to, to your tool mark analysis and, and, and you said you, you do your analysis, you look at things under a microscope and you type up a report? Uh, yes, sir. I look at um, the evidence, um, reach a conclusion and, and write or type those conclusions, yes, sir. And then a reviewer, someone um, and in this case, what was the name? Initial CW? Um, the reviewer was uh, Chad Smith, another examiner within our department. Is, is he uh, uh, on the same level with, with you at SLED? Um, he is also um, an examiner. Um, I don't know his classification, but he has been employed in the department um, longer than I have uh, completing firearms examination. Okay. And and then he, he looks at it, but does he prepare an independent report and then flips the two over and see if they match, or does he just take a look at it, come up with his thoughts, and then look at your document to see if he agrees with it? Um, he does not prepare an independent report, um, no. He does look at the evidence and arrive at those conclusions, um, and, and he would read my, my results. If he agrees with them, um, then he will sign off on this conclusion. If he disagrees with them, um, then there's also a, a procedure for that to, to happen. Now, now, you mentioned that in order to make an identification or a match, or you have to have a certain number of 
similar or is it similar or identical characteristics? Um, in order to make an identification, we want to see uh, sufficient agreement between the, char the individual characteristics. Um, there's not a certain number um, that I use as we use a, a, a series, or excuse me, a method called pattern matching. And we're looking at, under the microscope, all these tiny striations and impressions and looking at the surface contours of those two tool marks with each other. And we're looking at those individual peaks and ridges and comparing those under high magnification in order to, to make an identification. Um, and based on that, um, through our training and, and experience of doing this job, we look at thousands of, of comparisons, and er, excuse me, conduct thousands of comparisons. Um, during that time, we, we look at things that match each other that we know um, have been fired from the same gun or made by the same tool, and we look at things that have been um, fired by separate guns and see if there's any agreement or disagreement. And we look at thousands of these uh, cartridge cases and bullets and tool marks in order to, um, to learn what that sufficient agreement um, is to make our identification. Okay, and you, you, you gave this jury an analogy like a ladder and that you have to get up so many steps as you reach. The first step, I guess, would be rifle or shotgun, right? And then the second step would be caliber of rifle if we're talking about a rifle, and then you keep going up the ladder. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. We're going to look at those class characteristics. So we're going to determine if, you know, one, if they're the same caliber. Um, do they share the same rifling specifications if they're a fired bullet? Um, if they are, then we can compare those. If, for instance, if a bullet has five lands and groove and it's going to the right, and we compare that to another bullet that has six lands and grooves and it's uh, going to the left, then we know those did not come out the same barrel, so there's no need to do it in a, any type of comparison there. Um, however, if we look at two that have those same uh, lands and grooves, those five lands and grooves, and they're all going to the right, they're the same caliber, then, then we'll go up that ladder, if you will, and compare those um, individual characteristics to see um, if they were fired by the same firearm or not. Tell this jury how many steps of that ladder you have to go up before you can make an identification. As far as making an identification, um, it's based on the marks that what we see um, under the microscope. Um, when we're looking at all of these marks, we want to see that sufficient agreement. Again, um, we want to see enough agreement so that what is there is better than anything, any agreement that we've seen in tool marks that have been created by different tools. And that's, um, that's learned on the job, doing this, um, doing practicals that I did in training, looking at thousands of comparisons of things that I've test fired, um, that I know were fired from the same gun, looking at things that I've test fired from different guns and looking at that. Um, it's also um, done through studies that I participated in training. I'm looking at things that, that help us know what that sufficient agreement is within all of those features and looking at the totality of those markings. So we're not going to base our opinion just on one little mark. We're going to look at the entire surface area of that bullet, the entire surface area of that cartridge case in order to, to make our conclusion. Um, we're, not, we're not looking at one little mark and making an identification. Um, so we have to think of the totality of all the markings that we see under the microscope. So the, the short answer to my question, there is no set number of steps on the ladder you have to reach before you can make your decision? Um, we use a, a pattern, or excuse me, a method of pattern matching again, and that's how we do it. And that's a widely accepted uh, method throughout all firearms examiners um, in the United States and the world, really. Um, that's, that's what we've been using for years to complete um, firearms identification, and, and that's what's been widely accepted, looking at these patterns and, and comparing them in order to to make our identification and reach our conclusion. Well, now you say it's been widely accepted, but isn't it true that um, that that your field of expertise has come under criticism by the the uh, the scientific community? Um, there there has been criticism, but again, there's been uh, research completed um, to 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 support firearms identification, if you will. Well, I mean, the National Academy of Scientists issued a report and was pretty critical of the objectivity of your work, that 
it is more subjective because you don't have a set number of ladder um, rings on a ladder you got to reach. It's, it's based upon your experience, your training, and your opinion. But there's no objective criteria by which to measure whether something matches or not. And that, you're aware of that criticism by the National Academy of Scientists, right? I'm aware of, of some of the criticism, yes, sir. Um, however, the, subject, the, the process of making the identification is subjective in nature, but it's based on some objective data that we're looking at. Um, so it, there's, again, lots of information that we're looking at. Those, the contours of those tool marks, the individual peaks and ridges of those tool marks, and looking at it, it's not, it's not just looking to see um, is, that, is this a match and it looks good. We're really uh, looking in, under high magnification at all of these features to see um, what agreement or disagreement that that we can uh, determine. And again, that's based on some objectivity, you know, of how we arrived to, to that situation. But, but you agree that, that your chosen field is is part art as much as science, right? Um, our field is an applied science, um, really. Um, we we do use um, lighting and angles to look at these features under the microscope, and it's important to know how to to um, move those items around and move those lighting and that those um, different stages on our microscope in order to see some of these markings. Um, it can be difficult to do, and, and there is a, a special technique that you know you have to learn in looking at this and doing it and using that microscope to to really become. Um, familiar and, and efficient. Do you agree with me previously in this courtroom under oath that 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 this profession you're in is part art? Um, there, there is some art to it and that's just the lighting thing. Um, for example, you know, we, we have to look at that and we have to um, use that oblique lighting in order to make some of those striations show up. Um, again, these are tiny little marks that we're looking at and that we're looking at mon under magnification. Um, but the field itself is, is not art. It's an applied science. We're using um, scientific processes to, to reach these conclusions, excuse me, these conclusions um, with years of research to, to support it. You first examine um, I first examined item 22 back in June of 2021, correct? Which is yes. Which is the rifle, the shotgun that Alec Murdoch had that was taken by Deputy Green, right? Uh, yes, sir. Item 22 was a Benelli model Super Black Eagle, and I, I did receive that item in June. Yes, sir. And when did you receive? I'm not going to pick it up again, but I dropped it, at, and it's almost past five o'clock on a Friday. I don't want to create a, a bit more of a delay, but when did you receive the 300 blackout? Uh, is that the item 33 rifle? Yes, sir. To? Um, it I received item 33, which was um, inside sled container K on June 10th. And, and when did you uh, issue your preliminary opinions to on item 33 and item 22 to to your agency, SLEP? Um, I released um, some results to to our agents and investigators on June 10th. June 10th, yes, sir. Are you aware after June 10th that sled dive teams have been going out in Colleton County, diving the waters, trying to find murder weapons? Um, I'm not aware of what all our dive teams were doing. No, sir. Well, you certainly didn't report to the folks who were lying on your work that we found the murder weapons, did you? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You didn't sir? report to the folks at SLED who rely upon your analysis that, hey, Eureka, we got the murder weapons. Um, no, sir, um, that's not what I reported. Okay. And you've never received any projectiles from the shooting range at Moselle to compare. Jason, to Your Honor, ask an answer. 
I haven't asked my question yet. Have you ever received any projectiles from the shooting range at Moselle uh, to compare to the uh, projectile item number eight? Possibly, but you can answer it. Again, yes, sir. If you've answered it before. Um, based on my understanding of the scene, I do not believe I received any projectiles from that shooting area. Um, and, but that's based on my understanding of, of where I believe the other projectiles are recovered from. When, when you got item 22, the shotgun, do, do you know whether it had been swabbed on the inside of the barrel? Um, I believe it had been processed by other departments. Um, however, I, I do not know what those swabs entailed. If, if a shotgun has been recently fired, does it leave evidence in the barrel that soot stuff? Um, yes, sir. It's possible that we would see um, some type of residue from firing in that barrel. And are, are you aware that Agent Worley swabbed the top before she removed the 16-gauge shell from it? Uh, no, sir. I do not know what Agent Worley did in this investigation. Can you see residue with the naked eye of a shotgun that has just recently been fired? Um, sometimes, yes, sir. And that is something that we um, also document as part of our examination of the firearm. Um, and when I looked into the, the barrel and looked down the bore of the item 22 shotgun, I do have in my case file circled that I noticed some fouling or residue in the barrel. Uh, was it recent fouling or residue, or was it... A just a dirty gun. Um, I do not. I can't date when that fouling was placed there. That was residue. That residue was placed there. No, sir. I can't put a time on. That. What about the 300 blackout? Was it? I think you have a note that's some fouling there, but maybe I'm confusing it. Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. On the, um, the item 33 rifle, I did note that there was some fouling or residues in that barrel. The the opinion that you have provided this court as to the shell casings from the murder scene, which are items, sled items two through seven, and that your opinion is that they were loaded into, extracted, e extracted and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time with items 35 through 37, 39, 108, 113, 116, 17, and 122, and those are shell casings that were found around the house and at, at the shooting range. Your opinion that they were that they were loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm. Are you do you hold that opinion with 100% certainty? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that is my opinion. Um, that is the conclusion that I reached. Did you ever tell Agent Owen that? You could not forensically state with 100% certainty? Uh, no, sir. When I arrived at that conclusion, that was my conclusion. Um, and it was also agreed upon by the um, reviewing examiner. So if there's a note in Agent Owen's report that you couldn't reach it with 100% certainty, then someone has made a mistake? Um, I don't know uh, the contents of Agent Owen's report. No. I'll stand for a moment.
Mr. Greer, I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 400. Could you kindly review that very, very quickly and let me know if you're familiar with what it is? Uh, yes, sir. What is it? Um, this appears to be a copy of my report. It's an accurate, complete copy of your report? Uh, yes, sir. It does appear to be. Uh, all the things we just discussed today? Yes, sir. Okay. State would move to admit item four, uh, state to get 400, I, I believe, about it. Okay. Let's admit it. Mr. Group, please, you know, because some of the questions concerned uh, your field. Um, Please tell us, how, how long has firearms identification and tool mark identification, how long has it been around? Um, in its current form, um, I would say the early 1900s is when this really um, became popular and firearms identification was born um, with several um, important cases. Um, it was as early as the 1900s that they started looking at this evidence and looking at those individual characteristics um, through uh, microscopy. Um, so ever since that time, um, it's just evolved and, um, and grew with further research and support, advances in um, technology, and, um, but it's been around for, for several years. And are you familiar with any studies that were done um, utilizing uh, what would be called consecutive barrels? Yes, sir. Firearms? Explain to us what a consecutive barrel study would be and what they, uh, what's done in those. Sure. Um, when we're looking at those characteristics under the microscope um, that were imparted onto a fire bullet or a, um, excuse me, a fire bullet or a cartridge case, and we're looking at all those tiny little features, um, a consecutively manufactured uh, study takes into the account of the manufacturing process. Um, so all those marks that we discussed are, are coming at, from that gun being produced at a ma by a manufacturer, metal scraping and removing. Uh, metal. Uh, so we have tools cutting and tool stamping and, um, and really working on hard metal surfaces. Um, so when we look at a study that has consecutively manufactured things, um, that presents an opportunity for a worst case scenario for us as examiners. If those tools were going to leave markings on um, other firearms, so if you had this breech face being made, by the tool and it made the next one, it made the next one. Those are consecutively manufactured. If there's any carryover of those characteristics from one to another, um, that's what that study does. It, it highlights that and it puts that as an emphasis as part of that study. And we as examiners are looking at that, that's our worst case scenario. If we're going to see any carryover of that tool making that, that item or that breech face, um, we would expect to see marks. Um, there's several studies that are out there, and I've participated in several of those as part of my training, um, where we're given samples that have been fired by consecutively manufactured barrels. So if we see any agreement between each of those barrels, we should see it there. Or um, studies where we have consecutively manufactured breech faces. Again, those are breech faces made by the same tool, one right after another. And if we see agreement in there, we should see it in that study. Um, I've participated in those studies, my, uh, excuse me, in those um, those research projects, some of them have been studies prior to me becoming an examiner, and I was able to clearly distinguish and accurately distinguish between those projectiles. So I was able to determine um, those projectiles were fired by this barrel, this barrel, this barrel, and this barrel, or that cartridge case was fired by this gun with that breech face, this gun with that breech face, and this gun with that breech face. Um, so we are aware of that in our community, and we do things to um, be proactive on that, and, and that's just an example. 
Um, and that's something I participated in and was able to um, successfully pass as part of my competency in determining um, what was fired by what in those consecutively manufactured studies. And, those were, and you were able to compare firearms that you know were consecutively manufactured one after the other right after the other. That is correct. And uh, just for clarity, <clears throat> we're talking about, I, I'm referring to items uh, 33 and 22 on your report. That would be the uh, item 33 being the uh, blackout rifle and then item 22 on the camouflage Black Eagle 3. Yes, sir. Um, your results for some of those were, when you say inconclusive, that, that, what does that mean? Does that mean that they could have been fired or that they, you, you just can't determine? Uh, that's correct. Um, inconclusive is a, one of our conclusions that we can issue. When there's not enough agreement or disagreement there in those uh, tiny microscopic characteristics. Um, so what inconclusive means is it's possible it could have been fired by that gun and it's possible that it may not have been fired by that gun. to states uh, to your item number 165 states exhibit 147 remind us again what that item is um, could I see item 165 you make me find it I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. it in your report if you have it um, no sir I'm not sure that I'll be able to find it I entered into evidence of states 147. That would be slide item 165. Yes, sir. Did you identify what it is again and where it was located when it was found, more importantly? Uh, yes, sir. This was a Winchester 12-gauge uh, shot shell. Um, and on the side of the shot shell, it's stamped dry lot 3-inch 2. On the packaging for uh, States Exhibit 147, it says from nightstand in Paul's um, room. Now, I know counsel asked you a question about, you know, your field being an applied science, just so we understand what an applied science is. Are there any other examples of fields that are applied in that general realm of applied sciences? Uh, yes, sir. A lot of, of what we do as firearms examiner is learned um, through our process of training and looking at samples and learning the job. It's kind of like, um, if you will, a physician. Um, they go to school. Um, they learn a lot in their medical uh, school, but they still do a residency program, if you will. So they're on the job, doing on-the-job training. Your Honor, object. Comparing his, what he does to... Objection right. Please continue. Please continue. Yes, sir. Um, so they learn things in school. Um, the firearms identification is not something that you can necessarily go to a school and learn to do. Um, you can't get a four-year degree and become a firearms examiner the next day. Um, there are universities across the nation that have firearms identification as part of their firearms program, and they're teaching that component. But in order to um, achieve your competency at this, um, you, you need on-the-job training. You need the experience. Um, and, and looking at these samples and knowing how to evaluate uh, the markings that we're looking at on these um, ammunition components. Lastly, um, Agent Greer, uh, Mr. Greer, I'm going to refer, uh, refer you to State's Exhibit 400. I'm going to put that on the screen. I'm going to direct your attention to item 128. Can you see that on your screen, Mr. Grew? Yes, sir, I can. Specifically, your findings concerning 2 through 7, 
You see where my pen's pointing? Yes, sir, I do. Which items were two through seven? Um, those were from markers two, three, four, five, six, and seven, respectively. And from my understanding of the crime scene, those were the ones um, that were located around um, Mar Margaret Murdoch's body. Thank you. And again, we're on what, what page now, Mr. Drew? Um, that's on page seven, yes, sir. Okay. Items two through seven found around Maggie's body. Items 35 through 37 and 39, where were those located? Um, those were from the side entrance door, which would be the door, um, I believe, coming out of the, the gun room area. And items 108, 113, 116 through 17, and 122, where were those located? Um, those were from various areas, um, thought to be from the shoot field or from the field. And tell me again what, they, what your conclusion was. Um, I was able to determine that uh, based on matching characteristics in the mechanism marks that items 2 through 7, 35 through 37, 39, 108, 113, 116 through 117, and 122 had all been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. Nothing further. Thank you. Further examination. No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. You must step down. And while he's preparing to step down, ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, recess for the remainder of the day and the weekend, and we'll meet you back at 1130 on Monday morning, 1130. Please do not discuss the case. Um, which witnesses will you have? Uh, Your Honor, if we're uh, talking about the in-camera hearing, we'll have uh, Mark Tinsley. And uh, we do have another issue, which I believe I had indicated to Your Honor, perhaps in a pretrial uh, conversation, uh, as to a uh, conversation that took place a few days after uh, the crimes occurred, uh, in which uh, there were a number of individuals present. Uh, Mr. Murdoch was present. I don't know the contents of that meeting uh, because I've been out of an abundance of caution, have stayed away from that, uh, and I believe that we may have a little bit of testimony just on whether or not there is any attorney-client client privilege to that conversation. I've been careful throughout this investigation preparation not to be privy to that, uh, but I do believe that it is not an attorney-client privilege conversation, but I'd like the court's ruling on that before I came privy to the contents of that. That's the only uh, other issue at this time that I think would be addressed in, in camera that morning. Your Honor, and my, uh, sort of a surprise here, was that, were those conversations recorded? No. And I mentioned this in our pre -trial. What you're referring to. Um, neither one of us know what the contents of those conversations are. I believe Mr. Griffin was present at this meeting, which is exactly why I wanted the, the court's ruling before I became privy to the contents of the defendant's statements at that meeting. No, we're not quite sure, but we'll wait with bated breath to hear whatever it is. Can you be more specific as to what you're talking about, Mr. Waters? From my, my understanding, there was a meeting uh, or some sort of gathering in which Mr. Griffin, Griffin and Mr. Murdoch and then a number of other individuals were present in which the defendant made some statements. The contents of individuals? No, no. I think uh, some of his partners and, and other individuals, maybe some family, uh, to which I have never been privy to the contents. 
However, I would like to know the contents, but I've been careful out of an abundance of caution not to ever become privy until I had a ruling from the court that there was no attorney-client privilege because of the presence of third parties to that conversation. So I would like to address that with the court, and if the court believes that and rules that there is no attorney-client privilege, then I may, uh, you know, at the appropriate time, examine people who were present at that uh, conversation as to what the defendant said. And is that in relation to financial crimes or? No, sir. That would be in relation to the murders of Maggie and Paul. But I, it is an in-camera matter that I, if we have the time available, I wanted to raise that with the court. Maybe we can go ahead and knock that one out as well. All right. Any thoughts by the defense? You, I, I t Your Honor, what he's referring to is, and I, it was on Thursday, June the 10th, when SLED came to John Marvin Murdoch's hunting property to interview Alec, to interview John Marvin Murdoch, uh, Randy Murdoch, Buster Murdoch, and before the, and I was there to, to represent Alec for purposes of that, before SLED got there, um, we were all in the house. I have no idea what beyond that he, he's talking about. I mean, what, what was supposedly said or heard or, I have no idea, but beyond that, but I don't know of any conversations that he's trying to find the substance of and who he's going to get them from. I, and Your Honor, I think that's just it. I, you know, we would have a witness as to the circumstances of who was present, and in the event that Your Honor rules that because of the presence of third parties, it was not a protected conversation. Then I would then, you know, become privy or ask to become privy to the content of that. Uh, and, and again, that isn't a thing. By inquiring of who? Well, the witness who were present. And so I'm going to call one of those, which the would law could partners. be. partners. Exactly. Right. And, and again, I wouldn't even have to do that on the stand. I would just want Your Honor's blessing before I did that because of an abundance of caution and protection of the attorney crime privilege. At that point, I could you know, offline become privy to the content of it. It may be nothing. I've just been told that there was that meeting and, I, and the circumstances of it, and I don't believe it's protected, and so I'd like to know, uh, you know, what the defendant said at that meeting. Yes, sir. Sounds like he's asking for a deposition, Your Honor. And he's got no right to an evidentiary hearing about what happened at a meeting in the course of a trial. He's got no right to compel people to come testify so we can find out what was said. That's discovery. I mean, you know, state grand jury allows him to do that, but there's no rule that permits him to conduct a deposition, whether in court or out of court, and that's what he's trying to do. Not asking to conduct a deposition, Your Honor. I've, I've actually been doing this out of abundance of caution and protection of the defendant's rights and making sure that we didn't cross the line without the court's uh, input. And again, the content may be something that's useful or not. Well, if you'd like to brief or send a memo or cases to the court regarding statements made um, in the presence of counsel and third parties, whether that's protected by attorney-client privilege or not, then the court can address the issue. Yes, sir, Your Honor, and, and uh, I'll be happy to address that Monday morning. I will. Um, I do have a case, uh, Marshall v. Marshall, uh, 320 South Eastern 2nd 44, which just generally, of course, states the rule that if attorney-client privilege uh, communications are related in the presence of third parties, then the protection is lost. Um, and I can, uh, I can go ahead and hand that one up uh, to Your Honor. And I, I certainly be pre prepared to address that in any great detail. Uh, let me go ahead and look at this case. And obviously, if we prepare additional ones, Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Nothing from the bench, Your Honor. Right, we'll be in recess till 9.30. All right.
Alright guys, so get in position, so just watch your backs, all your bags. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, can you scoot? Can you scoot to the right, please? Randolph Alex, you stole from us! Randolph Alex! You destroyed your name, Randolph! Walked off and left his phone. He left. Thank you. 